Web novel game developer system. 101 dream. So this is real, Gabe sighed as he looked in a nearby mirror after waking up. The expression on his face was completely different from an average expression after waking up, because this was the second time he had woken up here. To explain it better, yesterday Gabe had also woken up confused in this strange place. He had never seen this place, the technology around him was more up-to-date than the technology he knew, but considering he had just gone to sleep, Gabe considered it as some kind of lucid dream without much worry. Thinking that in a few hours he would wake up, Gabe took the time to explore the place where he had found himself. It didn't take him long. In just three minutes he had completely understood the layout of the place, as he was currently in a small apartment. In the apartment there was only a single television, showing a science fiction movie. The television had a very good resolution by the way, something that made the 8K televisions he knew of look like old scrap metal. This is like something only a dream can represent, he thought as he looked around after losing interest in the television. The kitchen was very familiar, but at the same time, it had a strangeness to it. It was as if he knew this place. He implicitly understood what each appliance was, but he had no idea how to use almost any of them, which just reminded him of a fact he had once read. The human brain is not capable of creating unimaginable faces or scenes. So for me to be dreaming this, at some point I must have seen something very similar, where my brain must have just changed some detail to make it look like something new, he said to himself as he looked at these things for a few seconds. The rest of the house didn't have much of any interest. The only other thing that attracted his attention was that in his room there was a table with a computer, but just as he imagined a science fiction computer to be, with a holographic screen and lots of white light, this was exactly what he was seeing. How about experiencing the scope of this dream? Gabe wondered, before sitting down and starting to use the computer. The operating system felt a lot like Windows, so it was pretty natural for him to navigate things. To Gabe's surprise, even though there was a lot that resembled real life, the internet in this dream had a lot of interesting stuff and quite a few things he hadn't even thought of before. As a hardcore gamer, Gabe liked to try out all kinds of games, especially games nominated for the Game Awards. It had become a tradition for him to finish the nominated games and platinum the winning games, after which he would do a detailed review for each game and would publish his opinion on the internet if that game deserved the prize it had received or not. As he did it with passion, Gabe's name had spread widely on the internet, to the point where he became one of the most highly regarded game critics among the hardcore audience. But he was disappointed with his dream. Even though there were a huge amount of games coming out, from the trailers he was seeing, the quality of these games was terrible. Scrolling through gaming websites and news, he saw that there was currently a university game develop contest going on, but to his disappointment, the game with the most clicks was a game called, Spear Throwing Training. The name was something Gabe had never seen before, but watching the gameplay trailer for the game, he felt it was terrible. Basically, the player had to stand in a canoe on the high seas while fish jumped around them out of the water and the player had to throw their spear at the fish. The more fish the player hit, the stronger their ability to throw the spear will become. Since when was this something that qualified as a game? Not even clickers were that bad, as in clickers the players could easily get addicted to due to the evolutionary need for dopamine. If this was a clicker, the player could evolve the spear, their canoe, gain more glowing effects, be able to throw more spears, have weapons that launched automatic spears, but from what Gabe saw, none of that happened. The player just had to stay there, hurling spears aimlessly, forever. This appears to be a VR game, but still, how could anyone want to play this? Gabe tried to find plausible reasons by analyzing the game footage but nothing was apparent. Exasperated, Gabe had looked at the comments and was furious at the amount of praise this game was getting. I have to thank the creator of this game. As a former F-Rank Spear user, this game was mainly responsible for helping me rise to E-Rank. Although I am already a Rank E-Spear using Warrior, this game has helped me a lot. In the last battle I participated in, my companion was about to be killed by a goblin attacking from behind, but luckily I used the skill I learned in this game and managed to hurl the spear successfully at the goblin and save my companion. Surprisingly, this game was made by a university student. The foresight of using the sea waves to help with balance training while the player has to aim for fish with irregular movements was a very smart idea. This game absolutely deserves the number one slot. The most striking feature in this game is the design of the fish, to think that a college student made something like that amazes me, there are over 20 different fish, some even with scales as thick as ranky monsters. The creator of this game must be a genius. Of the almost 50 comments Gabe read through, there was only one negative comment, which complained that the user couldn't stand up in the canoe and blamed the game creator for this, something totally illogical. However, the vast majority of the comments only praised the game creator for being a genius to think of a training method like that, or how he made all of the fish very different and some even with quite resistant scales.
Going back to look at the game footage, Gabe couldn't even differentiate the fish much from one another. It seemed that the biggest difference was the texture, some were formed a little bigger than the rest, but it wasn't like the difference was glaringly obvious. Thinking of the game Maneater that he had played a few months ago, with so many different varieties of sharks for the player to evolve into, seeing this game was like the difference between earth and sky. Why are these people praising this so much? Gabe was confused and started looking up information on this contest, thinking maybe that was the theme to it. When he finally got a good description, Gabe finally understood why this was happening and couldn't help but be amazed at the creativity of his brain to think of something this profound. Apparently gamers in this dreamland of his could play games and get skills in real life, and while there was a minority of people who were gifted with the profession of game developer, the other 95% of people were made up of gamers who experienced games made by developers and got skills from them. The game developer profession was something very honored among people, since it was only because of the games developed by those who had this profession that humanity had survived, with so many invasions of monsters from other worlds trying to dominate the earth. Game developers could be divided from rank F to rank S. While all developers started at rank F and trained to reach rank S someday, only a small percentage ever managed to reach rank A and less than only 10 people around the world had ever reached rank S. In the same way, gamers were also divided from rank F to rank S, but because they had a larger population, the amount of rank S gamers was composed of a few hundred people worldwide. Just with that one could see the difference in rarity between a game developer and a gamer, where while a rank S gamer was very powerful, a game made by a rank S game developer was enough to train thousands of rank B gamers to rank A and even some to rank S. Understanding that people were experimenting with this game for training purposes, Gabe finally understood why this spear throwing training game was so popular, as it was a very practical way to train in spear throwing. Although Gabe still saw numerous flaws in it and knew of several ways to make this game more attractive and interesting, compared to the other games that were being evaluated for training, this one was really better. If I were to make a game to train this skill, I would probably do something like a clicker, where the player starts with a wooden spear and for each fish he kills he earns coins. These coins would then be exchanged for better spears with more effects that are more powerful, thus letting the player kill fish that are also more powerful that yield more coins for the player to buy an even better spear, and thus generating an infinite loop, something like Cookie Clicker, which was so simple and so addictive, to make something like that in this world with a different theme would probably be a hit. Too bad this is just a dream, Gabe said as he scrolled through the game's page. Despite seeing the utility in most of these games, Gabe couldn't quite feel that these were really games. Wouldn't it be possible to write a story for the player to go on an adventure? That way the training would be less monotonous, he thought. Tired of seeing examples of these games, Gabe started looking at the other tabs on this site, and to his surprise, he already had a profile logged in. Gabriel Howard, age 22. It's my name and my age, he said with a slightly raised eyebrow, thinking that it was only natural for it to be like that. Since it was just a dream of his mind, it wouldn't make sense for the brain to come up with another name. Looking through the information, he discovered that he was a senior student of game development, and was currently on deadline to develop a game for his university's final paper, where he was supposed to show that he was capable of making a truly useful game for mankind, thus being able to become a true game developer. The games he could play were divided into categories such as, short-range weapon training games, long-range weapon training games, or even, body training games, which made him remember the spear-throwing training game, among other categories, but he couldn't select any of them since apparently he already had a category selected. Firearms Training Games Paying attention to this category, Gabe read the description of how this game should be developed. The game developer's job in this game is to create a world where the gamer can train in the use of firearms. As the usefulness of this type of weaponry against more powerful monsters is very low, it is recommended that the game developer keep this in mind when developing the game. The usefulness of skill training will also be evaluated. Don't forget that repetitive movements alone are not the only way to improve a skill. Reading this description, several games that fit into this category came to Gabe's mind. Mainly thinking about weaker monsters, he imagined that this game would probably be popular for training something like a police force, which only needed to deal with other humans or only weak monsters that entered the city. Games like Doom were discarded immediately from consideration, as the monsters in that game would probably fall into the category of very powerful monsters, so it would be better to focus on something weaker. I guess zombies fall into the category of weak monsters, don't they? Gabe wondered aloud as a few zombie games came to his mind. Among them, only one prevailed, that being one of the games nominated for Game of the Year at the 2021 Game Awards. Gabe had to admit, even though the game wasn't perfect, Residual Devil Village was a very good game that veered away from the more boring theme that the other games in the Residual Devil franchise were following. 
In this game, the player had to deal with weak monsters like zombies, and thinking about the last line of the description where it said that there was another way to train the skill, this game fit that even better. Gabe found that the stronger the player's emotion, the more likely their body would be able to absorb skills from a game made by a game developer. And remembering how many scares he got and how scared he felt while playing Residual Devil Village, Gabe knew that the intensity of the emotion the player would have if playing a similar game would be very high, which would probably earn him extra points. There were other games that the player could be very scared of, like Outlast, but thinking that in that game the player spent most of their time with a camera in their hand instead of a gun, Gabe felt that Re, Village fit that much better. Is it easy for me to make a game in this dream? Gabe wondered interestedly. He had already tried to make a game in his previous world, but the process for making games was too complicated, and in order to make a game as good as he imagined in the real world, not only would he need experience with coding and development processes, he would need another group of people to help him all of the objects and effects he imagined. But when reading the game credits in this dream, there was only ever one person's name credited to every game, the game developer who made it. This was something that made Gabe consider that maybe in this dream it might be easier to make a game. Curious, and trying to discover even more about the limits of this dream, Gabe started researching how a game developer's game was made and found out from the email history of his account that apparently he had received something called a, world seed. The description of this seed was that it was something like a small pen drive that the game developer should inject their mana into. After the seed received the necessary amount to start, the seed would dematerialize, using the game developer's mana to synchronize with their consciousness and allow the game developer to use their consciousness to shape a little world within, the little world that would then become the game. What Gabe found most interesting was that after the synchronization between the game developer and the seed reached 100%, the game developer could control the seed to appear or hide inside their body, and could use this to upload the game to the internet and could keep it in their body for modifications or game updates. What an interesting method, Gabe commented excitedly as he finished reading. Thinking he had nothing more interesting to do in this dream, Gabe started looking for his seed, and after five minutes he found it under his pillow. Excited, Gabe started using the method he saw on the internet to control the mana that only game developers had to synchronize with the seed, but as soon as he managed to control the mana in his body, Gabe started to feel his head hurting. A large amount of information was coming at him from somewhere, memories he never had, people he never saw, abilities he didn't know he had, various things he didn't know of were appearing in his mind. It was not like he was receiving these memories out of nowhere, but as if he was remembering. The amount of information he received was very large, to the point that Gabe, who was at the side of the bed after picking up the seed, just had time to lean forward and fall onto the bed before his consciousness disappeared. After several hours of sleep, Gabe woke up extremely tired. It was like he had been awake for 30 hours and had only slept for 2 hours, which was far from enough to let him rest, but enough for his body to feel groggy. But despite his body protesting, Gabe was worried about what happened and got out of bed. His expression was terrible, especially when he saw which room he was in. So this is real, Gabe sighed as he looked in the mirror after waking up. This world that he thought was just a dream, apparently it wasn't just a dream like he had imagined. 202 Starting Development Sitting on the floor on the porch of a small apartment was a 22-year-old young man. The young man's appearance was somewhat attractive, though not due to his grooming. Despite having long blonde hair, it had not been well taken care of and the ends were very dry and brittle. His body was very thin, which showed traces of malnutrition, and the expression on his face was even more disturbing, as he appeared lifeless, like a zombie staring into space. After 30 minutes the young man finally reacted. Despite appearing to be lost, he was using 95% of his current thought processes just to organize the memories that popped into his mind. Currently he was in a lot of doubt. Gabe Howard was his name. Both the name of the former life he had and the name he had in this life. His mind was in a mess as he lost a bit of the sense of self he had. He didn't know which of the two Gabes he was, until he finally started to relate the experience that just happened to something he saw in novels and anime from his previous world. He had transmigrated. The two personalities were slowly merging. Young Gabe Howard was changing a lot of thought processes he had, a lot of his precepts and prejudices, but luckily he felt that this change wasn't bad. It wasn't like the other life he had either of his lives was one of a psychopath. With his memories finally sorted, Gabe understood both sides. While other world Gabe was a fanatical gamer, this world's Gabe was a game developer in training, currently attending the university for developers, and right now in the final days of developing work for his training in one of his core courses. Should I go with the idea I had for Residual Devil Village? Gabe wondered as he continued to stare into space.
With this world's game's memories, he had no problem accepting that this was a true reality and that he would have to continue living in it, as things began to feel more like he was this world's game and that he only received his past life memories now. Maybe that's what really happened to me. Gabe wondered, still unable to understand what had happened to him. Knowing he was due to play a game within the next 14 days, Gabe finally made up his mind. He would use the memories he received from his past life, or wherever these memories came from, and make a game as good as that other version of himself knew. So excited, Gabe took his seed in hand and decided to inject his mana into it again. He was scared, as the last time he'd done this had been a bit traumatic, but shaking his head, Gabe finally let go of that thought and started injecting the seed with mana. Slowly, as the mana was injected into the seed, Gabe felt his surroundings changing. He still felt like he was sitting on his living room floor, but at the same time, his consciousness had entered the world of the seed, which was a completely blank world. Using the knowledge he learned at the university, Gabe used his mana to perform a small test. With a single thought, mana flowed through his body and formed a basketball. Squeezing this ball with a projection of his hand, Gabe felt that it was actually filled with air, to the point that when he dropped it on the gymnasium floor he had just rendered, it bounced perfectly, as the best ball should. I really can do whatever I imagine here, Gabe thought excitedly as he imagined the possibilities of things he could do. Of course, he had to take into account his own knowledge. The process of doing something in the seed using mana was that the developer needed to have detailed knowledge about the substance and parameters of what he was going to create, as a small mistake in conceptualization could completely destroy the structure of things. Thus, genius developers would often take somewhere around a few days to make a monster, while mediocre developers would take at least 15 days, and talentless developers would take more than 30 days. The previous game had already been tested on controlling mana and creating mana structures. Fortunately, he was considered a genius, taking only four days once to make a dog to use in a game. Ordinary students in the class took roughly 16 days to make the same dog, and the worst students took an average of 33 days. Four days might have been fast, but thinking that he wanted to develop a game in just 14 days, and that game should be as good as Re, Village, time was too short for Gabe. That's why he was so doubtful. I probably won't be able to make the full game in such a short time, so ideally I'll develop the game divided into chapters. To start with, I can make a demo of the game first, thus trying to get the public's attention and use the mana that I will get from players to keep expanding this world and developing it until it becomes the full game. This was one of the features of Seeds, developers would receive mana from players and could use it to develop their game or use it to improve themselves and make a better game with another seed. The two were equally useful in the past, but in recent years, developers have realized that it was more profitable to make multiple games while absorbing mana, rather than using the mana they receive from the game to develop it. The proportion of mana that a player generated when playing a rank F game was normally one mana unit every one game hour. This mana could be reinvested in the game in full, or the developer could spend 100 mana units to receive one unit of maximum mana. So, thinking that every 100 units of mana reinvested in the game would be the same as decreasing their maximum mana by one unit, 99% of current developers preferred to absorb the mana that players generated and use it to improve themselves. Even at the University of Developers it was taught that the best way to develop was to absorb mana from the game directly. Thinking about how boring and simple today's games were, Gabe understood part of the reason when he thought about it. I think this idea is stupid. Just like the skills they receive is proportional to the emotion they feel, the amount of mana generated is proportional to the emotion players receive. If I use the mana generated in the game to enhance the player's experience, player will inevitably generate more emotion. Making a player give me two mana units every hour would be more economical than making another game. Not to mention that if the game is good, I will have more players giving me two mana units per hour than I would get if I split my audience across multiple one mana unit games, Gabe said in frustration. With his idea even more consolidated, Gabe finally started to develop the game. Of course, the demo game was going to need an antagonist, the player's first enemy and the main focus for the player to deal with. The first thing Gabe set out to develop, therefore, was the zombie lichen. Unlike other games in the franchise, Re, Village had zombies mixed in with werewolves, so that was the foundation Gabe was using to make his game. Plus, he could use the references from his memory from when he had played the game. First I'm going to make the common lichen zombie. Gabe thought as he started to shape his mana. But to Gabe's shock, his mana was disappearing as it left his body. Confused, Gabe looked at the basketball he made and made another ball like that, which was no problem, but when he tried to make the zombie again, his mana was dissipating once again. What is happening? Gabe was confused as he looked at his hands closely. What is that? He saw that there was something like a small black hole absorbing the mana that came out of his hand. 
Having never heard of something like this before, Gabe was confused and decided to put more mana into it. But strangely the mana just floated around his hand this time, without being absorbed by the black hole. Thinking about doing the zombie one more time, the black hole appeared to react again, making Gabe a little stressed. What the fuck? He yelled angrily. Without cancelling the mana emission this time, Gabe decided to let more mana be absorbed by this black hole and see what would happen. After 20 minutes of emitting mana, Gabe had deposited 80 mana units and was already feeling weak. When he was about to cancel the mana emission, something unusual happened. In front of Gabe's eyes, a transparent screen appeared. 80 units of mana stored. Would you like to run a simulation? Gabe was confused by this screen. He had never heard of something like this at the university. Theoretically he would use approximately 50 units of his mana to try to mold a zombie, and if he failed he could try one more time before running out of mana and having to try the next day. But why did that screen say he could do a simulation? Yes, Gabe answered. Which creature do you want to simulate? Thinking for a moment, Gabe replied, a lichen zombie. As soon as he said that, the window changed. A cloud of ethereal mana began to float in the air before Gabe felt it enter his head. Soon a new memory surfaced in his mind. This memory was showing him the experience of creating a zombie lichen, as if he had done it hundreds of times before. But to Gabe's disappointment, according to the memory he received, he would need 80 mana units to make the lichen, exactly the same amount he injected into the black hole. I have 100 mana units in total, but now I only have 20 mana units left. I need 60 more mana units to test this, Gabe thought in frustration. I think I can save the zombie for tomorrow and use 15 mana units to start building the game scenario. Feeling that this memory wouldn't fade from his mind, Gabe decided to use 15 mana units to make the snowy village for his game demo. Unlike creatures, making backgrounds was much easier. Those 15 mana units were enough for him to already make 30% of the demo game's territory. Of course, this was still without the structures, but the demo's land was already 30% ready. He would just need to finish generating the land and then start building the houses, trees, and other details. This was usually the part that differentiated geniuses from ordinary people. As Gabe had 100 mana units in total, he could try to make a 5 mana units monster 20x in the same day, and his control over his mana was already much better. However, an ordinary person who only had 20 mana units in total could only try 4x, and because of the low mana control, that person would need even more attempts than someone talented to succeed, thus increasing the development time of a game from the 4 days of a genius to more than 30 days for talentless persons. If he didn't have so much mana and such high control, those 15 mana units of his would probably make a maximum of 10% of the territory, 3x less than what he had done today. Not to mention that Re, Village was very ambitious. Even with his talent, Gabe thought that he would need at least 12 days to complete this demo, but if the Lycan simulation was really functional, that time could decrease several times. After only having 5 mana units, Gabe left the seat and decided to wait for his mana to recover before testing if the simulation would work as he imagined. 303 Residual Devil Release After disconnecting from Seed, Gabe decided to eat a nice meal and get a haircut. He was already mad at his long, unkempt hair, so after talking to the barber about his idea, Gabe walked out of the barber shop with short hair and faded sides, which added several points to his appearance. If it weren't for the slight malnutrition and tired expression, Gabe could probably attract the attention of a few girls passing by on the street. The unkempt hair was just because his current self hadn't cared much about appearance, while the malnutrition was really due to lack of money, as this world's Gabe preferred to save money that would normally go toward food to buy different games to try out and study more for the university. With the personality of Gabe's otherworldly memories he received, he was a little embarrassed of these attitudes he had developed and decided to fix them as soon as possible. Looking around the street, Gabe wasn't at all surprised by the technology around him, as his memories of this world were still there, so he was used to things here. But still, comparing the two memories was quite fun, especially seeing the difference in the cars, which had a very different design choice from his previous world. Arriving home with a full stomach and with his hair cut, Gabe just took a shower to remove the rest of the cut hair that was loose on his head and lay down to sleep. The wear and tear of having to control two memories still hadn't recovered, not to mention that he had spent 95% of his mana on the seed, which further increased his fatigue. The next day, Gabe woke up refreshed at last. After 16 hours of sleep, his mind managed to assimilate the two memories completely and still had time to rest, not to mention his body had finally received nutrients and was able to recover the spent mana with more haste because of that. Feeling his mana being 100% charged, Gabe didn't even get up and grab the seed hidden under his pillow. 
Entering the world of the seed again, which before was just a white space and now had a very spacious land, already began to remove the uncomfortable feeling that he had fallen into a strange place like what had happened the last time he had entered. Even though the sky was only black, it affected Gabe less than an endless white world. Confirming that the memories of his other life were still in his mind, Gabe started following that to make the lichen. Unlike the other experiences he had at the university to make monsters with mana, this time making the lichen was like he had been doing it for years. Instead of the four hours it would normally take him to finish spawning a monster, it only took Gabe 30 minutes to make the lichen. And looking at the appearance of this monster, it was perfect. Visual representation on Discord, Discord. GG, new next. It's exactly how I remember it from the game. Gabe thought excitedly as he took a detailed look at the monster he'd made. Unlike the lichen in the game he played, having the monster in front of him was much scarier. Walk, Gabe commanded, making the monster squirm and walk in a very creepy, shuffling manner, just as he had imagined. Hunt. As soon as Gabe said that, the lichen started screaming and running in the direction Gabe pointed. The scene in front of him was very scary. Thinking about seeing it in the dark with other monsters, while alone. It's perfect, Gabe said excitedly. He had spent 80 mana units to develop this lichen, but now that this monster was ready, he would only, wouldn't even need 5 mana units to edit the template into various permutations for him to use in the game, whether changing a few inches in height, clothing, the hair or other purely aesthetic details. In just 5 minutes Gabe had made over 80 variations of the lichen zombie, which would make the player feel that each zombie he saw was unique, generating even more immersion for the player. With this simulation I can make monsters so quickly, so maybe I can add other monsters to help make players feel more emotions. Gabe was excited. For the next four days Gabe focused on making a zombie Uriah, which was like a zombie lichen but much bigger and wielded a big hammer, the first zombie to actually make Gabe scared while playing the game's prologue. He also began making humans and spent some mana to develop an option for humans to transform into lichen. The cost to develop humans was very low, only costing 20 mana units after for to produce the simulation, even with dozens of variations, both in age, size, clothing, faces, and many other things. The transformation process from humans to lichen cost 30 mana units, which fortunately could be done in the simulator, since without it, Gabe didn't know if he would be able to do it, at least not in the short time he was given. For the Uriah, Gabe figured he would need at least 150 mana units to make it. He also figured he could just spend 10 mana units to make an illusion of a Uriah, as the player wouldn't need to come into contact with it directly, so he could get by with just the illusion. Visual representation on Discord, Discord. GG, new next. With the monsters and NPCs ready, Gabe used the remaining mana to make the rest of the map, which was much faster. Taking a total of five days of development, Gabe finally completed the re-village demo. Seeing that the game was complete, Gabe was very proud. The game was much better than he imagined for it at first. With the mana control he had, and with this game being practically a VR game, everything was at least 100x more realistic and scary, especially with some surprises that players would have while playing. After finishing the last test of the game, Gabe finally decided to post it on the internet, officially entering the university contest and submitting his game for the players to review. At that moment, somewhere else in the country, there was a girl live streaming to 300 people. Considering the amount of people the big streamers were able to gather, those 300 people was a very small amount. But even though it was only 300 people, the girl was very excited about this number, as this was only her first month as a streamer. What are we going to play today, the girl said as she used the mouse to scroll down the game store screen and looked for something to play. Despite looking fairly plain, the girl's overall presentation was still attractive. With long red hair and such white and smooth skin, this girl had managed to attract a lot of attention from viewers, which helped her a lot to get more viewers in such a short time. Of course, the fact that her reactions were very funny also helped her quite a bit. Hey Amora, refresh the page. If you play the first game on the list I will donate $20. Amora was looking at the list of recently added games, but as that page only showed games made for the university contest, she didn't have high hopes that she would find something good here. As a rank F player, Amora could only play rank F games, which greatly limited the variety of games she could experience. Curious, she pressed F5 and saw that a new game had just appeared at the top of the page. Unlike other games where the cover only showed a player holding a weapon, the cover of the game that appeared was different. It showed a man wearing a warm colored suit. In front of the man's face there was slow mething that changed the appearance of half of his face to something dark while his eyes glowed gold. Residual Devil. Village, is this a scary game? Amora was a little wary as she looked at the game. 
As this was a university contest game, the game was free to download, so despite being worried, Amora thought about the $20 the viewer said he would donate and decided to download the game. Why did you recommend this? She asked. Read the synopsis for this game, looks like the developer tried to do something different. Not to mention it looks scary, so it'll be fun to watch you play lol. Amora pouted as she read the commentary and then went to read the game's synopsis while the download was still going on. Wounded, you have just arrived in a small village hidden in an isolated place. It is as if time has stopped in this peaceful village, but you need help to get out of there and find your daughter. Escape from the village and save your daughter. Training. Firearms. Seeing that the game's training was focused on firearms, Amora was a little interested, as she liked games that trained this type of equipment, but the game's synopsis was strange. Usually in game synopses developers explained to players what they would do to train and how they would develop in training. But in this game none of that was said. It was more like the mystery of a movie that the player had to unravel. How can this be useful for firearms training? Amora asked, confused. Maybe to save your daughter you have to kill all the monsters. One viewer commented quite curiously. Soon the download ended and Amora clicked to play the game. By putting on the headset and connecting her mana to it, Amora lay down on the bed and finally connected to the world of Residual Devil Village. What she didn't know is that because of that simple comment that asked her to download the game, Amora would have nightmares for several nights. Thus, the first road, village player appeared, causing Gabe to receive a notification from the gaming platform, arousing his curiosity to learn this player's reaction. 404 First Encounter Finally with the virtual reality headset on, Amora started injecting mana into it, starting the game. That was the way to use these devices. Developers made games using mana, and players had to inject mana to play. But while F-rank developers had an average of 30 mana units, F-rank players only had 2 mana units, which for games where players consumed 1 mana unit per hour, was just enough to play them for 2 hours before having to stop to rest for quite some time. Amora had connected the headset to her computer to broadcast the vision she had in the game, so this would increase the amount of mana she would spend by 10% to be able to play this while broadcasting, but with the extra money she received, Amora felt it was worth it. It was a pity, after all, the game wouldn't be as good as the dollars that viewers donated, right? With the headset finally connected to the game's seed, Amora saw that her surroundings had changed from a completely black environment to something that was gradually lighting up. Suddenly, next to a painting of a medieval castle painted only in black and white ink, a message was written on floating paper. Ethan's daughter Rose has been kidnapped. He now finds himself in a strange village. After wandering around this strange village for a while, he meets an old lady. Maybe in this game I'm Ethan. This is so interesting. It's a lot more interesting than a book. Amora said excitedly as she read the message. Damn, that looks cool. Maybe it took a lot of work for the developer to make this game. That sure took some work. After all, there are only seven days left for the contest to end and the game was only submitted today. Perhaps the developer spent several days just trying to set up this story. But will the story be any good? I think it won't be a big deal. After all, it's just a developer rank F game. Maybe this little story is just to give the player more immersion to be able to kill the monsters that are in that village, since the game only serves to train, right? It was cool the idea of putting in a small story, I would feel much more motivated to kill the monsters since I would have to do it to save my daughter. That is true. Hopefully the monsters aren't weak. If the developer spent more time making the story than developing the monsters, all of this would be useless in the end, the difficulty of making a monster is too great. Reading the comments from the livestream, Amora nodded in agreement. That's true, I'm on the verge of becoming an E-ranked player, I've tried so many f rank games that I find it difficult for the quality of battles and monsters to be interesting with the developer putting so much emphasis on the story, but in the worst case it can be a good pastime. When Amora finished saying that, her surroundings changed. In life and in death, we proclaim glory, the voice of an old woman startled Amora. As the surroundings became clearer, she saw that in front of her was a short, hunchbacked old woman. Her clothes were black, old and dirty, but what caught the most attention was the strange staff she was holding, which had several skulls adorning it. Holy shit, did she speak? Whoa, is the NPC in this rank F game talking to the player? Cool. I think this old woman is just an illusion, an F rank developer would not have enough time to make a real human, it would be hard enough that this developer would have to spend weeks just developing that person. Amora didn't read the comments this time, and asked, confused. Um, hi. Amora was surprised that the voice that came out of her mouth was male. You shouldn't be here, this place looks dangerous. The old woman just ignored Amora, who approached the woman a little and nudged her arm, wanting to test whether this was an illusion or a real person. 
When her finger finally touched the old woman's arm, Amora felt the real touch, as if she were really touching someone else. I can touch her, Amora was about to continue talking, when the old woman turned to her. Shit, Amora froze. The old woman had a scary face. Her skin was full of wrinkles and dirt, her head had several accessories full of animal bones, and the woman's eyes were white, as if she was blind. Without her noticing it, Amora's heartbeat accelerated a lot. So it's you, the child's father. The old woman said while pointing her head towards Amora, but with blind eyes looking in another direction. Crap, that old woman scared the shit out of me. What an old motherfucker, I spit out the water I was drinking when I saw that scary face of hers. Is it just me or did Amora really touch the old lady? Hearing what the old woman said, Amora was confused, until she remembered the message she had read. Child. Are you talking about Rosé? Is she here? But when Amora spoke of Rose, the old woman went crazy. Rose, Rose, Rose. She is in grave danger. Ever since Mother Miranda brought her to the village, darkness has dominated us. Darkness. Amur was confused. Are you talking about the monsters? The castle bell portends danger. The old woman said as she walked to a gate beside Amora. They are coming. Wait, where's Rosé? Amora asked in concern as she watched the old woman leave. Who's Mother Miranda? The bell rings for all of us. They're coming back again. Ha ha ha. The old woman laughed as she closed the gate, leaving Amora alone in that snowy village. Looking around, Amora only saw the strange abandoned village, with cold winds around, making this environment even more frightening. Guys, are you sure you want me to play this game? We can try spear training, that seemed more relaxed, Amora said a little unsure, not knowing what to do next. Continue. I want to see the monsters. That old lady almost made me pee, keep playing Amora PLs. The setting of this game is pretty realistic, huh? Seeing the last comment, Amora looked around and had to admit, the graphics quality of this game was very good. The developer must have spent a lot of mana to develop this. Alright, let's continue for a bit, Amora said quietly as the avatar she was inhabiting put his hands in his pockets, looking for any clues. Luckily she felt a pistol at her waist, with some ammo packs and a knife. Okay, at least the combat equipment is already here. With the pistol in hand I feel safer. Amora said as she stroked the pistol and loaded the gun, making it ready to be used at any time. Looking around, Amora decided to enter the house next door, but when she saw a large pentagram with several candles around it, all the courage she had gathered to investigate this house disappeared, making her give up and continue walking in the village. As this game was in virtual reality, Gabe had made the proportion of the village much more realistic, so there were more houses and the village was much bigger than the game he had played in his other life, all to give players even more immersion. But for Amora, seeing a village like this completely empty was much scarier, since any noise she heard she thought could be a monster. This was mainly due to the fact that she was currently making her way through a cemetery, which made the situation even more frightening for her. After wandering for a few minutes, Amora finally found a church. There, she saw a stone on a pedestal with a faint magical aura that made it glow a little. Amora was confused to see this until she saw a letter beside it. If there is a calamity in the village, look for the crests. One is in the care of the church. The other is at Louise's house. Looking at the strange stone that glowed with a magical aura, Amora deduced that this must be the coat of arms and decided to keep it. On the back of the letter stone there was a map that showed the way from the church to Louise's house. Okay, let's follow that map for now. Amora said, a little more relaxed this time, not having seen any monsters in this game yet. Although this game doesn't have any combat yet, the story seems interesting. I'm really curious to see what happens next, she commented. Yes, it looks very interesting. It's like a book that you only need to spend mana to experience, but with a better story. Too bad a seed might have been wasted to do this, as a seed is much more valuable. I hope the university doesn't penalize this developer for wasting the seed in this way. With a calmer heart and a more active instinct for adventure, Amora began to explore the village with more courage. Even the house she was scared to enter in the beginning had become less scary now that she wasn't afraid of monsters appearing, and she was able to enter and find a medicine glass. Using the map she had gotten from the church, Amora found her way to Louise's house. Unfortunately, the way to Louise's house was obstructed by a broken wagon, so Amora only could enter through a wheat field to get there. Look. What a cool scarecrow. I've never seen one of these in person, Amora said as she looked at a scarecrow. It would be funny if the scarecrow turned into a monster. Yes, but I don't think the developer could do that. He already spent too much time detailing the map and the old woman. Maybe he hasn't even made a monster yet. Can he make a monster before the contest ends? Are you crazy? Do you know how long it takes to make a monster? 
maybe he could if he just made the monster a dog, or a simple animal. Amora also had this thought. Even the pistol, which she had kept ready to fire all the time when she first started playing, was now down, just pointing at the ground and being held by a single hand. But unlike the others watching Amora's stream, Gabe was having to control his laughter and anticipation when he saw how she was acting, since he knew that now would be the first time the player would encounter a zombie in the game. Step, step. Amora heard footsteps coming towards her. By instinct, she gripped the pistol tighter, but thinking it must be another human she was about to see, she still kept her guard a little low. R A A A A A A W W W W W. But to her shock, instead of a human, among the tall weed of this plantation a monster came out. And it was not just an ordinary monster, but a zombie, a zombie with its skin all destroyed, gray and dead, with eyes falling from the face and the lips torn, with only the remaining teeth exposed. It opened its mouth to scream. Amora. 505 players. Amora was not prepared. The speed of the creature running towards her was very high. While she was still raising the pistol towards the monster, it had already reached her and dealt a big bite to her shoulder, causing liters of blood to start gushing out. Feeling the pain numbing her head, Amora felt her adrenaline pump even more, causing her hand to rise on instinct and unload the pistol clip into the zombie's head. Bang, bang, bang. With its head destroyed by the weapon, the zombie fell lifelessly to the side, now completely dead. Despite having killed the first monster in this game, Amora did not rest, as her avatar's shoulder was causing her a lot of pain. Remembering the medicine bottle she found in the house a few minutes ago, Amora quickly uncapped it and poured the liquid on the wound, feeling the pain increase 10x more. But she knew zombies. She knew that these monsters' bite was infectious. If she left the wound as it was, even if she didn't die from bleeding, she would still die from the infection caused by the monster's bite. The alcohol in the medicine was eating away at her flesh, but it was also hopefully killing all the viruses and bacteria that came from the zombie's mouth. In just five seconds the pain began to subside until the wound stopped bleeding and was just burning from the exposed flesh. Amora was excited to see how effective this medicine was. Thinking that it might be useful to use mana to convert such a medicine to reality at some point, despite knowing how expensive it would be, the effectiveness of this medicine made her not worry about her wound anymore. Using the experience of a veteran rank F player, Amora noticed the footsteps of something else approaching and reloaded her pistol with the last clip she had. This time she didn't care if it was human or zombie, she already had her gun ready as she pointed in the direction of the noise. R A A A A A W W W. It was another zombie, running at high speed while screaming and stretching his arms forward, wanting to grab her. This time Amora had no more medicine, so she would have to kill this monster without being attacked. As the avatar of Ethan backed away, Amora fired the first shot. Bang. The zombie's speed was very high. In addition to the wheat blocking her vision, she missed that first shot, further increasing the tension in her heart. Bang. This time she managed to predict some of the monster's movement, hitting it in the shoulder, but unfortunately a shoulder shot wasn't enough to kill this zombie. Bang, bang. Amora was getting desperate. The zombie was still coming, so she shot twice. This time she was lucky. One of the shots hit the zombie's chest while the other hit the head, making the monster a little disoriented and dizzy as he ran towards her. Seeing the zombie's slow state, Amora holstered her pistol and drew the knife she had on her waist as she ran towards the zombie. PFFS est. The knife was stuck in the monster's brain, causing the creature to finally fall to the ground, allowing the area to return to calm. Previously, Amora had been quite distressed by the silence, but now, not hearing anything other than the wind rustling over the plants was considered a boon to her. Looking closer at the zombies she had killed, Amora was shocked. Holy shit, I think that's the ugliest zombie I've ever seen in a game, she was thoroughly disgusted by what she saw. Who said the developer couldn't make a good monster? I think this is the best zombie ever made by an f rank developer. Crap, I almost shit myself while watching this. The scare that the zombie gave me when he jumped and bit Amora's neck is giving me goosebumps even now. This developer is crazy. How did he manage to make a zombie so scary? Look at that thing's hair. This game is so realistic that even Amora's blood scared me. Amora, how does it feel to shoot a gun in this game? Seeing the last question, Amora thought for a while as she looked at the pistol in her hand. Honestly, it's quite realistic. I can't say much as I haven't shot that many times, but comparing it to other rank F games, I would say that this one is perhaps the best, perhaps second only to rank E shooting training games, since those games have a wider range of weapons. But the trade-off is the lack of the high mana consumption disadvantage of a rank E game. Even the shooting feels good. Damn, this game was made by a genius. He only took three weeks to make this game. Don't forget about that. Is the game's mana consumption low?
Amora felt her mana and realized that 0.5 mana units had already been spent, and considering she had played for 25 minutes, it was a good ratio. The mana consumption is at 1 unit per hour, which is already at the level of the best F rank games. Perhaps this developer's next game will even reach E rank, she said excitedly, as she relaxed a bit. That was, until she heard a noise and felt her heart racing again. Looking around alertly with the pistol in hand, Amora saw that the noise was just a few bats flying through the sky, which made her give a slight laugh, thinking about how tense and scared she was. Gabe was watching this with great interest. The reaction from Amora and the viewers of her livestream was very good. When she had started playing 25 minutes ago, she had 270 viewers, but as the game's story developed, the amount had already risen to 340. Considering that this was still just the beginning of his demo, Gabe was excited. Some people were even already downloading the game, also wanting to try it after seeing Amora playing and not wanting to receive spoilers for the story of the game that looked interesting and looked much more fun than the other games they used to train. These people were mainly f rank players who trained with firearms. Usually the games they used for training were very simple, be it fixed targets, flying discs, or at most shooting ducks for hours, which might have seemed interesting at first, but after doing it for several hours each day over months, it became an extremely exhausting task. Seeing that they could practice shooting in this game without spending anything extra, even if the efficiency was not as good since they don't shoot as much as in other games, it would be worth it. They could rest a little without the weight on their conscience for not training at all. The amount of road, village downloads was already at 44, and considering that the game had just been released 30 minutes ago and had no publicity, Gabe imagined that the game would be a success. The spear training he saw earlier, the game with the most other downloads, was only around 2,000 downloads, and that was because the game had been available for one and a half weeks, which was plenty of time to attract an audience. Curious to see how it felt to control his seed's mana, Gabe shut down Amora's livestream for a while and led his consciousness into the world of village. At that moment he had an aerial view. Below him it was possible to see several silhouettes, a total of 32, who were playing, while the other 12 who had downloaded the game were probably still watching the livestream of Amora, leaving it to play later. Watching those 32 people play, Gabe noticed different styles of gameplay. There were people more terrified than Amora, who held the pistol with shaking hands and looked around endlessly, while there were also people acting entirely the opposite. These people weren't too scared and moved forward quickly even though they were a bit worried. What Gabe found most interesting was that he could feel the level of improvement in these people, and surprisingly, the most fearful players were the ones who absorbed the most knowledge of firearms. Gabe could see that a thin layer of mana was coming out of the pistols and entering the players' heads, something they couldn't see, but he as the creator could see it perfectly. Since these games gave extra rewards proportional to the emotion the players were feeling, those people who were terrified were able to absorb mana from the pistol much more efficiently than people who weren't as scared. With the seed's control, Gabe could feel that the game had already absorbed 7 mana units from the players. This was already something he could use, both to be able to develop the game further, and he could absorb the mana by 100 units and make it his own. Most developers preferred to absorb mana, as it would bring immediate return, and after getting stronger they could make other rank F games until they managed to gather enough mana to nurture a rank E seed, thus earning even more money. But Gabe thought the opposite. Gabe's idea was to use this mana to further develop this seed, making the game much more complete and managing to attract more players, as well as making the experience scarier for the game to generate even more mana for himself. In the future, when the game was complete and yielding a lot of mana, he could absorb some of it and use most of it to be able to do something that the teacher said was very rare. When an F-rank developer managed to make a game that goes viral among F-rank players, they recommended that the developer use part of the surplus mana in order to be able to evolve their seed to E-rank. The amount of mana required for this was monstrous, which would only be possible for viral games with thousands of players playing it simultaneously, but if the developer could, when their game reached rank E, it would have much more opportunity for creation and development, in addition to yielding much more mana than a standard rank E seed. Gabe's idea was to aim for this. Unlike the vast majority of developers who intended to make several rank F games and then buy a rank E seed, Gabe intended to develop Road, Village to become viral around the world and be able to transform this game's seed into rank E. He had seen games that tried to do this and failed and he noticed something in common in those games, they were all pretty boring. The games had no story, their progression was dull, and the players had hardly any dopamine reaction. The only thing the developers focused on with the mana they received was making more monsters and making the game's graphics more realistic by adding more scenarios. What was the use of having more scenarios if the player has no reason to explore them? Road, Village had none of those drawbacks, and that's what made Gabe confident he could go that route. 
The difficulties of doing it due to some of the limitations of the internet in this world were still many, but the advantages it could give him in the future would be unimaginable. 606 End of Demo While Gabe was watching players through the creator's eyes, Amora was continuing through more of the game's story. At that moment, she had already arrived at Louise's house and was watching the conversation that the other characters were having with each other, quite shocked by what she was seeing. In front of her, a woman named Louisa was arguing with a drunk man who was cursing at another woman named Roxana. The content of the discussion was not something that surprised Amora, since this was the kind of concern and insecurity that she imagined people would have when they saw their home and their lives being destroyed by such powerful and unknown monsters. But what truly shocked her was how interesting the story was that was unfolding. She wanted to know what had happened to each of these people. She wanted to know how each one got there, even to know all of their names, something she'd never cared about in any game she'd played before. Unlike other games, where she just kept firing a gun non-stop, with a repetitive and tedious task, in Road, Village she was feeling very intrigued and curious about the story that this developer had made. He didn't need to make a story like this with the quality of the map and the monsters he made. That alone would have been enough for the game to be a success. But even so, this young student of game development decided to make an interesting story so players wouldn't feel bad while playing, which greatly improved the impression she had of whoever made this game. Even though the game was very scary, if she didn't like it, she wouldn't even be playing it anymore, as she wouldn't waste her mana on a pointless and boring game. Listening to the group of humans just chanting a macabre prayer inside Louise's house, Amora felt that it was very familiar. This chant, I've heard something like this before, there was that lady near the cemetery, Amora said in a low voice. But what she said was overheard by an elderly man in the house. You mean that old woman? She's fucked up in the head. But there is wisdom in her devotion. I hope it serves to protect her, as it will protect us, Louisa added. But as soon as Louisa said that, the old man started laughing strangely. Ha 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 ha. At the man's laugh, he began to squirm. His head hit the table and started knocking everything over. The other people were scared and tried to help. What the fuck are you doing? The drunk man shouted angrily. What's going on, Leonardo? Are you okay? Louisa asked worriedly as she approached to help. But when she got close to him, the man screamed, Airfish. As he got up with a knife in his hand and cut Louise's neck. Amora was frozen. She didn't understand what was happening, until old Leonardo came towards her and she saw Leonardo's face was corroding, as if the skin was dying faster every second. Blood seeped from between his teeth, and his formerly white skin was now turning blue. He's turning into a zombie. Amora soon understood, but Leonardo was closing in on her quickly. Okay what do we do? Amora heard the voice of Elena, a girl she had found in an abandoned house. In that house she had found Elena and Leonardo, who at the time was injured, but she hadn't thought about the origin of Leonardo's injury back then. Now Amora understood how Leonardo had been injured. He had been infected by a zombie, but had not done any proper treatment. With a quick thought, Amora turned towards the door and pushed Elena out. Elena, step back. No, let go of me. Elena wanted to react to Amora pushing her away, but suddenly screams were heard from the room where they were. The woman Roxana, whom the drunken man had been cursing at, was about to run away, but Leonardo, or the zombie that Leonardo became, pulled the woman by her feet and began to tear at the woman's skin with large claws that grew from his fingers. The fabric fell into the fireplace that lit the room, making the fire start to spread throughout the house. Amora felt her heart racing again, seeing the massacre scene of that man killing all his friends and family because of the virus was something very scary, especially when the man finished biting Roxana's neck and started running towards Amora. Out of instinct, Amora took the pistol that was on her waist and pointed it towards the man, but because of her nervousness, she only landed a couple shots in the chest, which did not stop the zombie from continuing to shamble towards her while screaming. When the zombie had almost reached her, Amora heard Elena speak. Let him go. She told the man, who was also apparently the girl's father. The zombified man started to grab Amora who was playing a male character but as Leonardo didn't want to let go of Amora, Elena fired, making the zombie fly backwards. Amora was shocked and saw a shotgun in Alina's hand, who started to cry. Okay it's okay. Amora soon understood that Elena was feeling very bad about killing her own father, and quickly got up to comfort the girl, but they didn't have much time, as the fire was spreading very fast through the house. Seeing this, Amora and Elena started looking for a way out. Unfortunately, all the doors were closed with wooden boards shutting them up to prevent the zombies from getting in, so the two of them were trapped. Luckily, Amora found the key to an old pickup truck and decided to try driving this pickup truck around the house, breaking the surrounding walls to open a passage for them. But the truck was very old, the fire was spreading faster than the truck could handle hitting the walls. 
Let's go up that ladder. Amora called out to Elena as she pointed to a rickety wooden ladder. Let's go. Elena answered as she continued to climb with Amora. The stairs took them to the attic of the house, which had two windows. Look, we just need to get through that window and we can get out. Amora said excitedly. But Elena was quite sad. But what will happen if we leave? We have nowhere else to hide. Everyone in the village has died, and there are only monsters roaming around. Sensing Alina's depressed tone, Amora replied, Look, in the window you can see a castle. Let's go to that castle to find shelter, L. It must be safe there. Looking at the castle through the window, Elena just shook her head and said in a desperate tone. No, I'll never go to that place. There's only death and blood there. Nothing good ever came out of that keep. I can't go, but what am I going to do while you're gone? Amora was about to answer when she heard a noise from below. Elena, a husky, monstrous voice whispered. Looking down, Amora could see it was Leonardo, Elena's father, who came crawling up the stairs. Father. Elena said excitedly as she went downstairs to help her father, whom she was seeming to have hoped against hope had recovered his sanity. He's not your father anymore, Elena. Amora shouted in concern. Ethan, go save your daughter, Elena said while crying, especially when she saw the ladder they had used to get up here start to break as the fire weakened the floorboards beneath it. Amora did not accept this and stretched out her hand. Jump here and hold my hand, Elena. Let's get out of here together. But the wood Elena was standing on began to crack even more. Soon, Leonardo fell into the sea of fire that was the underside of the house, and the next second Elena fell too, screaming in agony as she was burned by the fire before hitting the ground below with a thud. Amora still had her hand extended downwards, her expression shocked to see that even Elena had died. Why is everyone dying? She wondered in disbelief. That, this is too much. Trying to put it all aside, Amora went to the window she had been looking through with Elena and decided to jump out, tears streaming down her face. Leaving the house, Amora saw another altar like the one she had seen in the church. Inside was the other stone she needed to open the gate out of the village at Louise's house, so, with a destination in mind, Amora ran towards the large gate with the image of an angel and a demon fighting. But as soon as she opened the gate out of Louise's house, Amora saw a man screaming. No, Mother Miranda. He screamed, while a woman held him by the neck and pulled something from inside his chest which looked like a blade. What was that thing? Amora wondered in shock, as she held the gun pointed straight ahead, ready for any attack that might come her way. On the way to the gate, Amora passed the crazy old woman who was laughing to herself as she said, Death has visited them all. When she finally opened the gate that led out of the village, towards the castle, Amora looked up at it and said, It's just some simulated blood and death, right? But while she intended to keep walking, Amora felt that everything around her was turning black. Startled, Amora tried to raise her gun to defend herself, but finally calmed down as she saw words appearing in front of her. Thanks for playing the demo version of Residual Devil, Village. EA. Looking at this message, Amora was surprised. Is this just a demo version? Where is the full version of the game? I want to keep playing. Damn, I'm still crying over Alina's death, mostly thinking about the things she said about the castle. Yes, I'm dying to know what it is about this castle that makes her so scared, but can't we find out what happened there? Damn, I'm going to download this game to play too. I'm going to download it too, looks like so much fun. I already downloaded it, now just need to play and experience it. Are there things in the village that Amora didn't find? What game is this? I want to try it too. Was this game made by a college student? Most of the comments were from players excited about the game's story or frustrated that they couldn't learn more about it. But there was something in common between all of them, even those players who didn't like to train firearms decided to download the game because they felt that the story was very interesting. As soon as Amora finished the game, the amount of viewers on her live stream was over 500 people. Comparing that to the roughly 250 viewers she had when she decided to test Resident Evil, she had managed to more than double her audience. As for Residual Devil, the amount of downloads had gone up from 44 to 270 over the course of the broadcast, and it was still going up at a very fast rate. Gabe was watching the amount of players logging into the game with a big smile on his face. 707 Trailer The next day, when Gabe woke up, the first thing he did was pick up his cell phone to look at the Residual Devil stats. Residual Devil, Village. Downloads, 981. Average play time, 2 hours. Accumulated mana, 1962. Looking at the amount of downloads and accumulated mana in the game, Gabe had a huge smile on his face. In just one day he had earned the equivalent of what he would have spent on the game in 20 days.
If he converted that mana into his own mana, despite having to convert 100 units of mana from the game to 1 unit of mana for himself, he could still receive almost 20 units of mana, increasing his total mana by 20%. This was a very large increase, and because of this, many developers just ignored improving their games and absorbed the mana completely. But despite being tempted by the idea of absorbing it into himself, Gabe decided not to and used the mana to continue developing Resident Evil. The biggest factor for him receiving only two mana units for each player was that players could only play for an average of two hours, as the game had a maximum of one hour of content, i.e. the average player played the game two times, or it took two x as long to fully explore the village. Of course, this was on top of the fact that most rank F players only had two mana units, so it would be impossible for them to play much longer than that. The players who played for three hours were the players who really enjoyed the game, to the point where when they finished playing, they started to meditate to recover mana, and as soon as they had mana available they would go back to the game and play again. Gabe imagined that the average game hours per download for the demo would be around four mana units, with average players who only played the game one or two times. There would also be players who realized that training was much more effective in this game by playing the next day for another two hours, and then there would probably be those try-hard players who would have an average of six hours of play. So leaving the average game total at 4 hours for each download, a fantastic number for a game with only 1 hour of content, Gabe figured if he added more play time, it would make the average play time skyrocket through the roof. And just like in his previous world there would also be crazy people who played some games thousands of hours. If he developed Residual Devil, Village Well, that would also be possible in this world. Before going to sleep, last night Gabe had already realized that some players had found the shotgun he left hidden in the village, and many were already managing to reach the end of the demo without even being hurt by any of the zombies. What made the game even better known was that when players experienced the story a second time, they realized that it was much easier to hit the heads of monsters, that is, the firearm training in this game was very effective. It was to the point that one hour of training in Residual Devil was more efficient than several days of training in other games. The biggest drawback was that the game only had one hour of content, and even if they played the game a second time, they wouldn't get as much improvement as they did the first time. But that was already something Gabe had imagined would happen. Even though the game only had one hour of content, Residual Devil still received almost 1k downloads on the first day, jumping from the last place in the ranking of the university contest to the fifth place. The number one spot was still Spear Training, with 2,743 downloads, but seeing how fast Residual Devil was catching up, Gabe understood that it was only a matter of time before the game took the number one spot. So with the 100 mana units he had, and the nearly 2,000 mana units the game had available for him to use, Gabe intended to push Residual Devil's development forward by 20 days, doing everything today. Thus relying on word-of-mouth marketing from players to increase downloads, especially when they saw new content coming to the game, Gabe wasn't worried about the amount of mana he would spend. If he added another two hours of content, the game's 1000 plus downloads would already recover all the mana he spent on the game, not counting the new players who would experience this or players who would play the game again. But before developing the game, Gabe decided to make something even more important, a trailer. As the other game pages didn't have trailers other than scattered screenshots, Gabe thought that something like this wasn't possible to do, but upon reading viewers' comments on Amora's livestream, Gabe realized that this sort of thing was possible. So, to increase downloads even more, Gabe decided to make an animated trailer to attract viewers' attention for this game when they landed on the sales store page and convert most of them to players. Fortunately, most of the things needed for the trailer were already done, like the zombie lichen, the zombie Uriah, the humans, leaving him to just make the vampires, horses, and the maps. So having all the resources needed for the trailer, Gabe started dedicating himself entirely to making it, ignoring everything around him. Unbeknownst to Gabe, despite Resident Evil, village downloads still only being at 1000, the game was already doing quite well. For bored players, watching live streams was one of the great ways for them to pass their boredom, being able to just relax and have fun while watching someone they like train in games. Eric was one of those players. Even though he had recently become an E-rank player, he still followed some F-rank players who were live-streaming, and after participating in a real-world mission for a few weeks, today was officially his first day off. With interest, Eric opened the live-stream site to look for something interesting to watch, and was surprised that among the rank F streamers he followed, there were at least 8 streamers who were playing a game called Residual Devil, Village. He had never heard of this game, so out of curiosity, Eric hopped on the live-stream that had the most viewers to see what game it was. That livestream was from Amora, a cute red-haired girl who Eric had started following because of her looks. 
Every now and then he would make some donations to try to attract her attention, as there were only 100 to 200 viewers when he started following her, but to his surprise, on her most recent live stream there were 723 people. What happened to Amora in such a short time for her to grow so much? Did some famous streamer bring her viewers? Eric wondered, confused. I swear to you, in my marksmanship test, while before I managed to score 630 points, after playing Resident Evil yesterday I managed to raise my points to 700. Do you know how long I would have to train to get my points up that much? At least another two weeks. Amora said excitedly as she showed off her long red hair. Eric was momentarily entranced as he stared at her, until he realized what she'd said. What do you mean? Amora is already scoring 700 points on the marksmanship test. I'm still at 810 points and I'm already a ranky player. Eric was shocked as he went to check out the marksmanship test site. Since he was an old viewer of hers, he was lucky enough to get her to accept his friend request, so he could see her ranking by being on her friend list. Eric was shocked to see that Amora had increased her score by 70 points yesterday. At that rate, in a week she could apply to participate in a ranky quest. She said she got that much better while playing this game called Resident Evil that everyone else is playing. Eric wondered confused. Looking back at Amora's livestream, Eric read the comments and was even more shocked. I'm not even a firearms-focused player, but after playing Resident Evil I decided to take a marksmanship test too, and guess what? On my first attempt I got 300 points. Ha ha ha, I'm a genius marksman and I kept wasting my talent on a stupid sword. 300 points. I managed to score 315 points and I had never held a gun in my life. Even though Resident Evil is so scary, I'm still willing to play for another 3 hours today after I finish meditating. If I could stand it I'd like to play for 10 hours even if I had to repeat the story 10 times in a row. Damn, if the story was longer, I think it would be less tiresome to repeat this. Hey, Amur. Developer called EA has updated the residual devil page, show us. When this comment appeared, Amora who was reading the comments quickly opened the Resident Evil store page and started looking for the changes. Right off the bat, the first thing she saw was a large message written above the game's synopsis. Game demo. Available. Game trailer. In development. Estimated time 127 minutes. Chapter 01. In development. Estimated time 23 hours. Chapter 02. In development. Estimated time. When Amora saw that, she was shocked. Tomorrow Resident Evil will release a new chapter. What does that mean? She said excitedly. I think the developer will release more story for this game sometime tomorrow. Damn, he's not going to make another game. I thought it was more profitable for developers to make more games instead of focusing on just one game. I think he's doing this for us. He must have seen that we like the game so much that he decided to make more story for the game, even if it's not that profitable for him. What is the name of the developer, I have to thank him, the story he made is so good. His name is EA. Hey guys, what's the game trailer? Hasn't he already released some explanatory images? I do not know either. I think it's like a movie trailer. Heck, EA is going to spend mana just to make a trailer for the game, wouldn't it be better for him to just absorb that mana for himself? I don't know, the trailer will be available in two hours, we can wait and see. Amora also saw that the trailer would be available in two hours and decided not to play Resident Evil for the time being. She said that she would like to watch the trailer first and see if it could have any impact when she comes to play before she would play it. Viewers thought it was a good idea and they also decided to do the same thing. Suddenly, the amount of players online in Residual Devil decreased a little, but unbeknownst to Gabe, the amount of new people discovering the game because of the hype and the curiosity of viewers for its trailer was increasing a lot. Even Eric, who was a rank E player was curious about this, deciding to watch Amora's live stream to find out what it was all about and why this game was doing so well. 808 Launch of the Trailer During the two hours until the trailer was released, Amora and the other streamers avoided playing Residual Devil and focused only on discussing the game, the improvements they had achieved in their marksmanship scores, and even comparing various other experiences with viewers. When viewers noticed that 8 rank F streamers were doing the same thing, they started asking the streamers to get on a voice call together while waiting for the trailer, as it would be more fun to see their interaction. Finding this idea of viewers cool, the streamers all decided to do this and got together to discuss the experiences they had had with the game. Are any of you also a firearms user? Amora asked curiously, as she didn't know the other streamers very well. A boy answered, I am. Did you also increase your marksmanship points by a lot? Yes, I managed to increase my points from 630 to 700 points. If I can raise them another 80 points, maybe I can get a support slot in an E-rank mission. Amora said excitedly. 
All this because of residual devil. The boy got excited as he replied, me too. I only had 560 points before playing residual devil, but after I played the game for two hours, my score went up to 640. That was an increase of 80 points in just one day. I've never had such an amazing improvement in just a day. At that moment a girl interrupted, have any of you also tested your efficiency with knives? But the other streamers were confused. What do you mean? Doesn't the game only offer improvements for firearms? The girl smiled as she explained, hee hee, I thought that too. I decided to try Residual Devil just because it was an interesting game that viewers recommended after seeing Amora playing it, but since I'm a player focused on melee weapons, I just played it for the fun of it. During the combat, I ditched the pistol and tried playing the game with just the knife your character carried on him, and guess what? Amur was shocked. Don't tell me your melee training score has gone up too. The girl laughed out loud. Ha 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 ha, yeah. I had a score of 527 points before playing Residual Devil, but after playing the game for 3 hours, my score went up to 613 points. I received 86 game improvement points in a single training day. Even Knife Duel Simulator couldn't give me that much an improvement. And what surprised me the most was that the game isn't even focused on melee battles. OMG, I didn't download Residual Devil because I'm a player focused on sword combat. Could it be that if I play it with the knife it could also improve my combat? I think so. The girl responded to the comment, making viewers of all of the live streams even more excited. With that information alone, the amount of downloads for Residual Devil saw another explosive increase. Adding up the live stream viewers of all these streamers, they had a total of 3,000 people, with Amora being the biggest streamer among them with 700 viewers and the others with less people. Hey, did anyone else find a shotgun in the game? It's a lot easier to kill zombies with the shotgun, a chubby and slightly shy boy chimed up. He was the streamer with the least viewers in the group, with only 60 people watching him, but he was very good at shooting, to the point that his marksmanship training points were already at 820. However, he had not become a ranked player out of shyness. Is there even another gun other than a pistol in the game? Amora asked in surprise. Yes, I managed to find a hidden shotgun. Unlike the pistol, where you need a lot of shots to kill the zombies, if you shoot the shotgun at their head, the zombie dies pretty much instantly, the boy explained, which left both streamers and viewers in awe. Could it be that there are other things hidden in the game that we just haven't found? Another boy asked excitedly. Maybe. I've never heard of a developer doing something like that before, but this EA doesn't seem to follow the routine that other developers seem to do, so it's possible there are more hidden things as well. Amora gave her point of view. That's interesting. If it wasn't for the trailer that's coming out in 30 minutes, I'd want to jump in the game and look for any other secrets now. The other girl said excitedly. The conversation that these f rank streamers were having was something quite new for viewers. As games were usually made just for training, streamers had no real reason to interact other than if they were going to compete with each other, but since Residual Devil was so innovative, seeing something like this happening just to discuss things in the story, secrets they found, or even commenting on viewers' experiences, it was something that made all of the viewers very interested. And not only were the viewers the normal followers of these streamers, but there were also other viewers who didn't know what to watch, saw this situation going on, and tuned in on the live streams so they could see what these people were discussing. When they saw that this game was so interesting, they were eager to see the trailer too, wanting to know what innovations it might bring. With that, the total number of viewers on the live stream of those 8 people went up from 3,000 people to 5,000 during the 2 hours until the launch of the trailer. Amora had already broken the mark of 1,000 simultaneous viewers for the first time in her life, which made her very excited and grateful for Residual Devil. Even among the other streamers, some had managed to raise their total number of viewers to over 600, while even the smallest streamer, the shy chubby kid, managed to raise his viewership to 180 people, a number he never thought he would reach, making his cute little face show a big smile of happiness while thanking everyone who was watching him, especially when he promised that he would play Residual Devil again and that he would show everyone where to find the shotgun. This one statement then made his followers rise to more than 500 people, made up of both players that had already tried Residual Devil as well as new players who had just discovered the game and wanted to have special knowledge to help with their gameplay. In the blink of an eye, the two hours until the trailer came and passed, and they were only 30 seconds from having the trailer available. Hey, only 30 seconds left. Let's watch the trailer together. Amora pitched the idea, finding it really fun to talk to these people rather than just being alone. Yeah. I want to watch it with you too. The other girl was also excited as she agreed, liking these other people who also enjoyed the same game as her. So the eight streamers got together to watch the trailer. 
The total number of viewers that was at 5k had risen to 6k in the last 60 seconds, probably from people who set reminders to come back to the live stream and see what that trailer they'd been waiting for would show. On all of the streamers' screens, in the last 10 seconds, a countdown started. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. For a visual representation of the trailer, I sent the link to it on Discord, in case anyone wanted to watch the trailer before, or while reading the chapter. Discord. GG Key 35 KV7 Gur. Trailer I just realized now that the trailer version I used to write this chapter is only available in Portuguese. This game has like 15 different trailer versions. Thank you for understanding. If you want to see the visual parts of the trailer even though it's not in English, this is the link. The parts with important dialogue I translated into English during the chapter. Suddenly, the screen switched to a group of people dressed as peasants from a medieval period, holding hands in prayer. Eminent ones, hear our voices, united in reverence. With the lighting of the fire and their voice together, it felt very macabre and mysterious. Hey, this is the prayer scene at Luis's house. One boy commented. Yes, I remember I was scared to death when experiencing this the first time. I even thought a demon would be summoned, haha, one girl commented. The castle bell portends danger. They are coming. The image changed to the player looking at the castle while the strange old woman spoke in her crazy voice. What's with this sinister story? This baby is only six months old. Suddenly, the scene changed to a player speaking with Ethan's voice while looking at a woman holding a baby. Hey, is this Ethan's daughter, Rose, the girl who we're looking for in the story? Amora said excitedly. I think so. Wow, will chapter 01 show what Ethan's life was like before he arrived in the village? That's why she appeared in the trailer. Whoa, his wife is so beautiful. His life must have been really good. Look how cute Rose is. The salesperson said it's a traditional fairy tale of the area. Ethan's wife commented as she handed the book over for him to look at. On the cover of the book was written the words, Village of Shadows. Hey, is this Village of Shadows the village we were in while we were playing? I think so, maybe it's some macabre story about the village. Will it be possible to read the book during chapter 01 to understand the history of the village? Man, developer EA really thought about every detail of this game's story, huh? If this was a real book, he'd be rich by now, since this is much more interesting than any book I've ever read. Yeah, I've never had so much fun while playing a game. So the trailer began to switch between scenes of the happy life Ethan had with his wife and daughter, while showing a SWAT squad entering his house and killing his wife. Damn it, why did they kill her? Could it be that they kidnapped Ethan's daughter to take her to the village? Motherfuckers, I have to kill them all and save Rose. With the development of the trailer, the more than 6,000 people watching the livestream saw Ethan deal with countless zombies, different species of monsters, even a woman with a huge mouth that controlled insects. There was also a huge zombie who had a giant hammer slamming into Ethan, sending him flying. Each scene both shocked and scared the viewers. People who had already played Residual Devil thought that they would be able to continue playing the game without any fear, since they had already killed a few zombies, but when they saw the other monsters that Ethan would encounter in the story, those people got scared again. It was already very difficult to fight a single zombie at a time. What would they have to do when several zombies came at the same time? There was even a scene where Ethan was facing over 15 zombies. How could they survive that? At the end of the trailer, seeing Ethan suffocated by a large amount of metal falling from the sky took the viewer's breath away. Those who didn't know Residual Devil before were now shocked and very afraid of this game. How is it possible for a game like this to exist? Usually games are made for us to train. How can I train if I'm going to be scared to death? Holy shit, I almost shit my pants watching this. There really are people who play a game like that. Hey, is this game free? I want to play this. It looks so interesting. Public reaction was mixed. There were people who were terrified when they saw this scary trailer, but the vast majority of people had their hearts beating very fast, as they had never seen such an interesting game before. Even though they were so scared, such a unique experience seemed so amazing. And so, the number of residual devil downloads skyrocketed again, rising to over 2,000 people in a few hours, but that number just kept going up. 909 How to Make Money After the trailer was released, hype for residual devil broke out again. People who didn't even know about this college contest started going to the contest page to find this game called Residual Devil. As Rank F Players was one of the largest categories of players in the world, second only to Rank E Players, the target audience of this game was very large. F Rank Players were sending the game to their F Rank friends, and even some E Rank Players who found out about the game started testing it and recommending it to their E Rank friends, or even the F Ranks that were still on the lower end of the spectrum.
Unfortunately for Ranky players, the development residual Devil gave to skills was only slightly better than normal Ranky games, but because of how interesting the game was, even Ranky players began trying it out in droves. Unlike F rank players, E rank players already had a total amount of mana between 2 mana units and up to 10 mana units, which meant that they could play residual Devil for up to 10 hours if they felt the game was interesting. But of course, since Residual Devil didn't provide much of a big improvement for them, and the game only had one hour of content, most Ranky players had played the game for a maximum of six hours before returning to playing the other Ranky games that they were used to playing. The advantage that Ranky games provided players was that these games could consume more mana units per hour, which amplified the speed of upgrade. While the same game at rank F would consume one mana unit per hour, if that game was Ranky it would consume two mana units per hour, which would double the speed at which Ranky players would learn the skills of that game. Of course, as Gabe discovered earlier, if the game was really good, the amount of mana it might consume could also increase, but for that to happen, players had to have a very strong attachment to the game, something that hardly a game achieved. It would be even harder to ask an F-rank developer to make a game that players would have such strong feelings for. So, even if say Residual Devil's improvement was 1 point per hour, because of the emotion that the game caused in the player even though it only costs 1 mana unit per hour, for a ranky player to play a ranky game, that costs 2 mana units per hour, but with the better improvement than the other rank F games, 1 points is already much more profitable than other ranky games. But Gabe wasn't worrying about the potential ranky players he was missing out on for now, as just the rank F players were more than enough for him. After Gabe finished his lunch, it had been 3 hours since the trailer had been released. Using the management app for the games he uploaded, Gabe looked on his phone and saw that the residual Devil download had gone up from 1,000 downloads when he released the trailer to 2,200 downloads, moving the game up from 5th place in the university contest to 2nd place. The difference between downloads for residual Devil and Spear Training was only 600 downloads now, as the other game was at 2,800 downloads. But while Spear Training had become first available for download almost 15 days ago, residual Devil, Village was available approximately 24 hours ago. As the players had recently downloaded the game, Gabe didn't pay attention to the average game time and accumulated mana, as to have accurate data on this he would need to wait a few more hours. But the game's growth was a great sign for him. During the morning, developing the game trailer was not the only thing he had done, as most of the things in the trailer were ready. What took him the longest to do were the scenarios, taking about an hour to make all the scenarios that appeared in the trailer. As for the characters, he just used some illusions, which weren't real entities, as he wouldn't have enough time to make them all, and he then used the other remaining hours just to make the simple characters. Now that the trailer has been released, Gabe had yet to make chapter 1 of the game. He had already separated the game into chapters, the first chapter being the prologue story from before Ethan arrived in the village until the moment the player entered the castle the first time he was kidnapped by Karl Heisenberg. As what he would have to add would be more relevant to the story than in terms of combat, this was an easier task, so Gabe promised that Chapter 01 would be available tomorrow. I think I'll only need about 3 hours to develop the scenarios for Chapter 01, program the NPCs that will appear, and configure the battles that the players will have, Gabe said as he washed the dishes from the meal he made. I'm also going to need to earn some money. Looking around the small room he called home, mostly at the near-empty food cupboards, the previous Gabe skipping money on food and hygiene to spend it all on games was making his current environment very uninhabitable. How can I make money? Gabe wondered. The contest has a prize of $10,000 for the best game, which I'll probably win, but I'll still have to wait another week for the contest to end. Then it's another week for the judges to decide which game is the best. Two weeks living in these conditions will not be comfortable. The only way I can make money is by either selling stuff in Residual Devil for real money, or I can use my developer name to get money elsewhere. Like a live stream, but a live stream might not work in the short term, since I still would have to build an audience, right? Gabe was quite stumped. He wasn't too worried about living a life of luxury, as he didn't even have that much luxury in his other life, but living in such precarious conditions wasn't something he wanted either. The developer name I use is EA. Although the company that had that name in my other life was a money-sucking company, the symbology of the name is the best I've ever seen. Electronic Arts, nothing describes video games better than that name, since for me, there is no art more interesting than video games, which are electronic, but I didn't imagine that I would consider using the bad aspects of this company, something that would suck the players for every cent they had. I don't think that would be good for my future, Gabe quickly dismissed this idea. As much as he knew that this would be quite advantageous to make money, he would lose a lot of credibility with such greed. Maybe I can sell a collector's edition of the game. This collector's edition might add other clothes for Ethan, some pendants for weapons, and maybe a nicer backpack to put the items in. 
As long as I say that this collector's edition only makes items available aesthetically without any in-game advantage I don't think that will be a problem. Gabe thought rather deeply about it. As the university contest did not prohibit games from raising money, this would not be a problem for Gabe, but usually developers made the games free, as this would give the game more chance of becoming famous. With his plan of action already decided, Gabe got excited and started developing these cosmetic items for players. Since the game was in first person, since it was in virtual reality, Gabe put emphasis on making some custom gloves and jackets for Ethan, as well as customizing the layout of the inventory with other colors and styles in addition to the pendants he thought of for the weapons. The amount of items he developed was around 30, providing a wide variety of customizations for players to use however they wanted. Gabe even made items that were fairly girly, as he knew the game also had a lot of female gamers, who, despite the items not being much a match for Ethan, would enjoy having pink weapons and flowery clothing. The time taken to develop this stuff was no more than 30 minutes, and the price Gabe decided to put on the package was $3. Along with the collector's edition, Gabe also made a large disclaimer saying that this was just a way for players to show support for the game to help the developer financially, and that anyone who didn't purchase the pack would get the same story experience and skill development as any other player. With the DLC package ready, Gabe went back to focusing on making Chapter 01, adding more intensity to the horror and battle parts to affect players' emotions as much as possible and increasing the playtime, thus ensuring that the player was more involved with the story and learned more of the weapon skills. While in Gabe's previous world this, Chapter 01, he set aside could be played in roughly one hour by an experienced player, in this world Gabe made this experience last three to four hours. Thus, a rank F player with only 1 to 2 mana units would hardly be able to finish the story in just one day, thus giving more value to the story. Of course, in order to extend the story time so much, Gabe had to greatly increase the size of the map, making the size ratio closer to reality than in the original game. In order for the game not to be just the player walking long distances, Gabe had to think of things to add along the way, such as small puzzles, some zombies in places they wouldn't be in the original game, plus a side story that the player could do to understand more about the village. Gabe thought he would only need three hours to make this chapter, but with the extra parts he added in addition to making the map a little bigger than he planned, he spent four hours developing this chapter. It's finally done, Gabe said with satisfaction as he looked at the world he was building. Initially he was worried about the amount of mana he would spend to develop chapter 01, as for such a large and detailed world he would need at least 1200 mana units, but as he developed it, Gabe realized that he was getting more mana than what he was spending. Even after he spent 1,500 mana units on Chapter 01 and a little over 100 mana units to make the Collector's Edition, Gabe still had over 4,000 mana units available. With this mana I can already develop Chapter 02 completely. Gabe was shocked at how fast he was getting mana. He had figured the game would be successful, but not that successful. For a Rank F developer to reach Rank E, they would need to have a total of 1,000 mana units, which would be equivalent to 100,000 mana units collected in games. That's why other game developers preferred to make several games and collect all the mana from that game than to focus on developing a single game and risk losing it, since that way they would have a guarantee that they would reach rank E. Gabe, on the other hand, saw things in another way. Just with the demo of the game he had received 1000 units of mana, but after the launch of the trailer for the first chapter, the hype that the game received was enough to make him receive another 4000 units of mana. Imagine how much mana he might receive when the game had already launched chapter 01, or even by chapter 05. While other developers need a few years to reach rank E, I believe that in a few months I will already be rank E thanks to Residual Devil. Gabe thought excitedly. 1010 on the university radar. As Gabe completed the details of Chapter 01, in an office at Harrington University's developers course a man in his 60s was sitting in front of a computer as he looked at the list of games for the contest they were running. That man was David Brown, the dean of the developers course. Every year what he liked to do the most was to see the games of the university students in search of some developer with great potential, since theoretically the students should put the greatest possible effort into making these games, since that was what would define whether they would graduate or not. As he had already seen the 10 games with the highest number of downloads and determined that the developers who made these games had held the top 10 ranks since two days ago, David decided to look at the games with the fewest downloads, since perhaps despite the game being little known, they had some potential. Unfortunately nothing interesting came up, David sighed as he looked at the list of games. The vast majority of the games were just copies of the sample games that the teachers distributed for students to get ideas, or even copies of the games that were in the top 10, which were already copies of other well-known developers' games. Thinking that nothing interesting would come up, David was ready to close the screen, until he noticed something while looking at the list of developers participating in this contest. 
That boy Howard hasn't posted his game yet. David asked himself, a little conflicted, as part of him was disappointed that time was already running out and the kid hadn't seemed to post his game yet, while on the other hand, he had a bit of anticipation for what this kid would post. Howard was one of the most talented kids among the developers that year, with a total base mana of 100 units. With the time he had available, a game he could develop in 10 days could use 1000 units of mana, unlike someone with 30 mana units that could only make a game with maximum 300 mana units. Of course, Howard's talent wasn't just in the total amount of mana he had, since according to the reports David read, he also had a great creation ability, being able to make monsters and scenarios in a much shorter time than 99% of the other students. If this boy had good creativity, David was sure that Howard would be the student with the greatest chance of being able to meet his expectation to develop something innovative. Unfortunately, from what the teachers observed, this student's creativity was only average. He was good at developing what was asked of him, but he had a hard time coming up with new things. Looking at the list of candidates, David was surprised to see that Howard had apparently submitted his game 24 hours ago. He sent the game 24 hours ago and I can't find the game in the list. David wondered, confused, and started looking for the game sent in by Howard. This time he made sure he paid attention to it. As one of the professors at Harrington University, David had access to the developer's name, so he could see what the name of the developer who made the game was, as well as the stage name the developer decided to use. But despite looking at the long list of over 100 games, David was already scrolled up to the top 15 and still hadn't found Howard's name. It's not possible for the game he made to be in the top 15 in just 24 hours, right? David wondered in confusion as he watched closely. The number 15 is not him, nor the number 14, nor the 13. He calmly looked at each of the developers up to the top 5 and did not find Howard's name, making him go back to the list with the names of all the developers and make sure that he had really published his game. He actually published this, David frowned and decided to look at the top of the list. Spear Throwing Training, Nexus Gaming, Jacob Thompson, 2831 Downloads. Resident Evil, Village, Electronic Arts, Gabriel Howard, 2379 Downloads. David was so shocked, he had to rub his eyes. Howard's game is in the top two in just 24 hours. David screamed in fright. Knowing for sure that this game was by Gabe Howard and that it was only published 24 hours ago, David was really shocked. What is it about this game that's so attractive to players? It's been a while since I've seen an F-ranked developer make a game that grew a following this fast, except if they used external promotions to do so. David wondered suspiciously. Opening the game page, David saw that it was a zombies game with a slightly scary aesthetic, which made him raise an eyebrow. So he decided to affect the player's emotions, it looks like he got the hint, he said as a smile appeared. He was responsible for tipping the developers at the end of the letter that repetitive movements aren't the only way to make players develop their skills. As a C-ranked developer, David was already aware of a recent discovery by Mankind, that emotions are also responsible for influencing the amount of knowledge players received from training while playing games. But this kind of information was normally not transmitted openly to novice developers, as the Alliance used it to test developers and try to find talent among them, making this information common only among developers ranky and above. Of course, even though developers with higher ranks knew this information, humanity faced the difficulty of how to apply it. Many developers still didn't understand how games could induce emotion in the players, so the vast majority of developers just preferred to make games that bring a little happiness to the players while still doing the standard model of training in games. But looking at the game cover on the store page and the tags the game had, which included the tag, Horror, David was shocked at the idea Gabe had come across. This is a genius way to use player emotion. David said as he looked at the pictures with the zombies. Making players afraid of monsters is a great way to induce emotion, making their training more effective. As David scrolled down the page, he noticed something that confused him. A video. What is this about? Watching the strange video being streamed, David started to watch it curiously. Eminent ones, hear our voices, united in reverence. The image of the group of people dressed in peasant clothes praying hand in hand was something quite macabre for the players, but David's eyes were startled for another reason. What a realistic human. He said in shock as he paused the video to take a closer look. Hell, with the level of detail he put into these humans, it's understandable that it took him so long to publish the game, as it must have taken him at least 10 days just to get these people developed. David said in amazement. Suddenly, when the scene changed to the view of the village with the view of the castle in the background, David had to pause the video again and admire the detail that this map had. How much mana was spent to make this world? He wondered. But when the trailer reached the 45-second mark David was really shocked. 
On screen were at least 10 different zombies, all of which were extremely detailed, to a degree that David was blown away. Is this something an F-rank developer would be able to do? David wondered, not knowing what to say. The level of detail on these zombies was so high that even he believed he would need at least 5,000 mana units of trial and error before he could make a zombie as realistic as one of these, and that's considering he would be making a zombie with rank F strength. If he were to make a zombie like that with rank C strength, that value would be multiplied several times. And this was with the experience he already has from having played dozens, if not hundreds of games until he reached rank C. Now to see a developer rank F make a zombie as realistic as this in just 20 days, with a maximum of 2000 mana units available, and he still made humans as well in addition to a scenery as beautiful as he did, even if he let an ordinary rank F developer with 10,000 mana units take this on in 20 days it would be almost impossible for a developer to manage to do this. David's shock was only heightened when he saw the other species of monsters appearing in the trailer, be it the giant zombie with a big hammer, or the woman who looked like a vampire. Even that woman with the cut mouth who looked like she could control insects, each of these monster species was enough to make an F-rank developer busy for months, but Howard had done it in just 20 days. When David finished watching that video, he realized there was something he hadn't noticed. Was this video telling a story? He was so focused on the quality of modeling that he didn't even notice that this video was telling a story. Watching it again, David felt his heart race, thinking about how great Howard's idea was to make a trailer telling a story about his game to entice players to download it. Such an interesting story, even I'm in the mood to try it now. I don't think I've seen anything this interesting even in books made by the most renowned authors in the world, but Howard is making it into a game. Will it even be this good? David was uncertain. But sensing how excited he was to try the game made by Howard, David figured that at least his student was doing something right with it, so as a good dean he should try this game with great enthusiasm. As soon as I finish trying this game and evaluating it I should take it to the director of the university. Surely she will be happy to see that this was made by one of our students. Perhaps we can even help promote this, as it will raise the image of our university. David thought excitedly as he set the game to download and turned on his virtual reality headset. Despite being a game developer, he still needed a headset to play, but unlike players, as a game developer rank C, he had tens of thousands of mana to enjoy games with, so while most players could only play for two hours on maximum, David had all the time in the world to enjoy the game and analyze it perfectly. Gabe didn't know it, but his game had attracted the attention of one of the top game developers in his city, while the game developer at the absolute top would soon find out about it too. 1111 AIA is so conscientious. The speed at which Residual Devil was being downloaded was going up really fast. Streamers were attracting new players, new players were attracting other streamers, and other streamers were attracting even more new players. The cycle this was creating was making Residual Devil one of the most well-known rank F games in town. Unfortunately, because of the monsters that had been rampaging across the world, each town had become a small fortress, with the internet being closed off for indoor use only. So if Gabe wanted his game to go out and spread across the entire world, he had only two options to do that. One of these options was to personally go by public transport to other cities and upload his game to their local internet in person, which if he did it in neighboring cities would be a bit of work, but it could still greatly increase his player base in these other places. However, this option was very inefficient. Despite the city having tens of thousands of rank F players, having to travel to all cities around the world for his game to spread would be more work than focusing on the local audience, which would put a huge limitation on him. The other way Gabe could get his game to spread around the world would be to enlist the help of the university. As he studied at Harrington University in Sandstone Bay, unlike civil use which was restricted between cities, Harrington University had channels to access the internet from other cities. Of course, using the internet this way was very expensive and unlikely to be made available for civilian use, but for Gabe, who was proving to be a talented developer, it could be possible to get concessions after the contest was over. I hope my game attracts attention from the university, Gabe thought as he ate a bowl of cereal and milk. Fortunately, even though the city's internet was closed to internal use only, the newspapers still had correspondents in other cities who were able to bring information from elsewhere and make it available to everyone, so he didn't feel so bored that he didn't have much entertainment. Currently that was Gabe's biggest handicap in this world. When he wasn't developing the game, he didn't have much to do. The programs that were shown on television were very boring and cliched, and there weren't even web novels on the local internet for him to read and pass the time. The games being made were just focused on training skills, ignoring the part that players should have fun playing. 
The only thing Gabe found even remotely interesting were books, and he only found that out due to the comments on the livestream he saw where viewers compared the residual devil story to the books they read. But even so, the quality of books in this city was just average. At least this world's cultural gap can give me the edge to make my games stand out even more, Gabe perked up as he closed a book he was reading and washed the bowl he used to eat his cereal. Looking at the residual devil stats, a smile appeared on his face. Residual devil. Village. Downloads. 4.761. Average playing time. 2.3 hours. Accumulated mana. 10,950. Mana available. 9,314. Even with just over 1,600 mana units he spent, the mana that Residual Devil was harvesting from players was far greater than the amount of mana he was spending. With those 9,000 mana units he had available it would be enough for him to almost double the total amount of mana he had, or if he used it to invest in the game's story, he could use it to make Chapter 2 and the Chapter 3. Even if he greatly increased the scale of the game, using more mana to create even more zombie variations, detailing the scenarios even more, there would probably still be a few hundred mana units left. And that's considering that Chapter 01 hadn't been released yet. When players experienced it, Gabe was sure the mana he would receive would increase even more. As there weren't as many means of proper entertainment, Gabe used some of his free time to try out the other games in the contest and found that he wasn't the only one putting some form of monetization into their games. Although, while Gabe was just putting in cosmetic items for players to buy for a low price, some other developers were practically having their games and charging for the other half of the game. The biggest example of this was the spear-throwing training game, which was free to play, but the fastest and most powerful monsters could only be accessed if players paid $10. I think he deserves the EA title more than I do, Gabe chuckled as soon as he realized that. Considering that this game had just over 3,000 downloads and apparently most of the players paid for it, it was likely that the developer, Nexus Gaming, who developed this game, received at least $10,000, since the website they published the games on received a commission of 30% of revenue. While I'm just selling cosmetic items at such a low price, even though the amount of people paying for this cosmetic package is small, as long as I receive $2,000, that's more than enough for me to improve my diet and have a little bit of comfort. Gabe sighed at the thought of the cheap cereal he was eating just now. Looking at the game's sales page and seeing that there were only a few minutes left before Chapter 01 would be available to players, Gabe accessed his seat one more time to make sure everything was right and decided to watch a live stream of someone who was going to play the game to see how players would react to this new update. To Gabe's surprise, today there were even more streamers online with the title saying they were waiting for Residual Devil Chapter 01. Adding up the total number of viewers, Gabby was surprised to realize that there were at least 9,000 people in total watching his game. Of course, among those people, not all of them were players, as not all of them had awakened mana to be able to access the games and get the abilities it gave, but for the game to attract so much attention was good news for Gabe. Seeing that Amora was online, Gabe decided to log on and watch her livestream, as not only was she the streamer he was most familiar with, but she was also very beautiful, which made her stream more enjoyable to watch. Amora was again on voice call with the other streamers as she commented on Chapter 01 that would be unlocked today, in addition to the things they had collectively discovered with the game's trailer yesterday. Hehe, <laughs> my increase yesterday was 40 points in my marksmanship test. I already have 740 points, so there is very little left for me to reach 800 points and be able to participate in ranky missions, Amora said proudly. Whoa, you got another 40-point raise. How many hours did you play? Pixie, one of the girls on the voice call said in a surprised voice, I only managed a 29-point improvement yesterday. Amora smiled and replied, I played for 3 hours. After I played for one hour, I decided to take a break to meditate, so I could recover enough mana to play for another hour, then I took another break for a few hours and managed to play for another hour before bed, even with the livestream's mana expenditure. Upon hearing Amora's method, the other streamers were shocked. Damn, yesterday I played for two hours and my mana got exhausted. Today I'll try to follow your method too. Pixie said excitedly. 30 seconds to go. 30 seconds. Open the game page. Suddenly, when there were only 30 seconds left for the timer on the game page to unlock Chapter 01, and the viewers in the chat of all the live streams warned the streamers to open the page and see what would change. Amora was also no different and quickly switched her screen from the live stream to the game window, showing the timer slowly descending. When it finally reached zero, Amora saw that the play button had been updated to refresh, which left her a little confused. Hey, is Chapter 01 going to be free? She asked in surprise. Hey, for you the update is also not charging anything. Pixie said in surprise. Yes, I managed to download Chapter 01 without paying anything. Another boy said, also surprised. 
Hey, refresh the page, there is a payment option below. Amora, refresh the page. Seeing the comments, Amora refreshed the page, thinking it was a bug where she could download the update for free, but she was surprised to find that it was still free. Scrolling down the page to look at what the people in the comments were talking about, she saw that there was an option for her to buy a pack for $3. Could it be that the developer misplaced this and released Chapter 01 for free by accident? Amora wondered in confusion, as she clicked on this package called Collector's Edition. But when she saw that the things she could buy for $3 were just aesthetics in this package, she was even more confused. Wow, is that right? EA is selling this pack with only cosmetic items for $3. Look at that beautiful glove. Amora was about to complain that she didn't see much use in this collector's edition until she saw that there was a pink and white jacket and glove set, which made the hands of the character she used in the game much cuter. But something shocked her even more. Not only was there Ethan's large male hand wearing the glove, there was also a smaller, more delicate version of hand, apparently being a female version. Could it be that if I buy this pack I can play with a female character? Amora was even more surprised. Reading the description of it, she realized that no, this pack just added a new backpack design to the inventory, new clothes, gloves, pendants for the weapon and different colors to use on the weapons, but nothing that changed the story or gameplay of the game. Nowhere did it imply that it was possible to change the main character's gender. Even though it wasn't possible to play as a girl, Amora still thought these gloves were very nice and the price was very low, so she paid the $3 without thinking too much about it and decided to join the game. As she put on the virtual reality headset, viewers in the comments were chatting a lot. Hey, I managed to update the game for free. Me too. Hey guys, Electronic Arts updated the game description. It is written that all chapters will be free. As long as the player likes the game and wants to support the development, the way we can do that is to buy the collector's edition pack for $3 and receive the skins to use in-game. Whoa, I figured I'd have to spend at least $10 to play each chapter, but EA slapped me in the face by showing I can play everything for free. I've never been so happy with a slap like this. I think EA is the most conscientious game developer in the world. Now I even feel bad about playing the game for free, I'm going to buy the collector's pack to support the game, so I can be sure EA will keep updating it. Me too. You can count on me. Seeing those excited player comments saying that EA was the most conscientious game developer in the world almost made Gabe spit up the water he was drinking. If someone from my previous world saw something like that, they would probably swear at that person, Gabe laughed as he looked at the residual devil sales page and was shocked. 1212 what an interesting story. Looking at the residual devil data, Gabe was shocked. Residual devil. Village. Downloads. 4.977. Average playing time, 2.2 hours. Accumulated mana, 10,950. Available for withdrawal, $2,423. In the last 30 minutes since he had refreshed the page, the game had been downloaded by over 300 people, nearly hitting 5k downloads, and he already had $2,423 available to withdraw from purchases by those who bought the collector's edition. Considering that he kept 70% of the revenue while the other 30% went to the platform he published the game on, after some quick calculations Gabe discovered that in just 5 minutes since the game was updated more than 1,150 people had bought the collector's edition. The goal I set out to achieve in a few days was achieved in just a few minutes, Gabe gaped. Seeing how fast the numbers were rising, Gabe got even more excited. Today I'm going out to eat something delicious. He said excitedly, as he continued to watch the numbers go up. While Gabe was excitedly basking in the money he was earning, Amora had already hooked up her VR headset and had everything set up while booting up Residual Devil. As one might imagine, the start of the game this time was different. Instead of being immediately transported to the village like the other times she had played, now she was in a dark world, and in front of her two people appeared, a man and a woman. Soon a message popped up in front of her. Do you want to follow the story with Ethan or Athena? Your choice will only change the gender of some characters, thus keeping the original plot without any substantial changes. Can I pick a female character now? Amora shouted out excitedly. As a woman, controlling Ethan, who had a male body and a deep voice was a little strange for her, so despite getting more or less used to it over time, it was still something that took her out of the immersion from time to time. But now that she could choose a female character to play, it made her that much happier. Without thinking twice, Amora chose to play as Athena. This was one of the options that Gabe decided to develop for Chapter 01 that wasn't inspired by the original game from the other world. Since he watched Amora's livestream a lot, he heard her comment that it was strange to control a male character several times. 
Initially he didn't intend to do this, but since he was getting so much mana from players, and considering that female players made up 40% of the total players in this world, Gabe felt it was a worthwhile change to make. As he was able to simulate the characters on the first try, the amount of mana that Gabe used to make such a basic change in the game's story was only 200 mana units, which may have seemed like a lot to other developers, but for him who intended to invest in players' immersion in this game, that amount was almost nothing. After selecting her character, Amora felt her surroundings change. A long time ago, a girl went out with her mother to look for fruit for her father, who was working. A very pleasant male voice came into Amora's ear, while a 2D animation was projected from a paper book, causing a very new sensation. What a cool animation style, Amora commented as she watched with interest. But the forest greeted them with cold, gloomy silence and empty bushes. Determined to find fruit, the little girl left the mother and disappeared into the trees. The mother's calls soon faded away as the girl ran over vines, under branches, and into the forest. Seeing the girl running away from her mother and entering the dark forest alone, Amora was worried. Careful little girl, don't run away from your mother. She tried to warn, but as this story was being projected from a book, Amora understood that she couldn't do anything to change what was going to happen there. As she felt watched by strange eyes, the girl remembered the horror stories her mother told at night and her throat went dry. The story developed and Amora became more and more delighted to see the adventures of the little girl who was exploring this wonderful forest and meeting such charming animals. When the little girl ran into a big sea monster, Amora was worried that the little girl was finally going to die, but when the monster gave her one of its scales to eat, Amora felt that the fish was very cute. With each animal that appeared, Amora was each time a little worried, but ultimately she was very happy to see them treating the little girl well. That was, until the little girl took a golden relic from a metal horse's head, thinking it was a gift, but the horse was enraged and called the other animals to help her. Afraid, the little girl backed away until a witch appeared, covering the monsters with shadows as she said. Gifts we gave, but you wanted more. When the narrator said this sentence, Amora felt her vision changing from the immersive view she had of the book in 2D to the view of a warm and comfortable house. Sitting out front was a white man with brown hair and a serene expression. On the man's lap was the, a different little girl sleeping, while he held a book in his other hand. This is the house that appeared in the game's trailer. Amora told her viewers excitedly. Realizing that the man's position was the same as Ethan's wife in the trailer, she deduced that this man was Athena's husband. Looking at the child in the man's lap, Amora soon deduced that this little girl must be Rose, Ethan's daughter, or in her case, Athena's daughter, who they were looking for in the game's demo. What a lovely little girl, Amora said when Athena's husband placed Rose in her lap. On, Rose is so cute. Look at the size of this child's head. Lol. I can't believe they kidnapped such a beautiful girl. What are they going to do with Rose after they kidnap her? With a lot of patience, Amora decided to explore the house while carrying Rose around before putting the little girl in her crib. Throughout the house she found several objects that told part of the story of Athena and her husband, and in the bathroom she found several antidepressant drugs that left her a little worried, especially when reading on a floating screen that they were Milo, her husband's, medicine which he had to start taking after, the incident. What is this, incident? Amora wondered, confused. Was it something that happened before the game? I think we'll find that out in the story won't we? Probably. I'm loving how there are so many details in the house. It feels like EA has thought of every little thing for the game's story. This is so much better than a book. I wish I was a player so I could experience this. Me too. Maybe EA will release a book in the future with the complete story of the game. It would be a great idea. Gabe, who was reading this L, thought of something. If someone can livestream in-game, they can also record, right? So it wouldn't be impossible to turn the game into a movie. Considering how realistic the graphics of the games made from seeds are, in addition to being a very low-budget film, ordinary people could also enjoy the game and it could make some money for me. Thinking this would be a great idea for the future, Gabe made a note of it so he wouldn't forget, especially if he needed money at some point. Amora was enjoying the married life she never had in real life, the love Milo showed her, the photos of the two of them around the house. Well, that was until she sat at the table with Milo. Athena started talking about the supposed, incident, which Milo apparently just wanted to forget and get over, while Athena just couldn't ignore it. But suddenly, the door of the house was blown up, scaring Amora who was very busy talking with Milo. Quickly, an elite squad entered the house with guns pointed at the two while a man came and pointed his gun at Milo, who was lying on the ground unconscious, shooting him. Seeing Milo shot, who a few minutes ago had been treating her so well, showing so much affection for Rose and her, Amora felt her heart sink. But even worse was when the man grabbed Rose and started to take her away. 
From the conversation that Athena automatically was having with that man, Amora understood that they apparently knew each other and she had trusted him, but her thoughts were only filled with concern for Rose. Suddenly the men handcuffed Amora and took her to an armored police vehicle. She was still in shock, not knowing what was going on. How did this happen? They're the ones who kidnapped Rose. What's going to happen to me to cause me to get to that village? Amora was confused while trapped inside the police vehicle. Even the livestream chat was confused. Suddenly, she noticed Athena was getting drowsy and her eyes were getting heavy, until Athena apparently fell asleep. But before Amora could understand what was happening, Athena woke up with the car overturning. As she was not wearing a seat belt, she was thrown out when the vehicle door opened. Fortunately, the ground was heavily covered with snow, which broke her fall. Still a bit confused, Amora looked around and heard the phone of one of the police officers ringing. It's about time. What's the situation? Is the package safe? A voice came out of the phone. Amora tried to understand what was happening. What are you talking about? Where's Rosé? Who is this? This is a protected channel. You are not authorized to the voice was cut off when the cell phone battery died. Fuck, Amora swore angrily. Looking around, she found a clipboard. Mission objectives. Eliminate the target, retrieve the body. Take Rosemary Winters e Athena Winters. Take both Winters to Site C for further investigation. Minimum two transport agents to take them. What did they want to do to me and Rose? Amora wondered, confused even more. Seeing a flashlight on the ground, she began to search the guards but found no weapons. Looking around, Amora saw that there was a path like a trail in front of the place where the truck had overturned. Without much else to do, Amora started to follow the path while trying to understand what was happening. Whoa, this story is much deeper than I imagined. How did EA think of something so interesting? I'm eating popcorn while watching this. Amora, even my parents came to watch you playing with me after I told them the story of what was going on. Lol. My mom also sat next to me and started watching too, she's asking me a lot of things trying to understand what's going on, when I told her what I knew she got very curious and came to watch too. This game looks like so much fun. I didn't know games could be this much fun. Amora was walking very carefully. She had even forgotten to answer the chat, mainly because she was worried about some zombies appearing while she was walking through the dark forest. Her hand already had some cuts from pieces of wood that she had to deflect. From time to time she heard howls of wolves, which made her slow down a little to wait and observe if they were close. In a few minutes the sun began to rise. On the way she had found a small abandoned cabin, but while exploring the place she hadn't found anything useful until she had searched the basement. Suddenly, Amora heard a loud noise from the floor above. When she went back up the steps she saw that the house was overturned and half of the wall had been destroyed. Amora's heart was racing to the point that she was a little desperate, looking for a weapon to defend herself, but this small building had nothing. Leaving through the path that the hole in the wall left for her, Amora continued following the trail, and when the sun was shining enough for Amora not to need the flashlight anymore, she saw a small village. Looking at the large castle on top of the hill, Amora recognized this place. That's that village. She said, shocked. 1313 powers. Everyone watching was shocked, both the viewers who were watching the live streams of the streamers who were playing the game, and the players themselves who were experiencing Chapter 01 in person. Even though the game demo was extremely fun and very different from what they were used to for games, they didn't imagine that Chapter 01 would be close to as deep and interesting as it actually became. The scene where the players entered the village for the first time and the lichen ripping off two fingers from their hand made most players' hearts almost stop in fear. In other games, when the player died, normally the player's vision would just go black and the player would restart the game, but in Residual Devil, when the zombies bit the players, they would see that amount of blood coming out as part of their body's flesh fell off. It was a completely different feeling. It was so realistic that they forgot they were just in a game and players with the weakest of hearts sometimes couldn't resist and had to stop to rest repeatedly. Fortunately, the players in this world weren't just ordinary people, but people with gifts developed for battle, so as much as they didn't feel comfortable with some of what they were experiencing in this game, most players who tried the game had already witnessed something similarly brutal in real life. Of course, even players who had already witnessed this seeing it happening to a partner in a mission still felt bad after seeing the two fingers missing from their hand, and the fear that this could happen in real life became even more acute. Unbeknownst to most people, in Sandstone Bay an F-ranked game was becoming extremely popular among players, where not only F-ranked players were very interested in it, but even E-ranked players started downloading the game in order to experience it. While the game's demo had only had one hour of content for players to experience, Chapter 01 now had a total of three hours for experienced players and four hours for normal players. 
So for the F-rank players who normally had less than 2 mana units, despite meditating a large part of the day, they still couldn't finish the first chapter on the first day, which made the E-rank players who were doing live streams achieve a huge audience of people who were curious to know how the story would develop. Unfortunately for many of the curious players, despite Chapter 01 having 2 to 3 hours of gameplay more than the demo, nothing new had been added to the end of story after the demo left off, cutting the story off on the same cliffhanger as the demo, only this time time there was a new message for players who finished Chapter 01. Chapter 02 will be available in 45 hours. Upon seeing the message, both the streamers, the E-rank players, and the thousands of people who were watching the live streams were shocked. I can't believe it, I've waited so long, wanting to know what would happen inside the castle, only to find out that it won't be revealed until Chapter 02. A streamer said in frustration. I hate cliffhangers. Damn, now I have to wait two days to find out what happens next. No. That was so fun. In several homes across the city, families were sitting on sofas while watching the live stream on their living room televisions. In these families, both parents and children were talking excitedly about the very interesting story of this game. Not only were ordinary families talking about this game excitedly, but also reporters had seen how interesting this game was and soon understood that doing a story about this game would definitely earn them high praise from their bosses. So in a short time, reports about Residual Devil, Village began to appear in the biggest news sites of Sandstone Bay, to the point that even the executives of Harrington University also became aware of the news in a short time and contacted Professor Brown to understand what was happening. Fortunately, the report that Professor Brown had passed along to the university director had already been handed over to her, so this could be handled in the best possible way. While Residual Devil was upsetting Rank E players, Rank F players, and even the common people of Sandstone Bay, the culprit in all of this, Gabe Howard, who had created this very interesting game, was currently at a hamburger joint eating a five-meat sandwich with a big smile on his face as he looked at his cell phone screen. On Gabe's cell phone, it was possible to see the current game data. Residual Devil. Village. Downloads. 7.218. Average play time. 2.4 hours. Accumulated mana. 17,323. Available for withdrawal, $4,191. Available mana, 15687 1636 spent in Chapter 01. The total amount of downloads for the game was skyrocketing like an unstoppable rocket. While Residual Devil was in the first position in the University of Game Developers contest with 7,000 downloads, the second place had only 2,800 downloads in total, and that was because some of the Residual Devil players had gotten curious about other games in the contest and decided to download it to see how it would be. But when they realized that the game was just another generic F-rank game, unlike Residual Devil which was very creative, players abandoned it within minutes, returning to spend their mana on Residual Devil. Gabe, who previously didn't even have $100 in his bank account to survive the rest of the month, now had a big smile when he saw the more than $4,000 available for him to use whenever he wanted. This life as a developer is very rewarding, Gabe thought excitedly as he watched the numbers continue to rise continuously. The most shocking thing for him was the mana available in the game, which had already reached more than 17,000 mana units. That would be enough for him to develop at least 8 more chapters. I guess I don't even need to develop the 8 chapters directly with this mana, and I can start absorbing this mana for myself, or maybe I should use the mana for something else. Gabe thought excitedly. Thinking about converting 100 mana units from the game to become a single mana unit for him, using 10,000 mana units would be enough to double the total amount of mana he currently had. With that, not only could he get closer to becoming a ranky developer, but he could use that mana to convert residual devil knowledge into something real and use it to get stronger. While other developers used mana to absorb things like swordsmanship knowledge or to summon the weapons they created in the games into the real world, Gabe had another idea, in the residual devil world he was developing, there were powers. The four main villains of the game had special powers, Carl had the power to control metal. Alcina had regenerative abilities, biological immortality, and retractable claws. Salvatore could manipulate enzymes, something Gabe felt was pretty disgusting. Finally, Donna could control dolls and plants. Disregarding Salvatore, who had very useless powers, Carl, Alcina and Donna had very tempting and interesting powers for Gabe. Among players, in order for them to be able to learn a power like that, they needed to be at least rank E, in addition to spending dozens or even hundreds of mana units in a game with those powers for them to learn just one. Gabe, as a game developer, could use his mana to learn these powers. But of course, this also had a limitation. The amount of mana needed for him to learn a power from a game of his was proportional to the strength that power had, that is, if he wanted to learn Carl's metal control, he would need to use a large amount of mana units to be able to learn it. 
and considering the amount of mana units that normal developers receive per game, this was practically something impossible for rank F developers to achieve, whereas even rank E developers would struggle. The biggest difficulty for the other rank F and rank E developers was not only that they needed a large amount of mana units, but that they also needed to be able to develop the in-game character with such a power to begin with. Having to develop monsters for the game was already very difficult for rank F developers. Even spear training was highly acclaimed by the players who had tested it earlier because the developer who made that game managed to make a monster with the strength of rank E. But even though the monster had the strength of rank E, that was just the basic stats of the monster, which was just a stronger and faster fish than a rank F fish. Gabe was doing something different, with the simulation system he had. He could make any monster he could imagine, as long as he had enough mana for it. So as long as he could imagine a power for a monster, he could make it. Even if it was a rank a monster, if he had enough mana he could put that monster in his game's seed. Even when it came to the amount of mana the game yielded, Gabe was different. With the popularity of Residual Devil, even if Gabe used 50,000 mana units to be able to absorb Carl's metal controlling power, he still felt that there would be plenty of leftover mana. Not only can I learn Carl's metal controlling power, maybe I can even learn the powers of all four villains. Gabe got excited just thinking about it. After planning everything out, Gabe was very enthusiastic and quickly returned home after finishing his meal. The first thing he did was test how much mana he would need in order to learn Carl's power to control metal, but the amount was exactly as he had imagined. When he started putting in mana to learn the power, Gabe could feel that the total amount needed to learn it was around 50,000 mana units, which would be enough to increase his total amount of mana by 500 units. But Gabe soon understood a problem, to learn the game's skills, he would need to use his mana instead of the game's mana. That is, only his total mana limit would be valid, the 100 total mana units he had. If he continued, it would greatly delay the development of the powers he wanted. I need to increase my mana limit, Gabe thought excitedly. I have to balance this development. Not only do I need to gather mana to learn the powers, but I will also need mana to be able to use each of the powers, since the more mana I have, the more powerful the ability I will be able to learn. Besides, it's a given that I will be closer to becoming a ranky developer. Gabe thought excitedly, despite the rather high price to learn the skill he was interested in. Considering the monsters he was going to make for the next chapters, Gabe realized that this wouldn't be as cheap as making chapter 01 anymore, as he would have to introduce many different monsters with different powers, which would also have a high mana expenditure. I think I'll need around 4 to 5k mana units to make a chapter with the best quality possible, if it were other developers, they would probably say I'm crazy, but thinking about the reaction of the players, this could be a great option. As Gabe started to develop chapter 02, a message arrived on his cell phone. Whoever sent the message was named Professor Brown. 1414 Ranky Mission. In a small one-bedroom apartment there was a girl lying asleep on a single bed, but from the girl's expression, the dream she was having wasn't very good. Even though she was sleeping fitfully, it was still possible to see how beautiful this girl was. Long, soft red hair, white and very smooth skin, which showed that she took great care of her appearance, both with hair hydration and skin creams. Underneath her covers was a very attractive body. Even though she was wearing loose pajamas to sleep, the curves of her body were quite visible. If a man were seeing this, maybe he wouldn't dare speak, lest she wake up and spoil such a beautiful sight. But from the girl's furrowed brow, it was possible to tell that she wasn't having a good dream. In a few seconds she jumped out of bed as she screamed. Rosemary. Scared, the girl looked at the ceiling of her house, confused, reasoning what she was doing, until she understood that everything had been just a dream. Damn, I dreamed of residual devil again, the girl sighed as she understood what had happened. It was now 2 p.m. and she had still been sleeping, which showed both that her sleep quality was very bad, and also that she had stayed up late before going to sleep. This girl's name was Caitlin, but if someone on the internet were to see her, they would recognize her as Amora, the new F-rank streamer who had become relatively famous in town recently for being the first streamer to play residual devil. From a widely unknown girl who live-streamed to just 200 people in the beginning, to a famous streamer averaging 3 to 5k people watching her play recently, Caitlin felt her life had changed a lot. In fact, the amount of money she had made on the live-stream yesterday was enough for her to pay this month's rent. Thinking about the game that was responsible for making her famous, Caitlin was very grateful to Residual Devil and Electronic Arts, the developer that was developing that game, but there was also a bit of anger mixed in for making it so hard for her to sleep, as she continuously dreamed of Rose and the zombies she had to fight in the game. Giving up on trying to stay asleep, Caitlin decided to wash up and get ready for the mission she had today. 
Because of residual devil and the improvement she was seeing from the game, Caitlin had already reached 810 marksmanship points the night before, which qualified her to try participating in a Ranky mission. While Rank F missions paid an average of $200 per mission, Ranky missions already had an average payout of $1,000 per mission, which was a big change for her. Her monthly expenses were around $1,500. Considering that she did 10 missions a month, she could only earn $2,000 normally, which was barely more than enough to pay the bills and support herself, but now that she could participate in Ranky missions, if she maintained the quest average, she could receive at least $10,000 every month, which would improve her quality of life by a lot. Of course, with the increase in income she would have, there would also be an increase in risk in missions, which was already common for players. The kill rate of the missions weren't low, but Caitlin was confident she could pull it off, especially with the points she scored on the virtual marksmanship test she took. Glancing at the time, Caitlin saw that it was almost time for her to head out and she began outfitting her quest accessories, black military boots, green cargo pants, reinforced belts, and a green camouflage tactical shirt. Above the shirt was a protective vest for slashing attacks, a black mask that went up from her neck and covered her nose, and a black cap that held her hair in a bun. What stood out the most was the gun she carried on her waist and the briefcase she was holding with just one arm, which protected an assault rifle. Unlike Amora, the beautiful and sweet game streamer, presently she was Caitlyn, the rank F player who would do an experimental mission for Ranky in assault weapons and was prepared to kill. This personality difference might have seemed glaring to ordinary people, but for players it was their way of separating reality from the missions they were participating in, m so their mental health wouldn't deteriorate too quickly. As for Caitlyn, it was also a good way to disguise her appearance. Despite wearing looser clothes and a protective vest, it was still clear the size of her breasts and ass were far above average, which was not a very useful set of traits to have in a place as dangerous as the missions they were undertaking. This wasn't because the monsters would get horny at the sight of her or anything of that nature, but because she didn't have full confidence in the player partners she would have, who being in an isolated and lawless place, might try to do something nasty to her. That's why Caitlyn was always concerned with hiding her body and appearance as much as possible, leaving only Amora to be famous because of her beauty, while Caitlyn was known only for her professionalism and for not talking much. The place where players met to assemble for missions was the Sandstone Bay military base. There they would meet their mission partners, and plan how tasks would be distributed. As usual, Caitlyn was leaned up against the wall in the corner as she listened to the other players decide their tasks. Discovering that their mission would be to deal with a group of zombies caused Caitlin's eyebrow to rise in surprise, something no one noticed. Upon learning their target, a man with a sword on his waist commented, so are we going to deal with residual devil in real life? Hearing what the man said, out of the group of eight people, three other people reacted and laughed. I just hope that a zombie doesn't jump up and rip my fingers off. Haha. Ha. The man with the sword and two other people laughed at this, leaving the other three confused. While Caitlin also understood, she just didn't react. What do you mean by that? A woman holding a large spear looked confused. Don't you know about residual devil? The swordsman asked in surprise. No, what is it? The woman asked, confused. Seeing that not only was this woman confused, but also the other two players did not understand in addition to the quiet woman leaning against the wall, the swordsman soon explained about the game. Residual Devil is a game that a rookie developer from Harrington University released a few days ago in their biannual contest. Despite being an F-ranked game, this developer was quite the genius, creating a much more interesting story than any of the books I've ever read. A man with a big shield on his back said excitedly. Hey, not only is the story good, I managed to train my swordsmanship a lot there, despite dying a lot. The swordsman said, a little frustrated, which made the eyebrows of the three players who didn't know about the game rise up. Did you die in a rank F game? The woman asked. Don't underestimate residual devil. Even the weakest monsters in the game have high F-rank strength. And since I could only use a small tactical knife, it was difficult to deal with the monsters at such close range without dying. But the training was pretty good for a rank F game, the swordsman explained, when I used my sword again after training in the game, it was as if I had spent the whole time training in a ranky game, which surprised me a lot. The other players were surprised, as even the other ranky players who knew about Residual Devil were unaware of this, as their main weapons were not firearms, knives, or swords. Looking at the woman with a pistol at her waist, the swordsman thought of something. You must have enjoyed training in Residual Devil more than I did, right? Caitlin was taken aback by the man's sudden question, but she quickly nodded in agreement without saying anything else. Realizing that this woman didn't like to talk much, the group put the game talk aside and went back to focusing on the mission.
With all roles delegated, they got on the bus that took the players to the city gate where their mission would take place and began to concentrate, stabilizing their feelings so that they wouldn't affect their judgment outside the city gates and cause the death of anyone. A short time later they were already riding some rented motorcycles through the forest outside the city to get to their mission site. Their identities had already been proven and they all left their useless belongings in the city, both cell phones and Caitlin's suitcase were left, since outside the city there was no cell phone signal and holding the assault rifle by the shoulder strap was much better than in the suitcase, which she only did within the city for safety reasons. They soon came upon a small town that was abandoned many years ago, which just so happened to be their destination. There has been no problem in this region for a long time, but just a few days ago something new was detected by the military. Let's stop the motorcycles in a safe place. From there on, we'll go on foot. The team captain, the man with the big shield, spoke in a serious voice over the radio, totally different from the cheerful and relaxed voice he had when talking to the group about residual devil. Hearing the captain's command, the other players also stopped their motorcycles in the safe place and started walking. In a low voice, the captain explained to them the reason for the decision, since the city is being attacked by zombies, they are most likely very sensitive to sound, so we should make as little noise as possible. Previously, the cemetery of this city had already been destroyed so that something like this would not happen, but apparently another cemetery was found under the main mansion of this city, probably a tradition of some rich family that their family members could not be buried next to the rest of the city. Unfortunately, a virus of some sort found these corpses and turned them into zombies. Apparently the strength of these zombies is at low E rank, but these zombies have also turned other weaker monsters into zombies as well, which spawned some more F rank monsters, so stay alert. Hearing the captain's explanation, the other players nodded their heads again as they maintained their battle formation. The captain stood in front with his big shield, and next to him were the swordsman and a woman with a big axe. Behind them were two more people with bows, a man and Caitlin holding guns, and at the end there was a woman with a wand. Although firearms were quite powerful against rank F monsters, the effectiveness of them against rank E monsters was a little lower, which made rank E players transition to using bows, which with the skills they learned and when using mana, could do much more damage, leaving firearms only for novices. Of course, there were also magical firearms that did the same damage as bows and with more practicality, but such equipment was so expensive that only very rich players decided to invest in them, while the rest just decided to use bows. Caitlin swallowed hard as she looked at this small, destroyed town. But when comparing this town to the village she was used to frequenting in Residual Devil, her nervousness quickly subsided. This town is much less scary than the village. I'll just do what I usually do in the game and everything will be fine, Caitlin mentally said as she comforted herself. What she didn't expect was that the improvement the game caused for her would be much greater than she imagined. 1515 I see games as art. Bang, bang. Watch out, dogs are coming. The team leader screamed in concern as he used his shield to hold off the other zombies' attacks. Luckily he was very agile with his shield and none of the zombies' attacks got through. The shots that some of the people on the team were firing were very timely and whenever a zombie would break through his defense, a head would be blown off quickly. Thanks for that. He squealed happily as he continued using the shield to protect himself. Caitlin was surprised that even though she was dealing with peak F rank zombies, she was still managing to kill these monsters more easily than she realized. In other missions she had participated in, even though she was dealing with monsters of mid-rank F strength, she still had a bit of a hard time hitting critical points and just aimed at more guaranteed locations that she could see, but who knew that now against more powerful monsters she would be managing better. What's happening to me? Caitlin wondered confusedly, trying to understand what was going on. She hadn't even used mana to strengthen her senses. She was just relying on her muscle memory to land those shots. Is this improvement because of residual devil? As she thought about this possibility, the more she felt it made sense, and she was excited, as she had never felt such an improvement, especially in such a short time. What she didn't know was that not only did she get better while shooting because of the improvement her emotions of fear caused when playing the game, but also because of the confidence she felt after killing monsters as scary as the lichen zombies of Residual Devil. Since she had killed so many scary monsters in the game so easily after several hours of gameplay, why couldn't she achieve this in real life too? So, without her noticing, the mana from the monsters she was killing were slowly entering her body, accelerating the progress speed her mana would need to reach a higher level than the other times she came to do quests. Because of the heat, her forehead was sweating profusely, even more so with the hot breath caught inside her mask as she panted, which only made the situation worse, but Caitlin just ignored this and kept shooting, focusing only on what was important in the current moment. Dash. In Sandstone Bay, also because of the hot weather, a boy was wiping sweat from his forehead just like Caitlin was having to in the abandoned city. 
That boy was Gabe Howard, who had been on his way to a cafe to meet the professor at the university who sent him a message, asking them to meet to talk about something related to his game. Upon receiving Professor Brown's message, Gabe was a little concerned, as he noticed that his game was quite different from the other players' games and thought that perhaps this was attracting unwanted attention. He had already read about things like that in the other world and was worried about it. But remembering Professor Brown's classes and thinking about how friendly this man was to him, Gabe was a little less worried as he tried to think of excuses he could come up with if this was a bad thing. As Gabe walked, a few people looked at him a little curiously. Not because of something strange he was wearing, or because he was recognized, but because of his appearance, which despite being a little dark due to malnutrition, after the haircut he had had a 180 change, transforming him from a skinny boy with possible health and social problems to a handsome, confident young man who walked with his back straight with pride. What they didn't know was that the straight spine was just the habit he retained from life in another world and the confident expression was just him trying to encourage himself to keep up the lies he was making in case something bad happened. If the old Gabe had known how great the change that cutting his hair would have made to his public image, he'd have probably cut it more often, but he was so focused on studying games that none of that ever crossed his mind. The current Gabe, however, was so distracted that he didn't even notice the attitude of other people. Arriving at the cafe where Professor Brown had asked them to meet, Gabe kept his posture straight and walked in with a fair amount of confidence, which attracted a few stares, which he selectively ignored until he found the professor and walked over to him. Seeing the handsome and confident young man coming towards him, Mr. Brown was a little confused, not understanding what this young man wanted, since the professor was here to see one of his students. But when he took a closer look at the young man's hair color and at his face in general, surprise overcame the middle-aged teacher. Howard, is that you? Mr. Brown asked in amazement. Gabe was confused by the teacher's question and replied with a furrowed brow, getting a little lost in the stories he was crafting to cover himself if this turned out to be an unpleasant meeting. Yes. Realizing that he had flustered his student, Mr. Brown apologized with a smile as he waved Gabe down. I'm sorry Howard. Your change of appearance caused me to lose myself for a few seconds. Have a seat. Seeing Mr. Brown's demeanor, Gabe became a little less vigilant as he sat down. I'm sorry Mr. Brown, but I'm very curious as to why you invited me here today, Gabe inquired as soon as he sat down. Seeing that that was the first thing Gabe had to say, Mr. Brown chuckled, mostly noticing the bit of insecurity lurking in this young man. Don't worry kid, I actually called you here to tell you some good news. Hearing this, Gabe became curious. Good news. What is it? Considering that your game is already at over 7,000 downloads, first of all, I have to congratulate you on breaking the record for the most downloaded game in Harrington University history. The last record was just 3,911 downloads, so I believe it will be difficult for future students to beat your record for years to come, haha. <laughs> Mr. Brown chuckled as he held his hand out to Gabe and shook it after he took it. For this, the school has a bonus of $50,000 for you and a private mentorship with a Rank C developer for the creation of your future games. But considering how good your last game has been, I believe that this mentorship would be useless, as I can't even think of a single useful tip to help you. Gabe was surprised. With $50,000 I won't have to worry about money for a long time. If I had known this scholarship was a possibility, I wouldn't have even created the game's monetization system. But despite the surprise, Gabe still cracked a big smile at the great news. Also, I think your position as top game in this year's university contest is already secured with the current amount of downloads you have, so the school decided it wouldn't be a problem to tell you this next bit of information in advance, Mr. Brown said, a little more seriously this time, usually students who win the collegiate tournament are given the right to publish a game of theirs in Oakwood Grave City for free as soon as the tournament is over, which is our nearest neighbor, but we noticed that your game is apparently not yet complete, as you intend to add more chapters to it in the future. So, we decided to let you know in advance so you can decide what you prefer to do, as the right to publish your game in another city is unique, so we can only publish it once. Gabe was both surprised and confused by this. Decide on what, Professor? Would you rather we publish your game as soon as the tournament is over or would you rather we wait until all chapters of the game are released and publish it then? Mr. Brown asked, quite interested in this young developer's choice, wanting to know what development plan Howard had for such an innovative game. Hearing this, Gabe soon understood what the situation was that the school was having. He could very well publish the game immediately, which would directly increase the amount of downloads and the amount of mana he would receive continuously, or he could continue with the mana rate he currently received from the game's downloads in Sandstone Bay and just release the full game when everything was ready, which would yield several times more mana, but only in the future when the game was complete. 
This was a very pertinent choice for Gabe, who had recently discovered that he would need at least 50,000 mana units to unlock Carl's power. If he chose to launch the game in both cities now, it could greatly reduce the amount of time he would need to wait to get strength. But thinking about the long term, it was much more worthwhile to wait now and release the game when everything was ready so he could get all the game powers he wanted with the huge influx of mana that would come from the new players in the other city. In the end, Gabe didn't think long before answering the only choice he found acceptable. I'd rather you wait, Mr. Brown. By the time the game has all 10 chapters done I believe it will be ready to go to other cities, Gabe answered confidently. Hearing Gabe's response, Mr. Brown's curiosity was piqued, and he couldn't help but ask with a grin, what gives you so much confidence that you keep developing this game, Howard? Gabe dedicated himself to the maximum to be able to make the game extremely challenging and scary, trying to extract the maximum emotion of fear from the players. But he hadn't considered that it might traumatize some players with a fragile heart to the point where those players felt that if the game was so scary, how scary would it be to go on quests against real monsters? I'm sorry, Mr. Brown, Gabe sincerely apologized. Hearing this, Mr. Brown was even more pleased with this kid, as he was concerned that Howard might not have cared about these rookie, weaker players, feeling that they didn't deserve to play his game, but seeing the sincerity in this young man's apology, Mr. Brown smiled as he continued. Don't worry, this is not your fault. To be honest, this is more the university's fault than your fault as a developer. Usually games from rank E and above go through a review criteria so that they have a limit on the difficulty for players, so players who just became rank E wouldn't experience the hardest games of rank E at first, thus affecting their mindset. However, no one imagined that one day this would be necessary for rank F games. Hearing this explanation, Gabe felt that it really made sense, and soon an idea of how to deal with it popped into his mind. Mr. Brown, I think I have an idea of how I can handle this. Mr. Brown was curious what idea this young man could come up with, as up until now, every idea he had come up with had been revolutionary for the game development industry. And when he heard Howard's idea, Mr. Brown was even more delighted, thinking that for a young man to be willing to spend mana from his game to do something like that was incredible, especially not knowing that the university intended to limit which players could play his game. But with this idea, Mr. Brown knew he could go back to the headmistress and tell her that her involvement wouldn't be necessary. Very well, Howard, with your idea we can be more relaxed. But although your idea is very good, we will still carry out some tests with your game and ensure that it does not affect new players so much, okay? Mr. Brown said with a smile. Gabe smiled back and nodded. I also hope for that, Professor. I hope that my game will bring happiness to mankind, not sadness or mental problems. After saying goodbye to Mr. Brown, Gabe returned home as he worked out the idea he had for solving the game's problem. Initially Gabe had not considered this point and just made the game with a unique difficulty, but listening to the considerations of the university and even the city government, Gabe understood that this was very important and understood that it was his duty, as a developer, to guarantee the quality of the game and the mental health of the players so as soon as he got back home he started to develop other difficulties for Residual Devil. Just like the version of the game he played in his other life, Gabe decided to split the game into three difficulty levels. Casual. A mode for those who prefer less action. The player will be given an aim aid to familiarize them with the weapon in hand. Enemies are weaker than on other difficulties. Standard. The game's normal difficulty before the update. If the game is too difficult, you can opt for casual difficulty on the you died screen. Note. This can only be done on standard difficulty. Intense. A mode for those who like challenges and who like the skills learned in the game to increase as quickly as possible. Monsters will be more resistant and will deal more damage to players, making it more likely that players will die from a mistake. The player only has one life in this mode. If the player dies the progress will be erased and the player will have to start all over again, just like in real life. Note, it is only possible to enable, intense, difficulty after the player has completed the current chapters on standard difficulty or the player's rank is at least peak rank F. With these three difficulty levels, not only would Gabe be able to help players who were less skilled, but he could also amplify the difficulty even further for experienced players, further increasing their skill gain when playing the game and making it possible for more players to have more chances to reach rank E. Not to mention the part about the player having only a single life meant that players would have to play the game for even longer, as they would have to start all over again, which would further increase the replayability of the game in the long run. With all that planned, Gabe set about developing this game update. The amount of mana he spent to change the difficulty of the monsters was high, requiring 1000 mana units to change the entire difficulty of the game, since he needed to simulate the monsters with more or less power. 
But considering that he had more than 15,000 mana units stored in the game, that was no problem for Gabe. There was actually one problem, however. He had gotten so focused on redeveloping the game that he only realized he was starving when it was already 2.30 a.m., and as there was no restaurant open for him to order food, Gabe was a little disappointed when looking in the fridge reminded him that he still hadn't stocked it. He only had some instant noodles and leftover food that was practically spoiled. Wait, games aren't something that just let the player absorb combat skills, right? What if I added something like an easter egg where the player could find a kitchen, and in that kitchen the player could use the herbs they accumulated during the game to develop more medicine, but coincidentally there would also be a village woman who could teach the player cooking skills. Or if the player is in the castle, there is a cook that was enslaved who can also teach the player how to cook, so then players can learn how to make medicine and also how to cook, of course, everything for the players. Gabe thought excitedly. Gabe's cooking skill was not very high, both in this world and in the other world, so he normally had difficulty cooking really tasty food, which made him prefer to order food from restaurants rather than using his own kitchen. But if he simulated a character with good cooking skills, this would not be impossible. Of course, his current hunger couldn't be ignored, so Gabe ate a pot of instant noodles despite feeling guilty that the nutrition in it was terrible, and with a full belly he went back to his room and started to develop the setting for the cook in the kitchen that players could use. His creativity was very good and in a short time everything was ready, so with satisfaction he clicked the button to release the update to the players and tried to use the game's mana to learn the cooking skill that he simulated for the cook in the game. Only 100 mana units. Gabe was surprised to see how cheap this was, considering the game's peak rank F shooting skill only cost 200 mana units, but he soon understood that the cooking difficulty was more a matter of practice, something that didn't require as much effort physique and hand-eye coordination, so he soon learned that. But of course, with the problem that he could only use his own mana instead of the game's mana to learn the skills, upon learning the skill he felt his body getting weak. This wasn't just because of the single skill, though. He had also learned the shooting skill, despite not having a weapon yet, as that could come in handy at some point. Plus, he had a lot of mana available to use, so before going to sleep, Gabe bought some ingredients since dawn was already breaking and he used his newly learned cooking skill and made the most delicious breakfast he had ever prepared in either of his lives. It still wasn't the tastiest food he had eaten in his life, as he didn't make the cook in the game a three Michelin star cook. That, though, would have completely broken the immersion of the game, and he was already quite satisfied with what he had. Perhaps in the future I can add a more developed character in this aspect, so I can learn better skills, but for now I must focus on my priorities, as the development of chapter 02 was slightly delayed by a day, and I will have to spend more mana to develop each of the monsters in the future into different difficulties. I must stay focused, Gabe thought contentedly as he lay down comfortably on his bed and finally fell asleep. While Gabe was entering the dream realm, some players were complaining on the Sandstone Bay Players Forum. After watching so many residual devil livestreams, I was so excited to play. Who knew I couldn't even kill the first zombie? It's not just you, friend. I became a player last week and also went to try out the game after seeing Amora playing, but when I died twice in a row to the zombie, a fear crept into me, preventing me from further advancing in the story fear. I've almost given up on becoming a player, if just playing residual devil is so hard, imagine dealing with monsters in real life. When my finger was ripped off, I immediately closed the game, I've never been so grateful to have all five fingers on my hand. Stop the drama, you are novice players, your place is playing easy games for novices, leave residual devil to professional players like me. Yes, go back to your easy game and leave residual devil to the professionals. Professionals. I just saw from your profile that you are only a mid-rank F player. Stop talking nonsense and mind your own business. I doubt you made it all the way to the castle. Ha ha ha, F rank players are so cute, this game is so easy, I don't know why you guys are having so much trouble playing this. Hey, my residual devil just got updated, is chapter 02 here? Mine too. Too bad I haven't reached the castle yet and I can't play chapter 02. I just read the patch notes and found out, chapter 02 has not arrived. What changed then? Apparently now players can choose the difficulty of the game, there's a casual game for novice players who struggle and need a little help learning to aim, in addition to enemies getting weaker, there's a standard mode, which is the difficulty we're used to, but apparently the intense difficulty also appeared, where the player only has one life, if he dies he has to start all over again, besides the fact that the monsters are stronger. Hey, this intense mode looks interesting for ranky players. Ranky. I'm a peak rank F and I think I'm going to try this insane mode already, it looks a lot more fun. You're lucky, only peak rank F players can experience the insane difficulty without having to complete the current chapters. This casual difficulty looks cool, should I try playing the game again? 
Are you the friend who recently became a player? Livestream yourself playing the game, if you can play it maybe I'll try that again too. Heck, I want to see it too, I was so scared to try the game, if you can play being an F rank just a little while ago, maybe I can too. Does anyone understand what EA meant by, there's a new Easter egg in the game? Easter egg? Is it Easter, by any chance? I don't know, I'll try the new difficulty. Residual Devil's new update didn't bring any new content, but despite the game's story not progressing, players who had already played Chapter 01 more than once felt that it sounded interesting and decided to try playing the game in, insane, mode. While players who were scared of the difficulty also decided to give the game another chance and try it out in, casual, mode. It could have been said that Residual Devil was practically still the same game, but the attention the game was receiving after the newest update was as great as if the game had received more chapters, making the game even more viral in Sandstone Bay. 1717 Another Residual Devil Explosion Gabe hadn't even woken up yet, but Residual Devil was exploding in popularity among Rank F and Rank E players again. After a few hours of live streaming from other Rank F players, the timid players felt confident again, as they realized that it might be possible to actually kill the zombies now and maybe even complete Chapter 01. Then, from the thousands of players who had downloaded Residual Devil and had given up on playing the game, another fever to play it arose. Come on. Today I have to kill at least one zombie, that's my goal. An 18-year-old boy who just awakened his mana said with a little confidence in his voice. The boy's parents had been very worried when they saw that their son was quite scared and sad after becoming a player and they complained to the city government, asking if there was something wrong. But today was different. After their son decided to try training in a game one more time, when he logged out his whole person had changed. From the previous shy and downcast boy, now a passionate and confident young man had emerged from that room. His mother asked in surprise what had happened, and he replied with great enthusiasm that he had managed to kill a zombie. Although the player profession was quite famous in the world, not everyone was so knowledgeable about it, and that included the boy's mother, who didn't quite understand how everything about her son's situation worked, but seeing the enthusiasm and confidence that her son was demonstrating for the first time, it made her heart warm and she decided to make a very hearty and delicious meal to celebrate her son's success. Of course, while she was cooking she called the city government and thanked them from the bottom of her heart for what they had done, as in her mind, the government had done something with the games that made her son better like magic. She knew that the player profession was very dangerous, but it was also a very rewarding profession, with a ranky player being able to receive a much higher salary than many other professions people could get. Despite the money, she wasn't so confident about letting her son pursue this profession and intended to discourage him so that he would live a more secure life, but seeing the confidence he was showing now, her heart underwent a little softening as she was actually a little proud to see how her son was acting for the first time. Seeing that his mother didn't understand very well how the games he played worked, today the boy decided that he would meditate all day to recover part of the mana he spent playing and he would broadcast his game to the television in the living room so that she and his father could better understand what he did, and mainly, for them to see how cool he was killing zombies as scary as the ones in Residual Devil. Since he had awakened his mana just a short while ago, he could only play for a maximum of 40 minutes, but since he was already past the game's introduction where he only needed to walk an adventure through the forest a few days ago, since that wasn't scary, now he was ready to take on the village and could show real action for his mother. This scene where players were showing off the game to their family was not only happening in this boy's house, but also in several homes in Sandstone Bay, where shy young people who had been scared by the game were now confident as they managed to kill the scary zombies and wanted to show what they were doing to their families, since showing off Residual Devil was much cooler than showing off a game where they were trying to kill fish with spears, like in the second place ranking game at Harrington University. Not only were novice players excited about Residual Devil again, but a new trend emerged among veteran players. Haha, <laughs> check it out. I managed to complete Chapter 01 in 3 hours and 12 minutes. A Rank E player said excitedly on the livestream. Whoa, I didn't even think that was possible. Holy crap, I've already played for 5 hours and I still can't complete Chapter 01. Couldn't you complete it even faster? I think I can actually complete this even faster, but now I'm out of mana, we'll have to try tomorrow, the young Rank E streamer said, a little tired, but with a satisfied smile on his face. Damn Daniel, Jacob just completed Residual Devil in 3 hours and 8 minutes on his livestream. My god. Did he manage to finish it even faster? When Daniel, the streamer who had just finished Chapter 01 in 3 hours and 12 minutes, read that comment, all the satisfaction he felt at being able to finish the chapter quickly disappeared, replaced by a willpower to win.
He soon opened Jacob's livestream video and started watching his entire process live, trying to see what the other streamer had done to save time, and of course, relying on the help of the chat to pay attention to things he wouldn't notice. The community that was emerging among the veteran players was called Speedrun, something that when Gabe saw it, he would soon recognize as something very common in his other world, but in this world this was the first time that something like this had appeared, and the players were fascinated with how much fun it looked. Damn, it took him three hours to finish chapter 01, I think I'll need at least five or six hours to finish this, I can't even compete. Me too, I'm just a rank F player, for me it's really hard to kill the zombies, since I still miss some shots. Miss a few shots. I'm a sword player, so I play residual devil using only the knife. With the time it's taking me to kill the zombies, I might need almost 7 hours to complete the chapter. I'm also a sword user. How about we have a contest only with sword users? We can make a rule that it is forbidden to use ranged weapons, so to participate in the competition you can only use a knife throughout the game. What a cool idea. Since we are rank F, we can have a competition for rank F players only. This idea sounds cool, even though I'm rank E, maybe I can organize a competition for my rank E player friends too, just using a knife, that sounds like so much fun. Who knew games that games developers make could be so much fun? Yes. I wouldn't believe it either if anyone had told me before. People in other cities will probably die of envy when they find out that we can play residual devil and they can't haha. Oh def lol. With the development of speedruns, residual devil's popularity started to explode even more. Since this was something very recent, players still didn't have much a sense of how to classify this very well. The other games were always just focused on increasing strength, and that was very boring and repetitive, so players just considered the games as a means to train, but now that Residual Devil had presented these different difficulties, everything had become much more fun. Even players who were starting to play the game in casual mode felt that they should improve as soon as possible to participate in speedruns in, insane, mode, which indirectly was a way to encourage players to improve, which in the long run would greatly improve the power of Sandstone Bay. But when Gabe woke up and found that there were players developing speedruns to play Residual Devil, he thought it would be interesting to also add an option that would time players while they were playing, something that would only work in, insane, mode, to encourage improvement of players and further increase the game's performance with the attention it was getting. When he looked at the amount of players and mana the game yielded, Gabe was shocked. Residual Devil. Village. Downloads. 8,718. Average play time. 2.9 hours. Accumulated mana. 25,282. Available for withdrawal. $4,191. Mana available. 22,646. 2,636 units of mana spent. The game received over a thousand downloads just while I was sleeping. Gabe was shocked as he looked at the data on his cell phone. Another thing that left him shocked was that although the amount of downloads had increased, the average playing time had also increased, that is, the players who were playing increased the average so much that despite more than a thousand people downloading the game and playing for a short time the average still increased. Chapter 02 will be available in 19 hours. But despite being excited, when Gabe saw that he had promised to release Chapter 02 the next day, he quickly woke up, cooked another delicious meal and went back to developing the game. In the next few hours, his focus would be to finish developing Chapter 02 so he could make players who had already completed the game play again, earn more mana for him, and further increase the game's word of mouth. Considering the amount of Sandstone Bay's rank F players, Gabe knew he was already reaching the download limit of the people in the city, but that didn't mean he couldn't attract other players, especially rank E players, to try the game, thus still yielding more mana for him in the future. With the development of new chapters I can practically guarantee the attention of all rank F players in the city, and thus be able to become a rank E developer quickly, Gabe was thinking, as he built the new terrain of the game. When I finish developing chapter 02, all the remaining mana that is available I will absorb. I want to see if this will make any difference for me. 18 18 25,000 units of mana spent in one day. With Residual Devil going viral, not only were players surprised by how interesting it was, but people from the army and city government had their eyes on this new game. Initially the government only found out about this game made by a student at Harrington University when some worried mothers started calling, wanting the government to help their children, but they had only communicated their intention to talk to the university to solve this problem, and the university had already made a solution and implemented it. They didn't even have time to talk about how to resolve the issue and the issue had been resolved. Now, getting the calls from mothers grateful for the change in attitude their children had, the people in government didn't even know how to respond. 
Saying something like, you're welcome, would have been too shameless, as they hadn't done anything, but saying they didn't do anything would also demonstrate their incompetence, which they definitely wouldn't want, so the only answer they could give was that they would forward their thanks to those responsible, although they had no idea who was responsible, only having a vague idea that it was the university. Not only did people answering the calls of worried mothers learn about this game, but people in the city administration also found out about it. So since this game was released, the success rate of missions is going up considerably. Tyler Wilson, the current manager of Sandstone Bay asked with a raised eyebrow as he watched a girl playing residual devil on television. Wilson's secretary, who was off to the side with a tablet in her hand, responded, yes, Mr. Wilson. Apparently this game was made by a developer at Harrington University with the pseudonym Electronic Arts, or EA for short. This developer named EA developed this game a week ago and it has already been played by around 70% of Rank F players in the city, making it one of the biggest practice games in Sandstone Bay, although even Rank E players are trying this game out and playing it for fun. Wilson listened to the entire report and looked at the scene where Chris killed the player's spouse in the livestream before leaving the house with the player's daughter in his arms and raised his eyebrow. Even the story of this game sounds interesting. Has anyone else shown interest in this game? Ashley, Wilson's secretary, responded quickly. Yes sir. Sandstone Television reached out to us to try to get in contact with Harrington University so that they could broadcast this game as a television show with actors who are also players, playing in the shoes of a player as if it were a movie, as according to them, the story of this game is more interesting than any series they've ever done. This made Wilson raise his eyebrow even more, feeling that this was more surprising than the game being able to garner so many players. Anybody else? Ashley was quick to continue. Yes, even the army is already using Residual Devil as a training model for soldiers, especially for rank F player soldiers who use guns and knives as their method of battle. Wilson was quite pleased with this report. Despite Harrington University being the best university of developers among neighboring cities, the amount of truly talented developers that emerged each year was very low, and it was known that a talented developer was capable of turning a small town into a large mid-sized city from the background just with the improvement that players would get from experiencing the games a developer like that made. But Sandstone Bay wasn't able to produce a genius like that a few decades ago, and the last genius they had produced was stolen by another city, which caused them to be ridiculed by several other neighboring cities. This time, hearing that such a powerful genius had arisen in Sandstone Bay, Wilson, who was the city manager, would not let the same misfortune happen again. Of course, he couldn't force the developer to stay in town, but he was certain that if he showed enough sincerity and plenty of resources, this developer would hardly leave town. Ashley, try to find out the identity of this developer. I want to know every detail about him, especially if he has a civil origin, as maybe with that it would be easier to seduce him with enough resources, Wilson ordered. Yes sir. Ashley understood the seriousness of this and quickly left the office, leaving Wilson alone as he watched the livestream thoughtfully. Wilson was thinking about what kind of benefits he could offer to this developer, since if he managed to convince this EA to remain a Sandstone Bay developer, he would surely be praised by the superiors. Wilson was not the only person interested in this mysterious EA, who had appeared in such a short time and had already become one of the main developers in the city, as officials from other cities who were in Sandstone Bay had reported news of them back to their cities so that their cities could also try to convince this promising young man to become their own developer. Especially considering that Sandstone Bay in the past let a genius developer be stolen by another small town, and that town was already a medium-sized city today, it was undeniable that a large part of the reason for that city's success was the games that that genius developer had made for them. Meanwhile, as the rulers of several cities became aware of him, Gabe had just finished developing Residual Devil Chapter 02 and scheduled the release of that chapter for the agreed time for players. Just as he had imagined, he spent a total of 6,000 mana units to develop Chapter 02, both due to the relevant characters that appeared in it, as well as having to tackle other difficulties presented by these characters that he created. He was again able to offset some of the cost due to the simulation system he had, so instead of having to try and make a powerful character like Carl Heisenberg by trial and error, spending thousands of mana units in the process as other developers normally would do, Gabe only needed to spend the amount of mana needed to simulate them and the character was ready in just one try. But while he spent more mana units this time to develop this chapter's enemies, the time to make the chapter didn't necessarily increase all that much, only taking another 3 to 4 hours than the previous ones to complete everything. In those hours Residual Devil received even more downloads and the average playing time went up even more. Residual Devil. Village. Downloads. 9.019. Average play time. 3.3 hours. Accumulated mana. 29,762. Available for withdrawal. $5,095.
Mana available, 21,126, 8,636 units of mana spent. Looking at the amount of available mana that had dropped by so little despite him spending 6,000 mana units, Gabe was quite proud. With that amount of mana available, I can spend 20,000 mana units without much worry and absorb them all completely. Gabe said excitedly as he sat down in a comfortable position on his bed. If I absorb 20,000 mana units, there will still be 1,126 left in the game so I can still do any updates in case I need to after Chapter 02 is released. With his mind at ease, Gabe began to think about the knowledge he received at the university and remembered how the professor taught them how to absorb mana from a seed. First I have to transform the game's mana into an ethereal form, like a smoke cloud of mana inside the seed. Then, I must control this mana to enter my body, as an inverse the feeling I have when I use my own mana to learn the skills of the game, so for every 100 units of mana I extract from the game, I can get one unit of mana in my body as total mana, Gabe thought about the explanation the professor had given and started to carry out this process slowly, without any hurry. As it was his first time doing this, Gabe was a little confused as to how he should do it, and the process was quite slow, but as time went on, Gabe got more and more used to it to the point that he only needed one minute to absorb 100 units of mana from the game. So, in just over three hours Gabe had achieved it. The 20,000 mana units in the game converted to 200 total mana units in his body, increasing the personal mana he controlled to an amazing 300 mana units. I already have 300 mana units, Gabe said excitedly as he felt the power course through his body, which, for the time being, didn't have much use other than learning skills from the games he developed. But that would soon change when he learned the first one containing magical power. If other developers found out that Gabe had spent a total of 25,000 mana units just today, something that would be around 25% of the total required to become a rank E developer, they would probably have puked blood and rage. While other students were posting in group forums that they were happy to absorb a few hundred mana units that their game yielded, Gabe was already being extravagant and absorbing 25,000 mana units. But even though that mana in his body wasn't of much use right now, Gabe felt that his body was reacting in a very abnormal way. So what were the health benefits to mana that the professor talked about, again? Gabe wondered in surprise. Dash 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 dash. During classes, his teacher, who was a rank D developer, answered a question that a female student had asked. Professor, why do the high rank developers have bodies as beautiful as Professor Parker's? The girl asked curiously, all the high ranking developers have such beautiful bodies, and even old professors like you have such fit bodies. Initially the teacher was quite proud that this 20-year-old girl was praising his body, but when he heard her saying that he was old, the teacher felt an arrow penetrating his chest. On the tip of the arrow there was the word, old, hanging by a thread. But pretending that her words didn't affect him, the professor answered, this is because of mana nourishment. While E-rank players have a minimum of 2 mana units and a maximum of 10 mana units, that mana doesn't have as much effect on their body. For that reason it's not as noticeable. But for us developers, we have a much higher amount of mana than the players. The mana in our body is so high that it starts to nourish our muscles, making the muscles work even harder, thus consuming much of the useless fat and leaving only the good fat in our body so that the mana can circulate in a more efficient way. When you absorb mana from a game you develop, you will also feel this change in your body. If you become an even higher rank developer, maybe you'll reach a level where your body doesn't even need food, just the mana you have will be enough to sustain you for days, or even months. Whoa. The students were shocked to hear this explanation, including former Gabe. Dash 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 dash. Remembering that explanation, Gabe understood that this was actually the mana nourishment that the professor spoke of, where the mana in Gabe's body was nourishing the muscles and stimulating their development. So does that mean I won't need to exercise for my muscles to develop in the future? That's awesome, haha. Gabe chuckled to himself, pleased that he had decided to increase his total mana. 1919 release of chapter 02. Not only was Gabe shocked by the explosion in popularity that Resident Evil was having, Amora was shocked as soon as she returned from her mission. Fortunately, because of the training she had in Resident Evil and her first mission as an E-rank was one where she had to deal with zombies, it went perfectly. Even in decisive moments where some of the players had some trouble dealing with the zombies that appeared out of nowhere, she still managed to land fairly accurate shots that managed to save others from injury. Of course, since she was only using regular weapons, most of the zombies she focused on were F-rank monsters, leaving E-rank monsters for other players to deal with. In this way, her skills had the most utility in this mission, as the other players could focus on the E-rank monsters since she was covering them by dealing with the F-rank monsters very easily.
When she got back home and saw the, insane, difficulty, thinking about how fun this game was, and the $1,000 she received for today's quest, the thought that she had to go out to have a delicious meal disappeared and she rushed to the her room as she turned on her computer and prepared to start a live stream to experience this. Despite knowing that using firearms was something that would limit her in the future if she didn't buy a magic weapon, Amora still really liked the feeling of holding a weapon in her hand and didn't want to give up that kind of equipment, even if she had to spend much more money than if she were to use a bow like other players. A ranky magic pistol costs approximately $50,000, Amora thought as she looked at the weapon's price list while the livestream program was loading her settings. After buying a magic pistol, she could use it to deal with rank E monsters, and keep using ordinary weapons to deal with rank F monsters, so her utility and quests would practically go up several times. But on the other hand, the time she would have to keep doing rank E missions just to be able to buy such a powerful weapon would be too long. Considering rank E players normally did a quest every two or three days, even if she did a quest a day and didn't spend money on anything else, just with quest money she would still have to wait 50 days to be able to buy this, what was a long time for her, who intended to become a powerful player. Is there any other way to get more powerful weapons without relying on magic weapons? Amora asked herself a little uncertainly. Little did she know that a solution to her problems would emerge in Chapter 02 of Resident Evil. So this young developer EA is a civilian boy. Wilson was quite surprised. He guessed that this kid was probably some rich young man with relatives who were already big developers who had taught him such an innovative technique like this to pave his way in the future, but who would say that this kid didn't have any developer relatives. Looking at his information, Wilson raised his eyebrows. Gabe Howard, developer rank F, student at Harrington University. Father, Edward Howard, civilian, accountant at Sandstone Bank. Mother, Elise Howard, civilian, teacher at Sandstone Primary School 03. Grandparents, ordinary civilians, both deceased. Gabe Howard's information sheet, or as Wilson knew it, EA, was much simpler than he imagined. Considering this boy's talent for developing monsters and his creativity to develop such an interesting game model, it was hard to believe that this boy didn't even have contact with other developers during his life, besides his university professors. Ashley, contact Selena and ask her to set up a meeting with the developer EA. Wilson quickly made up his mind. If before he still had a little fear with EA, thinking that maybe he had some powerful master who taught him, now all fear is gone. The only thing he could think of was that this kid was probably the best f rank talent that Sandstone Bay had ever created, far greater than the other genius developer that had emerged 30 years ago, so to prevent the tragedy of 30 years ago if it happened again, Wilson intended to meet with Howard as soon as possible so he could win this boy over. Seeing how Howard had created such a simplistic Resident Evil monetization system, and considering his parents' background, it was clear that this kid currently didn't have a lot of money and just a few thousand dollars was enough for him to live a comfortable life. But developer's life wasn't as cheap as Howard was now experiencing as an F rank, Wilson was also a developer, a peak rank C developer just like Selena, the headmistress of Harrington University. So he knew very well how high spending was for developers as they tried to become great. Not only did it take a lot of money to buy a seed, but also other resources, knowledge, everything was very expensive on the road to becoming a high rank developer. It could be said that just at rank F a developer would be relatively unconcerned with money, as he would only need around $20,000 to buy other rank F seeds, but when it comes to rank E seeds, that price would be multiplied several times, making more and more clear the importance of money for young developers. So, looking at the young developer's investment fund, Wilson decided he was going to take a chance. He intended to set aside a large part of that money just to invest in Howard, and the next day request more money to invest in the other developers, if he could get that money from his superiors, it would be great for the other less talented developers, but if he couldn't, that would just be a shame, as his priority was this talented young man, and discarding some mediocre talent wouldn't hurt Sandstone Bay in exchange for the talented EA. Ashley, too, understood the urgency of the situation and hurried to her desk as she started making some calls to get in touch with Selena, the principal of Harrington University. Gabe had no idea this was happening, currently his only concern was seeing how players would react to Chapter 02 that was about to be released. Seeing the countdown on the screen, Gabe soon opened Amora's live stream, which was the streamer he was most used to watching, and started reading the players' comments. Holy crap Amora, your game level is much better than the last live stream, what happened? Yes, even at the, insane, level Amora is playing much better than last time. It's like she's playing at the casual level. Amora saw these comments and gave a small proud smile. Hey people, I didn't break any news to you, but I recently did my first ranky mission and successfully passed it. Now I'm officially a ranky player. She explained with a smug expression, which the players felt was really cute. Whoa, Parabens Amora. 
Congratulations. Holy crap, even though you've just become a ranky player, you're playing like the veteran ranky players. Yes, there is a player ranky that I watch playing that isn't even as good as you. Reading this, Amora didn't get really cocky and quickly explained. Guys, this is a bit understandable, as not all players are focused on using firearms like I am, so many times, a ranky player who is a shield user will not have as much skill as me when playing with a weapon, but with their experience in ranky missions and since they have more mana than me, they can play longer and as time goes by maybe their skill will go up faster than mine, since I only have 2, 1 units of mana. Listening to Amora's explanation, viewers soon understood and stopped making comparisons. Are you excited to play Chapter 02? This will be released in a few minutes. Yes, I'm really excited. If only Chapter 01 was already so interesting, I imagine the story of Chapter 02 will be even better. She said excited, even though having played Resident Evil for so long the speed that she improves her aim has dropped a little, but this improvement is still very high, to the point that she is confident that in a few months she can reach Ranky Peak because of her talent. Other players with average talent didn't have as much improvement as she still had after playing for so long because maybe their talent wasn't focused on using firearms, but she who already had a high talent with that type of weapon since she used it this the first time, the improvement was still very great. Look, there are less than 5 minutes left for Chapter 02 to be released, get ready. Yes Amora, please get ready to play, I can't wait to see how the game's story unfolds. Finally, we'll be able to see what it's like inside the game's castle. I wonder what's inside the castle. This mystery looks very interesting. I think that inside the castle there will be more powerful monsters. Do you remember the game trailer? In that video it seemed that there were other monsters, like that man who controlled metal, although I don't know if he is a monster or a human with powers that can help us, even a giant woman who seemed quite powerful. Maybe when we get inside, we'll finally meet these monsters. Amora said excitedly. I think as soon as you enter you must have to kill one of those powerful monsters, maybe that man who controls metal is a human infiltrated there to kill the monsters too. Yes, after all, monsters are all evil, it's impossible for humans to ally with monsters to try to harm players, right? I think so, I've only heard of intelligent monsters that were at rank D, so maybe those monsters in the trailer are dumb and that human is fooling them all. I once saw a D rank player playing a game where he had to shoot with a bow at various monsters that appeared, one of the monsters was called a vampire, that monster was quite intelligent. Vampire. Damn, that looks cool, too bad this is a rank F game, the monsters are unlikely to be that smart, maybe those monsters we saw in the trailer aren't even real, right? After all, EA is only an F rank developer, it's impossible that he can make such smart monsters even if he is so talented. Reading these comments, Amora felt that this made sense. The difficulty of making powerful monsters was very high, even greater was the difficulty of making intelligent monsters, so much so that not even ranky games had intelligent monsters for the player to kill. At one point she even thought like these players that the monsters in the trailer were fake, as a developer rank F theoretically shouldn't be able to make an intelligent monster, but when she thought about how many miracles Electronic Arts had performed so far, there was a small feeling in her heart that maybe he could work another miracle. Hey guys, what if by some miracle EA manages to make a smart monster? Amora commented with a bit of uncertainty. But unlike what she imagined, where the comments would be people ridiculing her for such a stupid thought, the chat actually went quiet. Perhaps viewers were also considering that for the EA that did so many amazing things, this was not impossible as they were imagining. 1919 Release of Chapter 02 Not only was Gabe shocked by the explosion in popularity that Resident Evil was having, Amora was shocked as soon as she returned from her mission. Fortunately, because of the training she had in Resident Evil and her first mission as an E-rank was one where she had to deal with zombies, it went perfectly. Even in decisive moments where some of the players had some trouble dealing with the zombies that appeared out of nowhere, she still managed to land fairly accurate shots that managed to save others from injury. Of course, since she was only using regular weapons, most of the zombies she focused on were F-rank monsters, leaving E-rank monsters for other players to deal with. In this way, her skills had the most utility in this mission, as the other players could focus on the E-rank monsters since she was covering them by dealing with the F-rank monsters very easily. When she got back home and saw the, insane, difficulty, thinking about how fun this game was, and the $1,000 she received for today's quest, the thought that she had to go out to have a delicious meal disappeared and she rushed to the her room as she turned on her computer and prepared to start a live stream to experience this. Despite knowing that using firearms was something that would limit her in the future if she didn't buy a magic weapon, Amora still really liked the feeling of holding a weapon in her hand and didn't want to give up that kind of equipment, even if she had to spend much more money than if she were to use a bow like other players.
A ranky magic pistol costs approximately $50,000, Amora thought as she looked at the weapon's price list while the livestream program was loading her settings. After buying a magic pistol, she could use it to deal with rank E monsters, and keep using ordinary weapons to deal with rank F monsters, so her utility and quests would practically go up several times. But on the other hand, the time she would have to keep doing rank E missions just to be able to buy such a powerful weapon would be too long. Considering rank E players normally did a quest every two or three days, even if she did a quest a day and didn't spend money on anything else, just with quest money she would still have to wait 50 days to be able to buy this, what was a long time for her, who intended to become a powerful player. Is there any other way to get more powerful weapons without relying on magic weapons? Amora asked herself a little uncertainly. Little did she know that a solution to her problems would emerge in Chapter 02 of Resident Evil. So this young developer EA is a civilian boy. Wilson was quite surprised. He guessed that this kid was probably some rich young man with relatives who were already big developers who had taught him such an innovative technique like this to pave his way in the future, but who would say that this kid didn't have any developer relatives. Looking at his information, Wilson raised his eyebrows. Gabe Howard, developer rank F, student at Harrington University. Father, Edward Howard, civilian, accountant at Sandstone Bank. Mother, Elise Howard, civilian, teacher at Sandstone Primary School 03. Grandparents, ordinary civilians, both deceased. Gabe Howard's information sheet, or as Wilson knew it, EA, was much simpler than he imagined. Considering this boy's talent for developing monsters and his creativity to develop such an interesting game model, it was hard to believe that this boy didn't even have contact with other developers during his life, besides his university professors. Ashley, contact Selena and ask her to set up a meeting with the developer EA. Wilson quickly made up his mind. If before he still had a little fear with EA, thinking that maybe he had some powerful master who taught him, now all fear is gone. The only thing he could think of was that this kid was probably the best f rank talent that Sandstone Bay had ever created, far greater than the other genius developer that had emerged 30 years ago, so to prevent the tragedy of 30 years ago if it happened again, Wilson intended to meet with Howard as soon as possible so he could win this boy over. Seeing how Howard had created such a simplistic Resident Evil monetization system, and considering his parents' background, it was clear that this kid currently didn't have a lot of money and just a few thousand dollars was enough for him to live a comfortable life. But developer's life wasn't as cheap as Howard was now experiencing as an F rank, Wilson was also a developer, a peak rank C developer just like Selena, the headmistress of Harrington University. So he knew very well how high spending was for developers as they tried to become great. Not only did it take a lot of money to buy a seed, but also other resources, knowledge, everything was very expensive on the road to becoming a high rank developer. It could be said that just at rank F a developer would be relatively unconcerned with money, as he would only need around $20,000 to buy other rank F seeds, but when it comes to rank E seeds, that price would be multiplied several times, making more and more clear the importance of money for young developers. So, looking at the young developer's investment fund, Wilson decided he was going to take a chance. He intended to set aside a large part of that money just to invest in Howard, and the next day request more money to invest in the other developers, if he could get that money from his superiors, it would be great for the other less talented developers, but if he couldn't, that would just be a shame, as his priority was this talented young man, and discarding some mediocre talent wouldn't hurt Sandstone Bay in exchange for the talented EA. Ashley, too, understood the urgency of the situation and hurried to her desk as she started making some calls to get in touch with Selena, the principal of Harrington University. Gabe had no idea this was happening, currently his only concern was seeing how players would react to Chapter 02 that was about to be released. Seeing the countdown on the screen, Gabe soon opened Amora's live stream, which was the streamer he was most used to watching, and started reading the players' comments. Holy crap Amora, your game level is much better than the last live stream, what happened? Yes, even at the, insane, level Amora is playing much better than last time. It's like she's playing at the casual level. Amora saw these comments and gave a small proud smile. Hey people, I didn't break any news to you, but I recently did my first ranky mission and successfully passed it. Now I'm officially a ranky player. She explained with a smug expression, which the players felt was really cute. Whoa, Parabens Amora. Congratulations. Holy crap, even though you've just become a ranky player, you're playing like the veteran ranky players. Yes, there is a player ranky that I watch playing that isn't even as good as you. Reading this, Amora didn't get really cocky and quickly explained. 
Guys, this is a bit understandable, as not all players are focused on using firearms like I am, so many times, a ranky player who is a shield user will not have as much skill as me when playing with a weapon, but with their experience in ranky missions and since they have more mana than me, they can play longer and as time goes by maybe their skill will go up faster than mine, since I only have 2, 1 units of mana. Listening to Amora's explanation, viewers soon understood and stopped making comparisons. Are you excited to play Chapter 02? This will be released in a few minutes. Yes, I'm really excited. If only Chapter 01 was already so interesting, I imagine the story of Chapter 02 will be even better. She said excited, even though having played Resident Evil for so long the speed that she improves her aim has dropped a little, but this improvement is still very high, to the point that she is confident that in a few months she can reach Ranky Peak because of her talent. Other players with average talent didn't have as much improvement as she still had after playing for so long because maybe their talent wasn't focused on using firearms, but she who already had a high talent with that type of weapon since she used it this the first time, the improvement was still very great. Look, there are less than 5 minutes left for Chapter 02 to be released, get ready. Yes Amora, please get ready to play, I can't wait to see how the game's story unfolds. Finally, we'll be able to see what it's like inside the game's castle. I wonder what's inside the castle. This mystery looks very interesting. I think that inside the castle there will be more powerful monsters. Do you remember the game trailer? In that video it seemed that there were other monsters, like that man who controlled metal, although I don't know if he is a monster or a human with powers that can help us, even a giant woman who seemed quite powerful. Maybe when we get inside, we'll finally meet these monsters. Amora said excitedly. I think as soon as you enter you must have to kill one of those powerful monsters, maybe that man who controls metal is a human infiltrated there to kill the monsters too. Yes, after all, monsters are all evil, it's impossible for humans to ally with monsters to try to harm players, right? I think so, I've only heard of intelligent monsters that were at rank D, so maybe those monsters in the trailer are dumb and that human is fooling them all. I once saw a D rank player playing a game where he had to shoot with a bow at various monsters that appeared, one of the monsters was called a vampire, that monster was quite intelligent. Vampire. Damn, that looks cool, too bad this is a rank F game, the monsters are unlikely to be that smart, maybe those monsters we saw in the trailer aren't even real, right? After all, EA is only an F rank developer, it's impossible that he can make such smart monsters even if he is so talented. Reading these comments, Amora felt that this made sense. The difficulty of making powerful monsters was very high, even greater was the difficulty of making intelligent monsters, so much so that not even ranky games had intelligent monsters for the player to kill. At one point she even thought like these players that the monsters in the trailer were fake, as a developer rank F theoretically shouldn't be able to make an intelligent monster, but when she thought about how many miracles Electronic Arts had performed so far, there was a small feeling in her heart that maybe he could work another miracle. Hey guys, what if by some miracle EA manages to make a smart monster? Amora commented with a bit of uncertainty. But unlike what she imagined, where the comments would be people ridiculing her for such a stupid thought, the chat actually went quiet. Perhaps viewers were also considering that for the EA that did so many amazing things, this was not impossible as they were imagining. Nunu note. Mass release target XD. Based on weekly Power Stone rankings. Top 30 equals 1 bonus chapter. Top 20 equals 2 bonus chapter. Top 10 equals 3 bonus chapter. Top 5 equals. Bonus chapter. Bonus chapters will be released on Sunday, based on preceding performance of the novel. Don't forget to vote for more chapters. Current rank. 7. We are gonna reach top 6 today. 2020 fear. Finally, the countdown to the release of Residual Devil Chapter 02 had come to an end. Streamers and players across Sandstone Bay were excited as they clicked to download the second chapter, a feeling of jubilation many had never felt in their lives. Waiting for a new game from a famous developer to be released was something many had experienced, especially ranky players, but waiting for a game to release a new update was something they had never experienced. Usually players would just discover one game, play it for a few days until the training efficiency of it diminished to the point where it was no longer useful, and then move on to play another game that had more new stuff. But strangely, for most of them, even if they played Residual Devil for several hours, the amount of improvement they received from training in that game was still relatively good, especially for the more fearful players. And on top of that, the game had something they had never experienced before, a very fun story. So, for the first time for many players, even though the game didn't have such a huge improvement for them, they were still very excited to keep playing and find out what was going to happen next. Amora had just downloaded Chapter 02 and logged into the game again. Well done everyone.
I'll try to complete the beginning part again as soon as possible, so maybe we can experience a bit of Chapter 02 history later today. Amora said excitedly as she looked at the game's loading screen. But to her surprise, instead of being redirected to the screen where she would have to start over, as she imagined, the game had saved her last attempt in casual mode where she had left off at the end of Chapter 01, but beside it was a message. Chapter 02 added. This made her a little confused. She thought that she would have to start playing the casual game again until she reached the end of Chapter 01, as well as have to play the game's prologue and then play the demo content again, as she understood that developers needed mana from the players to get stronger. But to her surprise, EA apparently was a very conscientious and magnanimous developer and had actually added Chapter 02 directly to the game she had played right where she left off at the end of Chapter 01, where she could continue playing without having to spend several more hours playing until she reached it. Won't EA receive less mana because of this? Amora thought, a little worried. Not quite sure how to decide what to do next, Amora decided to ask the viewers. Guys, it looks like EA didn't require me to play Chapter 01 again to get to Chapter 02 and I can continue playing through my previous game to find out the story of Chapter 02. What do you think I should do? Continue playing in my casual mode game or continue with the, insane, mode game I had played for a few minutes to try this out on hard mode? She asked. Whoa, I thought everyone would have to play Chapter 01 again to get to Chapter 02, since that way EA would get more mana, but he let us play that directly. Hey, I even feel bad for EA, I think even though I'm curious I'll start playing over again to give him more mana. Amora, don't wait, first find out how the story works in casual mode, then play in, insane, mode from the beginning and experience everything in a more difficult way, that way you can both experience the new story directly, as well as help EA giving him even more mana as a thank you. Yes, I love the idea of the previous comment. I think I will also do as this person said. Thankfully, as I'm a rank E player with a lot of mana, I already finished Chapter 01 in, insane, mode, so I can experience Chapter 02 in, insane, mode directly hee <laughs> hee. So jealous. I'm also jealous. When players who were doing speedruns saw that they could use the game they had completed in, insane, mode directly to play Chapter 02, they were very happy, as many ranky players already had more than 5 mana units, which meant that they could play at least 5 hours without stopping, and if they stopped to meditate, they could still play a few more hours. So, many of the ranky players had already finished the game in, insane, mode and still had mana to play for a few more hours in Chapter 02. But despite having completed Chapter 02 in, Insane, Mode, many players decided that they would play this new chapter first in, Casual, Mode, as they were afraid that if they died because they didn't know the enemies they would face and would have to start all over again. Seeing that viewers in the chat were recommending that she play the game in Casual Mode anyway, Amora decided that after completing Chapter 02 in Casual Mode she would play through it all again in, Insane, Mode to encourage EA to continue developing the game. Clicking to start, Amora found herself again in front of a bridge, the bridge that would take her to the castle. Without thinking twice, Amora started walking across the bridge and entered the castle. The first place she passed was a corridor lit by a few torches. This corridor was quite narrow, something that made her a little uncomfortable for a few seconds of walking until she finally arrived in a room. This room looked something like a storeroom, filled with sacks of grain and a few barrels of liquor, which the people of the castle would probably have stored to eat. So there really are humans in the castle, since monsters aren't supposed to eat that kind of stuff, right? Amora commented as she looked around, but those things could have been left by the humans who lived here before the monsters invaded and took over. Looking around, she saw a door, but unfortunately that door was locked. Maybe it has a key, she deduced, and turned to look for the key. But Amora's heart froze when she saw a man walking towards her. This is the man who appears to be human and lives in the castle. Amora said excitedly to the viewers, so that the man could not hear what she said. Well, I didn't think there was anyone left, the man said as he walked towards her. Amora was surprised by what the man said, imagining that the man was happy to have seen another human alive. But something shocked her. All of the metal pieces that were scattered on the floor began to levitate around the man as he walked towards her. You must be pretty strong, huh? The man asked. Who are you? Amora asked the confusing man. Ah, so you're not from around here. The man lifted his head and looked into her eyes. Even better. When the man finished saying that, he raised his left hand and pointed it at her. Player instincts from Amora, who had dealt with several ranky monsters in the last mission, made her feel that something was wrong as she tried to raise her weapon, but before she could react, an iron rod flew towards her and penetrated with ease straight through her abdomen, making Amora's heart race. What is happening? She tried to grasp the spear that had been stuck in her belly. 
She pulled on it desperately, but more pieces of metal started flying towards her and sticking all over her body as she knelt down in pain and despair. Mother Miranda will love you, ha ha. The man said, laughing as he stood very close to Amora. Amora was getting very desperate. This was the first time she had been in such a desperate situation since she started playing Residual Devil. The only situations close to this were when Chris killed her husband and she couldn't do anything, or when she was surrounded by monsters in the city for the first time and had to flee. Finally the last piece of metal stuck to her, but to her shock, it hit her hard on the head, making her head go dizzy and knocked her character out. Amora didn't know what to make of her black vision. I died. She wondered, uncertainly. Whoa, WTF, how would that be possible to survive this man? Wasn't that man supposed to help the players? How did he become a villain all of a sudden? Guys, haven't you noticed that this man is controlling metal? EA is only an F-rank developer, how was he able to create a monster that controls metal? Damn, I hadn't thought of that. Good thing you're not playing on, insane, difficulty, Amora, otherwise it would be game over, haha. Did you do something wrong? Amora was still confused by what happened, until the scene in front of her started to change, with some pieces of metal falling around, but she soon felt that something was strange. Feeling pain in her wrist and stomach, Amora realized that she was bound by the wrist and being dragged away by the man she thought had killed her. Fudge, Amora moaned a little from the pain she was feeling. Even if this was just a game, she still felt some of the pain the character was feeling, so that everything was as real as possible for the players and that they got used to it for missions, but this was the first time she felt it would be great to be able to turn off the pain option. Worried about where the man was taking her, Amora tried to lift her head, but the man just turned back and said to her while still carrying her body. Stop crying. We're almost there. Hearing the man's mocking tone, Amora felt very angry with him, who she initially thought was an ally, but she had another feeling, fear. She was afraid of the place the man was taking her. But her body was very weak. Without her noticing it, Amora fell unconscious again, only waking up to the sound of a female voice speaking near her. That woman is good for nothing, and my daughters happen to love to entertain outsiders. Furthermore I warrant that if we entrust this woman to house Dimitrescu, my daughters and I would privilege the vials of her sacrificed blood. Confused and scared, Amora opened her eyes to understand what was going on, but to her shock, there was a macabre doll pacing back and forth as she looked at her. As she slowly stood up, a strange hunchback monster with a disfigured body and face came very close to her and started sniffing her body, making Amora even more scared and uncomfortable. Get out of the way ugly thing. I want to see. To Amora's surprise, the doll started screaming at the deformed monster that was smelling her, scaring the monster away from her, something she didn't know whether to be grateful for or even more scared by. She woke up. The doll was euphoric as it jumped back and forth with an annoying voice. Shut up. A man shouted angrily. You'll fuck with her on the sly. Where's the fun in that? Hearing this, Amora's heart froze. For a second she even thought if she should turn off the game and stop playing it, since if that really happened she definitely wouldn't want to continue playing. But thinking about EA, who had made such an interesting story so far, Amora decided to give him a vote of confidence and continue trying the game, hoping that something as terrible as that really wasn't going to happen. But without her realizing it, the fear she was feeling in those last few minutes of Chapter 02 was already greater than several hours when she had been playing Chapter 01, and it was greatly affecting her learning speed in this game. 2020 Fear Finally, the countdown to the release of Residual Devil Chapter 02 had come to an end. Streamers and players across Sandstone Bay were excited as they clicked to download the second chapter, a feeling of jubilation many had never felt in their lives. Waiting for a new game from a famous developer to be released was something many had experienced, especially ranky players, but waiting for a game to release a new update was something they had never experienced. Usually players would just discover one game, play it for a few days until the training efficiency of it diminished to the point where it was no longer useful, and then move on to play another game that had more new stuff. But strangely, for most of them, even if they played Residual Devil for several hours, the amount of improvement they received from training in that game was still relatively good, especially for the more fearful players. And on top of that, the game had something they had never experienced before, a very fun story. So, for the first time for many players, even though the game didn't have such a huge improvement for them, they were still very excited to keep playing and find out what was going to happen next. Amora had just downloaded Chapter 02 and logged into the game again. Well done everyone. I'll try to complete the beginning part again as soon as possible, so maybe we can experience a bit of Chapter 02 history later today. Amora said excitedly as she looked at the game's loading screen.
But to her surprise, instead of being redirected to the screen where she would have to start over, as she imagined, the game had saved her last attempt in casual mode where she had left off at the end of chapter 01, but beside it was a message. Chapter 02 added. This made her a little confused. She thought that she would have to start playing the casual game again until she reached the end of chapter 01, as well as have to play the game's prologue and then play the demo content again, as she understood that developers needed mana from the players to get stronger. But to her surprise, EA apparently was a very conscientious and magnanimous developer and had actually added chapter 02 directly to the game she had played right where she left off at the end of chapter 01, where she could continue playing without having to spend several more hours playing until she reached it. Won't EA receive less mana because of this? Amora thought, a little worried. Not quite sure how to decide what to do next, Amora decided to ask the viewers. Guys, it looks like EA didn't require me to play Chapter 01 again to get to Chapter 02 and I can continue playing through my previous game to find out the story of Chapter 02. What do you think I should do? Continue playing in my casual mode game or continue with the, insane, mode game I had played for a few minutes to try this out on hard mode? She asked. Whoa, I thought everyone would have to play Chapter 01 again to get to Chapter 02, since that way EA would get more mana, but he let us play that directly. Hey, I even feel bad for EA, I think even though I'm curious I'll start playing over again to give him more mana. Amora, don't wait, first find out how the story works in casual mode, then play in, insane, mode from the beginning and experience everything in a more difficult way, that way you can both experience the new story directly, as well as help EA giving him even more mana as a thank you. Yes, I love the idea of the previous comment. I think I will also do as this person said. Thankfully, as I'm a ranky player with a lot of mana, I already finished chapter 01 in, insane, mode, so I can experience chapter 02 in, insane, mode directly hehe. He. So jealous. I'm also jealous. When players who were doing speedruns saw that they could use the game they had completed in, insane, mode directly to play chapter 02, they were very happy, as many ranky players already had more than 5 mana units, which meant that they could play at least 5 hours without stopping, and if they stopped to meditate, they could still play a few more hours. So, many of the ranky players had already finished the game in, insane, mode and still had mana to play for a few more hours in chapter 02. But despite having completed chapter 02 in, insane, mode, many players decided that they would play this new chapter first in, casual, mode, as they were afraid that if they died because they didn't know the enemies they would face and would have to start all over again. Seeing that viewers in the chat were recommending that she play the game in casual mode anyway, Amora decided that after completing chapter 02 in casual mode she would play through it all again in, insane, mode to encourage EA to continue developing the game. Clicking to start, Amora found herself again in front of a bridge, the bridge that would take her to the castle. Without thinking twice, Amora started walking across the bridge and entered the castle. The first place she passed was a corridor lit by a few torches. This corridor was quite narrow, something that made her a little uncomfortable for a few seconds of walking until she finally arrived in a room. This room looked something like a storeroom, filled with sacks of grain and a few barrels of liquor, which the people of the castle would probably have stored to eat. So there really are humans in the castle, since monsters aren't supposed to eat that kind of stuff, right? Amora commented as she looked around, but those things could have been left by the humans who lived here before the monsters invaded and took over. Looking around, she saw a door, but unfortunately that door was locked. Maybe it has a key, she deduced, and turned to look for the key. But Amora's heart froze when she saw a man walking towards her. This is the man who appears to be human and lives in the castle. Amora said excitedly to the viewers, so that the man could not hear what she said. Well, I didn't think there was anyone left, the man said as he walked towards her. Amora was surprised by what the man said, imagining that the man was happy to have seen another human alive. But something shocked her. All of the metal pieces that were scattered on the floor began to levitate around the man as he walked towards her. You must be pretty strong, huh? The man asked. Who are you? Amora asked the confusing man. Ah, so you're not from around here. The man lifted his head and looked into her eyes. Even better. When the man finished saying that, he raised his left hand and pointed it at her. Player instincts from Amora, who had dealt with several ranky monsters in the last mission, made her feel that something was wrong as she tried to raise her weapon, but before she could react, an iron rod flew towards her and penetrated with ease straight through her abdomen, making Amora's heart race. What is happening? She tried to grasp the spear that had been stuck in her belly. She pulled on it desperately, but more pieces of metal started flying towards her and sticking all over her body as she knelt down in pain and despair. Mother Miranda will love you, haha. The man said, laughing as he stood very close to Amora. 
Amora was getting very desperate. This was the first time she had been in such a desperate situation since she started playing Residual Devil. The only situations close to this were when Chris killed her husband and she couldn't do anything, or when she was surrounded by monsters in the city for the first time and had to flee. Finally the last piece of metal stuck to her, but to her shock, it hit her hard on the head, making her head go dizzy and knocked her character out. Amora didn't know what to make of her black vision. I died. She wondered, uncertainly. Whoa, WTF, how would that be possible to survive this man? Wasn't that man supposed to help the players? How did he become a villain all of a sudden? Guys, haven't you noticed that this man is controlling metal? EA is only an F-rank developer, how was he able to create a monster that controls metal? Damn, I hadn't thought of that. Good thing you're not playing on, insane, difficulty, Amora, otherwise it would be game over, haha. Did you do something wrong? Amora was still confused by what happened, until the scene in front of her started to change, with some pieces of metal falling around, but she soon felt that something was strange. Feeling pain in her wrist and stomach, Amora realized that she was bound by the wrist and being dragged away by the man she thought had killed her. Fudge, Amora moaned a little from the pain she was feeling. Even if this was just a game, she still felt some of the pain the character was feeling, so that everything was as real as possible for the players and that they got used to it for missions, but this was the first time she felt it would be great to be able to turn off the pain option. Worried about where the man was taking her, Amora tried to lift her head, but the man just turned back and said to her while still carrying her body. Stop crying. We're almost there. Hearing the man's mocking tone, Amora felt very angry with him, who she initially thought was an ally, but she had another feeling, fear. She was afraid of the place the man was taking her. But her body was very weak. Without her noticing it, Amora fell unconscious again, only waking up to the sound of a female voice speaking near her. That woman is good for nothing, and my daughters happen to love to entertain outsiders. Furthermore I warrant that if we entrust this woman to house Dimitrescu, my daughters and I would privilege the vials of her sacrificed blood. Confused and scared, Amora opened her eyes to understand what was going on, but to her shock, there was a macabre doll pacing back and forth as she looked at her. As she slowly stood up, a strange hunchbacked monster with a disfigured body and face came very close to her and started sniffing her body, making Amora even more scared and uncomfortable. Get out of the way ugly thing. I want to see. To Amora's surprise, the doll started screaming at the deformed monster that was smelling her, scaring the monster away from her, something she didn't know whether to be grateful for or even more scared by. She woke up. The doll was euphoric as it jumped back and forth with an annoying voice. Shut up. A man shouted angrily. You'll fuck with her on the sly. Where's the fun in that? Hearing this, Amora's heart froze. For a second she even thought if she should turn off the game and stop playing it, since if that really happened she definitely wouldn't want to continue playing. But thinking about EA, who had made such an interesting story so far, Amora decided to give him a vote of confidence and continue trying the game, hoping that something as terrible as that really wasn't going to happen. But without her realizing it, the fear she was feeling in those last few minutes of Chapter 02 was already greater than several hours when she had been playing Chapter 01, and it was greatly affecting her learning speed in this game. 21 Chapter 02 Despair I survived. Amora sat on the dark floor while breathing heavily, caught in disbelief from what had just happened. When she was trapped in the castle by those lunatics, she was shocked to find that they started to argue about how they were going to kill her. That giant woman was trying to convince the others to let her take Amora to her castle and torture her, while the man with the hat wanted to torture her in a show-like manner. Finally, the woman named Mother Miranda did something that absolutely shocked Amora. She spread apart four pairs of black wings along her back and declared that the man with the hat could kill her however he wanted. Amora was desperately panicked by this, and when the man began to start making a countdown, Amora's heart raced again. Looking around, she was surrounded by zombies and there was only one way to escape. When the man's count reached four seconds, Amora didn't think any further on whether it was the right decision and jumped into the only hole behind her. With the countdown reaching zero, the zombies started running after her, and Amora accelerated even more at the speed she was running. Since her hands were tied, she couldn't fight these monsters, and at that moment, louder than the noise of the zombies trying to devour her, the noise of her heart in her chest was beating so hard that she was afraid of having a heart attack. Apparently this path had already been made perfectly for her to escape and continue her journey, since the whole rest of the place was full of traps. Fortunately, just when she thought she had no way to continue her escape, Amora found a small space and took cover as a chainsaw came flying towards her. Thinking quickly, she used the saw to cut through the metal bar that held her wrists and was finally set free. Now, without the noise of zombies or any of the lunatics talking, Amora understood that maybe they thought that she had died. 
The only thing she could think of at the moment was, I survived. Her heart was almost bursting out of her mouth from the panic she felt. The realism of this game, with the frightening way that those people, or monsters more like, were acting made Amora really scared. I need a break, she said as she continued to sit on the floor to calm down. After considering her situation for a while, Amora felt she needed a break and logged out of the game. WTF, I almost fell out of my chair with worry. Amora, are you okay? I need some water. My heart is beating fast. Not only was Amora shocked, but the viewers of her livestream were also shocked by what had just happened. As Chapter 01 of the game was basically a calmer and more peaceful place, players and viewers had gradually gotten used to it, but when they arrived at the castle and saw such a sudden change of pace, many people could not keep up and were in shock. The unluckiest streamers had lost their saves on, insane, mode because they didn't realize they had to race the man in the hats countdown and had died. Others didn't take the opportunity like Amora to break their shackles and continued to have their hands stuck in the metal, having to leave the castle unprotected. Fortunately, as soon as they left the castle, the game returned to its former calm. Amora, who had rested for 15 minutes, had finally calmed down and logged back into the game. When she walked out of the castle with a shotgun in her hand and finally stepped onto the white snow on the village floor, she was finally able to relax. How I missed this village, before, I felt this place was like hell, but compared to that castle, this village is like heaven. Amora said as she bent down and hugged the icy snow on the village path. Walking along the short road that apparently led back to the village, Amora, who was already lost after so many twists and turns in the tunnel under the castle, was shocked at the path she was following. Instead of heading in the direction of the familiar village she was in earlier, she realized that the more she followed that path, the closer she was to actually still heading towards the castle. Damn, I'm heading back to the castle. She soon realized her confusion. She hadn't been hugging the snow in the village a few moments ago, but rather the snow in the space between the castle gate and the real castle. I haven't even entered the castle yet and I almost died in the game and had a heart attack in real life. What's inside this castle? Amora's voice was very uncertain, and not only was she surprised by this, but the reaction from the viewers on the livestream was priceless. Her livestream, which had peaked at 3,000 viewers when Chapter 01 was released, now had nearly 6,000 people watching her play. Among these people, unlike before when most were F-rank or E-rank players, now most were ordinary people and even some D-rank players. The rank F and rank E players who normally watched her play were now almost all busy playing Chapter 02 on their own or completing Chapter 01 in order to experience Chapter 02 on their own. The story of this game was so interesting that they didn't want to get spoilers on Amora's livestream, and not only did these players not want to get spoilers on the livestream, but even ordinary people from Sandstone Bay found out about this game through their player friends and decided to watch the streams for themselves to see how it was. To the surprise of these ordinary people, unlike the other games they had already seen where the players just stood there swinging a sword from side to side or shooting a bow at monsters that ran past, in Residual Devil, everything they were seeing was completely new. The conversation those monsters had was so realistic that within minutes of the game they already felt that they were there, experiencing it personally, and when the man had been trying to kill Amora, the viewers felt that they were the ones who were almost dying in her place, causing people with weak hearts to have to calm down while watching so as not to suffer a heart attack. It's a good thing Sandstone Bay doesn't have a castle, otherwise I wouldn't even go near it. You're lucky, I'm a ranky player and my scheduled mission for tomorrow is in an abandoned castle outside the city. Do you think I'll have the courage to go? I'm already thinking about what excuse I'm going to use to miss it, even if I have to pay a fine, the money is not worth my life. Friend of the previous comment, I only have one thing to say to you. F. 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 F for respect. Reading these people's comments, Gabe was laughing his ass off. He had definitely been very scared while playing that part of the game in his previous world, and in this world these people were experiencing it in such realistic virtual reality, it was surprising that Amora was still playing. Looking at player data with game developer authority, Gabe found Amora's profile and began analyzing her data. From the amount of fear she was feeling, the amount of skills she absorbed from the game peaked very high. Not only had she gone up in shooting skills, but also in escaping skills that were quietly developing. Unfortunately, escape skills were not measured with virtual tests with numbers that exemplify the level, because if that were the case, Amora would probably see that the improvement in this aspect was frighteningly high. It's better that players have a problem with monsters and games and learn to deal with it here than something like this happening in real life and having no experience, Gabe said to himself with a smile. Amora, who was approaching the castle with uncertain steps, realized that there was a carriage parked at the entrance of it. Clutching the shotgun she'd found on the way out, she approached very alertly, trying to see if anyone was there. 
When she got within closer range, the carriage door burst open, startling Amora to the point that she nearly pulled the shotgun's trigger on instinct. FCK. Amora screamed in fright as she looked at the man who had opened the carriage door. Seeing that it was a man there, Amora should have been a little less worried, but the man's appearance did not reassure her. This man apparently weighed at least 300 kg, 660 pounds, a frighteningly high weight for an apocalyptic world like the one people here lived in, where the available food was not as plentiful as in Gabe's other world. Seeing such a fat man, Amora was almost certain that this man was a monster and continued to point her gun at him, ready to fire at the slightest sign of threat. Looking at Amora acting so scared, the man laughed. Athena Winters, don't be scared. I'm just a simple merchant. Hearing the man speak to her in that way, Amora's fear lessened a little, but she was no less alert and continued to aim the gun at him. How do you know me? She asked. How do I know you? Everyone worth their salt has heard of you, the heroine in search of her daughter. But it's true that my being so close to the castle raises suspicions, he replied. Yeah, it definitely does, Amora replied with narrowed eyes. Haha, I'm just a humble merchant. Forgive my manners, you can call me Duke. Weapons, ammo, ointments, whatever you need I'll get you. Weapons. Amora became more alert and continued to aim the shotgun at Duke. Duke just chuckled as he explained, don't be so afraid. I only seek profit. As long as you have enough money, not only can I sell you weapons, I can also help you improve your weapons, increasing the rate of fire, reloading speed, ammo capacity, and most importantly, I can help you improve the damage your weapons deal to more powerful enemies. Initially Amora had thought that Duke was just an ordinary merchant, but when she heard him talking about weapon upgrades, her attention was hooked. When he told her that he could help her upgrade her weapon to deal more damage to more powerful enemies, the first thing she remembered was the trouble she had had in the last mission she had participated in. Her weapon hadn't done as much damage against rank E monsters as it did to rank F monsters, and she knew that this was a very big limitation that she would need a lot of time to improve on, that, and a lot of money. But hearing the possibility of improving her weapon's damage in the game against more powerful monsters entered a doubt in her head. If I can improve my weapon damage here, maybe there's a way to improve it in the real world as well. Amora wondered in surprise. Not only was she surprised by this, but other livestream viewers were also surprised when they thought of this possibility. Ordinary viewers didn't see anything much from this fat man's statement, but players who were watching this or who were playing the game and met Duke, thought the same thing as Amora, if this knowledge could be learned in-game, it could possibly have a huge impact on the lives of ranky players. Even if it couldn't be brought about, if the game made weapons powerful enough to deal more damage to ranky monsters available, even if the player had to invest a stone of mana in the game to bring one of the game's weapons to life, in the end the player could still come out with a profit. 22 Bonus Chapter 22 You Can Laugh For Now Mana stones was one of the means that players used to profit even more while doing missions. The monsters that players encountered during quests were classified as common monsters and elite monsters. While ordinary monsters were just a waste of effort and ammo, elite monsters had a small mana stone in their heads which was responsible for making those monsters more powerful than ordinary monsters. When players killed elite monsters, these players could take the mana stone that was in the head of the monster and sell it in the city to get more money. Another use for the mana stone was that players could absorb the extra mana that was in these stones in order to spend more time training. While a rank F player had an average of 1 mana units, which could go up to 2 mana units in total, a rank F mana stone had 10 mana units, which was equivalent to letting a rank F player train for 5 to 10 X longer than he could with his body's mana. The player's idea of using a mana stone to get a residual devil weapon in real life was not unfounded. This was something that has come to be known to humanity in recent decades. As long as a player intended to extract an item from the game into real life, they could do so as long as they provided enough mana within 10 minutes. But the price for that was simply far too high. A simple sword extracted from a rank F game needed 50 units of mana. This was a high amount of mana that probably at rank F only developers could do with their body's mana, and among players only rank D players could pull off something like that. And since for rank D players this type of rank F weapon was completely useless, considering the amount of money they received per mission, it was just a waste of time and waste of mana to extract most weapons from rank F games. Considering that a rank F mana stone cost $2,000 and a rank F mission yielded $200, for rank F players it was more profitable to sell these items than to use them to train more, since with a lot of training time the income from it would decrease, and considering that there weren't good enough weapons in rank F games anyhow, it made the rank F mana stone even more useless.
But seeing now that in Residual Devil they could extract weapons that would be stronger than ordinary weapons, maybe even weapons that could damage rank E monsters, as long as the price they spent on rank F mana stones was not higher than the price of a magic weapon they could pull from the game, they would be making a profit. Once this kind of news began to spread in Sandstone Bay, the price of rank F mana stones, which were only $2,000 at that moment, would definitely rise past $3,000 in a short time, possibly even going higher in the near future. Among the players who thought about this possibility, Amora was the one who felt the most urgency, as she was itching to try it out. So, without thinking twice, still live, she paused the game, took out her cell phone, and ordered 10F rank mana stones. She didn't have that money available in her account at that moment, but she had a credit card. As long as she continued to do rank E quests, she would be able to pay off these stones quickly. But she knew that if she took a few days to do this, instead of spending $20,000 on these 10F rank mana stones, it was very likely that she would spend more than $30,000 on them, greatly reducing how much she would save by not buying a magic weapon. As someone who had been living on her own for over a year now, the previous Amora would have been unlikely to do something as risky as taking on $20,000 in debt without a second thought, but seeing how much residual devil was changing her life, she understood that she needed to take advantage of this opportunity as soon as possible. While other players would still have a bit of doubt in the early days, she had more than a bit of confidence in EA, the genius developer who was making this miracle game, and she felt that she would not regret this choice. Not only was Amora quick to do this, but some other players and streamers were quite decisive when they saw the weapons in Duke's shop and decided to do the same thing. Residual Devil had greatly increased many players' firearm shooting skill. It would be a shame to waste such a skill once they reached rank E, so the safest choice would be to invest now and take advantage of the profit boost they would have with a better weapon. Gabe, who was watching Amora buy the mana stones so decisively, just smiled at her attitude. Honestly this was something he already expected to happen. Despite being a developer, he understood the suffering of players when it came to using firearms in rank E, so much so that this was the biggest factor for players to avoid using firearms to grow past rank F, since in rank F they could take very little advantage of this ability. And as a rank F game developer where the focus was firearms training, Gabe knew he had to do something to help these players, since they were the audience that consumed his game. If these people got stronger, the better it would be for him, allowing these people to play his game even more. So Gabe had hatched this idea. Duke in the game he played in his previous life already had the ability to enhance the player's weapons, but this ability was never exploited, as it would not be as interesting for the style of play that it had in his other life. But here it was different. Being able to have a more powerful weapon was very tempting, as it meant that your chance of dying in a real mission was much lower. So Gabe spent around 400 mana units to develop Duke, which was much higher than the amount he spent to make a Lycan but still much cheaper than it cost him to make the strongest monsters in the game. And this was enough for Duke to have the ability to truly upgrade the player's weapon in a logical way. If he was going to do something like this normally, Gabe would first need to have the knowledge of how to do it, and then add that to the character he developed for the game, but Gabe didn't have to do things here normally. He had the system that allowed him to simulate a character the way he imagined it, that is, as long as he imagined a character with a skill, the system would do all the calculations for that character to be the way Gabe imagined. So he didn't need to discover this knowledge on his own, and he could still learn anything himself from the characters he made. In Residual Devil, the player could watch Duke enhancing the weapon in front of them, and just like the training knowledge the players absorbed with mana, Duke's weapon enhancement knowledge could also be learned. But of course, this was not an easy thing to acquire for most anyone. By Gabe's calculations, an average player with low talent would need dozens of hours of observation to learn how to do what Duke did. So seeing players like Amora purchase mana stones so decisively made Gabe nod his head in agreement. It's easier to buy the finished product and make more money than trying to learn something you don't have the talent to waste time on, Gabe said with a smile as he looked at Amora, who was very interested in the game. Unfortunately, she didn't have enough money to pay Duke to upgrade one of her weapons for her yet, but she was determined to do her best to accumulate in-game money and try out his abilities. If she got a rifle in the game, she had no doubt that it would be this weapon that she would use to extract from the game with mana stones after the weapon was fully upgraded. This new possibility which Gabe had added to the game not only surprised the residual devil players, but also Wilson, who was still watching Amora's livestream while watching this game. As a C rank developer, Wilson's thoughts ran even deeper than most of the players' thoughts. He could see that with this rank F game, Gabe Howard was capable of influencing not only the development of Sandstone Bay's rank F players, but also the development of rank E players in the city as well. For a city like Sandstone Bay that had at least 8,000 rank E players, a single developer being able to influence such a large amount of players was almost unheard of. 
Even Wilson wasn't very confident of making an E-ranked game that could influence players so much in such a simple way, but a young F-ranked developer boy was managing to do just that. This is only his first game and he's already wreaking so much havoc, I'm scared to even imagine this kid's future, Wilson sighed with a smile as he watched Amora's livestream. Thinking of something, Wilson pressed a button to call Ashley. When she arrived at the office, he spoke. Ashley, cancel all sales of F-rank mana stones. For the next few weeks we will not be supplying F-rank mana stones to any other cities. If possible, even pay attention to the price at which other cities are selling their stones and if the price is low, place a buy order on as much as you can get without hopefully causing a stir. Ashley was surprised by this news. Until a few weeks ago, Wilson was desperately wanting to sell the city's F-rank mana stones, but no other city was willing to buy them as they were practically useless, but now all of a sudden Wilson wanted to stop selling these stones and even buy from other cities. Looking at the television screen, Wilson was watching, Ashley tried to imagine what had happened with this game for her boss to have such a big change of heart, but she didn't ask any more questions and started to perform the task he had given to her. When the other cities heard that Sandstone Bay was suddenly buying rank F mana stones, many managers of these cities ridiculed Wilson for being an idiot and wasting money on something useless. Some even began to mock Wilson, even taunting him with a discount if he would offer to buy in large quantities, which to their surprise, Wilson accepted without a second thought. Let's see if you guys will keep laughing when this game arrives in your towns, haha, <laughs> Wilson chuckled as he looked at the messages from the other city managers on his desk. As a C-rank developer, Wilson was proud of what was happening now in his city. Because of the problem where the city had lost the talented developer in the past, even if it didn't happen in his tenure, he was still quite ridiculed by these managers from other cities. But Wilson didn't care about their insults. The time when he could take revenge was very close, especially when he saw the other revenue opportunities that Residual Devil could generate for the city. With how interesting this game was, he became more and more interested in the reaction these other managers would have in the future. 23 Interest Chapter 02 of Residual Devil was making a huge splash in Sandstone Bay. Both the city's players and the common population had heard about the game and started to pay attention to it after listening to the stories from their friends. Even Sandstone Bay Television was madly looking for the developer who had made this game in order to get the rights to broadcast the game's story as a series, as the story this game had was several times more interesting than the programs they normally broadcasted. This had never happened before. Before watching a live stream of Residual Devil, the directors of Sandstone Bay Television still thought that rumors about the story of this game were just exaggeration. Many thought that someone was purposely saying this because they didn't feel like the network didn't make any interesting shows and just wanted to piss them off. Even if they were a few years away from making a really good program, it was impossible for a game made by a game developer to be more interesting than the programs they made, right? Games made by game developers were known to be anything but fun, as game developers usually thought only about how they would make the players train in the best possible way, thus making their games extremely boring, repetitive, and arduous. Initially they thought that Residual Devil would also turn out to be like this, but when they watched the prologue story of Residual Devil, they discovered that the rumors were not exaggerated at all. The story of that game was completely fascinating. Art directors, writers, music directors, all of Sandstone Bay Television's most capable professionals were present as they watched a live stream of someone playing the game and were shocked to discover that they couldn't even think of a way to make it better. Damn it. For the love of God, someone tell me whoever made this game is actually a retired old man who was just bored. An elderly man with a scholarly appearance said angrily before slapping the table they were all seated around in frustration. But no one in the room scolded the man for acting that way, as everyone else was just as frustrated as he was. Although they were rooting for the developer who had made this game to be an old man who studied art as much or more as they all did, the harsh reality was that the developer who made this game was just a young developer who wasn't even 25 years old. Worst of all for the pride of these people was that this developer had made this game so masterfully in just under 20 days, that is, in just 20 days a young man of no more than 25 years had managed to do something that they, who had been in this industry for decades, could not. Okay, Janet has confirmed to me that the city government will meet with this developer tonight and ask if he is interested in cooperating with us. As long as he approves of using the game images for our television network, and as long as he doesn't demand astronomical amounts of money, we will easily come out on top, another old man said in a slightly calmer voice. Hearing what this old man said, the other old men in the room also calmed down a bit inside. The younger generation keeps pushing us. If we don't keep moving forward in a short time we will be overtaken, most of them were thinking exactly the same thing. I think there's also another way for us to earn money, the old man who had spoken first continued. 
This soon attracted the attention of the other old men, and soon the first man told them the idea he had. Gabe was seeing how well Residual Devil was doing and was quite pleased. Player development in the game was very good. Even though there were some parts where most players died, it was still a lot of fun for them. Of course, Chapter 02 was a lot scarier than Chapter 01, and to preserve the player's mental health and to guard against any sort of lawsuits or trauma claims, Gabe added a terms of use agreement and displayed an in-game notice that this would be quite frightening and that people with a low tolerance for that type of content would have to avoid it. Gabe obviously knew that people were unlikely to fully read the terms of use, and even if they did they would still feel that they wouldn't be afraid of just one game and would accept the terms quickly before returning to play. Some people probably couldn't take it, but the more experienced f rank players wouldn't have that much of a problem anymore. Although they were still afraid of the game and quite scared, it wouldn't be enough to make them stop playing, as they had even killed monsters in real life. A mere game wouldn't be enough to make them terrified on its own. So, seeing that most of the rank F players mana had already run out and they had to stop the live streams to meditate and come back to play later, leaving only the E rank players or F rank players who started later, Gabe decided to stop watching the live stream and eat something since he was starting to feel hungry. How much money do I have? Gabe wondered with interest as he looked at the stats screen of the game he made. Residual Devil, Village. Downloads, 10.351. Average play time, 3.3 hours. Accumulated mana, 39,333. Available for withdrawal, $10,868. Available mana, 10,679, 28,636 mana spent. I already have 10,000 more mana units. If I wanted to, I could even improve my max mana to 400 mana units already, but considering I have to do chapter 03, I'd better save that first and focus on the game, Gabe thought as he nodded. With the speed at which he was gaining mana, Gabe understood that he could perhaps make the chapters even bigger, since while he was spending around 5,000 mana units to make a chapter, now that he was receiving so much mana he could start to make chapters with 10 to 20,000 mana units. The players would certainly continue to play if he chose to do this, making the return on investment come faster than posting little by little. Of course, this would come at the cost that he would possibly receive less mana in total than if he made small chapters and posted them more often, but considering that his plan was to get enough mana from this game to become a developer rank E, he could use the game for that purpose first and then let the game world develop itself with the accumulated mana until the seed became ranky while he was developing other games. This meant that he could increase the strength of the monsters from rank F of that game to allow ranky monsters to further increase their mana turnover. As for earning money from the game, Gabe was already satisfied. For the time being he still didn't have any high requirements for money. Despite liking luxury cars and comfortable mansions, this was not something that could sway him to the point of making players pay a lot to basically give their livelihoods over to him. Is there the concept of paid games in this world? Gabe wondered in surprise. With the fame he was getting, he figured maybe he could start selling games. While Residual Devil had started out as just a game for a young developer who was graduating from Harrington University, now the next game he had planned was going to be different. The next game Gabe made would already be known as the next game from Electronic Arts, the developer of Residual Devil. That alone would be more than enough for the game to have thousands of downloads, or, if he intended to sell, thousands of sales, and considering that Gabe didn't intend to develop a bad game, the word of mouth for his next game would also play a big role for players to keep buying from him. Looking at the game store on the computer, Gabe saw that all of the games were free, but looking closely at those games, Gabe saw that all of the games had a way of being monetized. But the way these games monetized made Gabe a little uncomfortable. Spear throwing training. Are you tired of killing only normal fish? For just $5 you can unlock a new race to kill, the ice fish. Are you tired of your spear being so heavy? For just $5 you can pay for an upgrade and your javelin will have the feel you desire. Feel like the game is too easy, even for rank F. How about unlocking the, max rank F difficulty, so you can train against the most powerful fish in rank F. This for just $5. Looking at the long list of DLC players could buy in just the other top game in the contest alone, Gabe started to laugh. I was so worried about charging $3 for some skins in the game while there are people who are blatantly removing features from their games so they can sell them as DLCs, I think these people deserve the EA title far more than I do, haha. <laughs> Looking at the other games, Gabe noticed that this was extremely common. Developers were clearly removing features from the game and selling it as extras. Looking at the player's reaction, despite some complaining, this was something so common that they didn't even care about something like this. If I made a loot box, this world would go crazy, wouldn't it? Gabe wondered with an evil smile, before shaking his head and erasing the idea from his mind. 
It's enough for EA and the other world to be greedy, but my goal in this world is to show that electronic games are also art. I can do things the honest way to earn money, Gabe thought to himself. Seeing as all games currently were free, if he made a paid game there would probably be a lot of people complaining. But suffice to say that the game would feature X number of hours of gameplay and all the content in the game would be included in the initial cost he felt people could probably handle that. Considering that he could put the game on sale for something like $20, if he had 10,000 players purchase it that would be enough for him to get $200,000 from the game. Thinking of how many missions Ranky players would have to do to get that much money while he only needed to develop a single game to receive that, Gabe was quite satisfied. His stomach rumbled once more. Now, with over $10,000 in his account, Gabe was already looking for a highly rated restaurant to eat well at tonight, but to his surprise, his cell phone rang. Professor Brown is calling. Looking at the notification, Gabe was a little confused and answered it. Hello. Gabe asked with a little uncertainty. Howard. That's great you answered. Do you have time now? David Brown asked excitedly. Gabe thought for a moment and replied, I was going out to get something to eat. My last meal was breakfast. Hearing this, David was surprised. Usually young developers when they started to earn money would start living luxurious lives and flaunt expensive things, hiring several employees to serve them like kings, but Howard had spent the whole day without eating anything while his game was already generating so much success in the city. Don't worry about it then boy. We're also going to make a reservation at a restaurant. How about you join us? David asked. Gabe didn't see a problem with the offer and accepted, but he was just a little dubious. With us. Who do you mean, professor? Gabe asked. I'm with the university director now. She wants to have a word with you. As we're already going to dinner, she suggested we invite you, David explained. Hearing this, Gabe was a little interested in how this conversation the director wanted would go. 2424 earning a favor. Arriving at the address that Mr. Brown had sent him, Gabe was a little surprised by the place. Mr. Brown and Principal Carter, who were a C-rank and a peak C-rank developer respectively, imagining that they would choose a very luxurious place when they went out to eat, Gabe had been worried about how much money he would have to spend at the place these two professors would go. But looking at the place at the address they'd sent him, Gabe was surprised that it was a lot less extravagant than he'd previously imagined. The place was still clearly luxurious, Gabe couldn't deny it, but unlike the luxury he'd imagined where things would shine as bright as gold, this place's style of luxury was different. It was what people called understated luxury. Gabe recognized small details, like some plants that were rare and hard to find in Sandstone Bay, of which he had learned when he was researching for Residual Devil, that now surprised him to see here, but luckily the place was much nicer than he had imagined. Despite being dressed in simple clothes, as he didn't have much money previously, the attendant treated him very well and politely. When he was escorted to Mr. Brown's table, Gabe was surprised by the person sitting next to him. As much as he had heard of Principal Selena Carter, he had only seen her from afar a few times during the years he studied at Harrington University. But now, being so close to her, even Gabe, who was already a bit used to the good looks of women from his previous world, was surprised by this principal's appearance. Despite being a university principal, to Gabe's surprise she didn't look older than her late 20s, which was an extremely young age for a university principal and still far too young to be a peak rank C developer. Hello Mr. Brown, Mrs. Carter, Gabe greeted with a smile as he walked over to the table where they were sitting and sat down quite casually. Professor Brown gave Gabe a big smile and waved his hand for him to sit down. Come on Howard, sit with us. We were just talking about you. Principal Carter just smiled at Gabe as she nodded at him, to which Gabe returned a smile back and nodded politely. I hope it's all been good things Mr. Brown, haha, -ha, Gabe joked as he finished sitting down. I don't think I can even think of a bad thing to say about you Howard. Every piece of news that comes into my hands is more surprising than the last, and surprisingly all in a good way. David Brown said with a big smile on his face. Despite being 60 years old, David Howard was much more lively and energetic than other people his age, which made most students enjoy taking his classes. Perhaps the only bad thing that crosses my mind related to you is the other students complaining about how bad you are making them look, especially the developer, Nexus Gaming, who was in first place in the competition for university developers before you took the lead. Apparently he didn't take it so well that the first place reward he already believed would be his had fallen into the hands of someone else he had no idea who it was, Mr. Brown explained. Hearing about this, Gabe raised an eyebrow in mild surprise. Despite it being obvious, Gabe was so focused on developing his game that he didn't even think about the other contestants or his position in the contest after he reached first place. 
The only times he had paid attention to the other people in the contest was when he had to see how other developers were faring and what kind of ideas they came up with that he could snag in the future. But despite a slight raise of his eyebrow, Gabe had no other reaction. He didn't feel guilty that his result was so much better than other people's. It didn't make sense for him to limit himself just to please others. Seeing Gabe's calm and composed reaction, not only was Mr. Brown quite pleased, Principal Carter also lightly nodded her head, showing that she was also pleased with the way this boy was acting. Seeing some plates arrive at the table, Gabe got a little excited, as he was so hungry. Watching Gabe's eyes glisten, Mr. Brown laughed and spoke, don't worry, lad. We've already ordered several dishes, this is just the starter. When you said you were going out to eat, we decided to order some more food. So let's eat first and talk later. This old body of mine is very hungry, haha. With the way that Mr. Brown spoke, Gabe was no longer embarrassed to start eating and ate with the teacher and principal. Tasting this food, Gabe was even more surprised. These dishes had very simple appearances like omelets, salads, and snacks, but they were all at least two to three times tastier than what Gabe had ever tasted before, and not only in this life, but in his other life as well. Seeing the surprise in Gabe's eyes, Mr. Brown was even more enthusiastic as he explained about each of the dishes and why he liked this restaurant so much. He told Gabe that the restaurant belonged to an old friend of his, an old rank C player who retired a few years ago, and that to spend the rest of his life he had decided to open up a restaurant. As Mr. Brown explained this, the chef of the restaurant arrived next to their table and started talking to them, explaining the dishes to Gabe and Principal Carter, not knowing who the two of them were, just treating them like young people. Gabe and Principal Carter just acted natural and listened to the story this man told about his adventures in which he discovered some of the recipes they were tasting. Meanwhile, Mr. Brown was left laughing at how his old friend was treating the woman next to him. But no one had informed the man that this seemingly young woman was the dean of Harrington University, as the atmosphere was very pleasant between them and no one wanted to spoil it. This continued until the friend of Mr. Brown said something that surprised the three of them. Hey David, you have to help me with something, old Harold, the chef, said as he looked at his friend. Seeing his friend's somewhat serious manner, David was a bit surprised and curious as to what favor this friend of his wanted to ask. What is it, Harold? Harold was a little embarrassed to explain what he wanted, as he looked at Gabe, until he said in a low voice, can you get developer EA's contact number for me? Hearing Harold's question, not only was Mr. Brown surprised, but so too were Gabe and Principal Carter, especially when they saw the slightly embarrassed look on Eugene's face as he looked at Gabe. They all were wondering if he had already recognized Gabe's identity. What do you want EA's contact information for? David asked, confused. It seems that one of our cooks who is an F-rank player discovered a secret zone within residual devil where players can learn cooking skills. After that cook discovered this, his cooking skills improved a lot, and seeing that, other cooks have also started playing residual devil to improve their cooking skills, and now the non-player cooks are feeling a bit shortchanged, Harold said as he scratched the back of his head. PFF, haha. Are you kidding? Did that really happen? David started to laugh out loud as he listened to this story and looked back and forth between Harold and Gabe. Seeing how David's gaze was flickering between him and the young man sitting in front of him, Harold was a little embarrassed and apologized. Sorry to bring up another developer at this point, young man, but this really is something that's giving me a bit of trouble. Gabe was even more surprised by this man's reaction as David started to laugh even louder. Out of the corner of his eye, Gabe noticed that even Principal Carter was having to control herself from bursting out in laughter like Mr. Brown was doing. Harold was even more embarrassed and confused by what was happening, but before he could say anything, a cacophony of noise from the kitchen interrupted the entertaining moment. Chef Cooper, it's impossible to continue cooking here. The interns are starting to develop dishes on their own during working hours and are delaying the development of dishes ordered by customers because of this. A man in a chef's outfit complained as he approached. Beside the man, a girl of about 18 held a slightly sullen expression. I was just trying out a recipe I learned from Residual Devil, no big deal. I'll pay for those ingredients later. The problem isn't the ingredients, girl, it's that you're doing it during working hours and disrupting the restaurant's operation. Some of the customer's orders were delayed because of you. The man said annoyed. Seeing the two fighting in front of his friend, Harold became irritated and apologized to the table as he walked away to deal with these two members of his staff. As Harold walked away, David was finally getting his laughter under control and looked at Gabe with a surprised expression. Was that also your fault, Howard? David asked with a smile on his face. Gabe was a little embarrassed. He didn't imagine that an Easter egg he had put in Residual Devil would be the reason for so much fighting in a restaurant so soon after he had added it. But he was quite surprised that a chef who had awakened mana but didn't decide to be players had discovered the Easter egg in such a short time.
I think partially. Gabe answered with a little uncertainty, I actually added an option like that, something like an Easter egg, as I like to call it. This one was a hidden NPC that teaches players how to cook and prepare medicine to make it easier for them to play. Hearing Gabe's explanation, both Mr. Brown and Principal Carter raised their eyebrows slightly. To teach the player how to prepare food and medicine you made an NPC who has real cooking knowledge, and players can learn this knowledge by playing the game. That's fantastic, boy. I never thought that skills other than skills used in combat could be taught in a game. And here you are, proving me wrong yet again. Mr. Brown said with a bright glint in his eyes. Principal Carter alongside Mr. Brown, her eyes were also shining upon hearing this explanation. As a peak rank C developer, Selena Carter didn't need just mana units to be able to move up to become a developer rank B. She also needed inspiration. And only a little inspiration was missing to become a developer rank B in the future. While that inspiration came quickly for some people, for others it sometimes took several years. Selena was at peak rank C a year ago, but she never achieved anything that could inspire that improvement for her, but now, with this simple line from Gabe Howard, a 22-year-old young man who was six years younger than her, she finally saw a path she could use to rise from a developer rank C to a developer rank B. Unbeknownst to Gabe, he had earned himself a huge favor from Selena Carter, a favor he would be very grateful to cash in on in the future. 25-25 Proposals after a few minutes, Harold returned only to apologize to David, Selena and Gabe, then took his leave, still insisting that David get him the EA number so he could help them sort this out. The reason for never having appeared a game that helped cooks in this way, is that in addition to the developers not having the inspiration and motivation to do something like this, they still needed to have the necessary knowledge to teach the NPC these skills and only later the NPCs could teach the players. And considering how proud developers were of their profession, hardly a developer would develop a skill so well that it would be useful to teach other players. Especially when making a rank F game, which is where the developer is still at the beginning of his career. Smiling at what just happened, Gabe continued eating quietly, without any concern for the presence of David and Selena, which made the two raise their eyebrows a little, as normally students from Harrington University or even other rank developers lower were too afraid to offend them. Gabe, on the other hand, had none of those concerns. Not only because he felt that David and Selena were apparently not so superficial people with the contact he had with them, but also because of confidence in himself, despite still being only an f rank developer, he knew that he had the potential to become become a developer rank S in record time. Not only did he have confidence in becoming an s rank developer, he also knew that he would probably be among the fastest humans to become an s rank developer. After watching Gabe some more, David smiled and finally said the reason for calling Gabe here. Howard, we've been getting some calls recently from the city government interested in getting in touch with you. David explained while Selena continued to the side just watching the two and analyzing Gabe's reaction. She wasn't someone who was very fond of talking, or being in the spotlight, but as a C-ranked developer youth, it was impossible for her mind to be simple. Hearing this, Gabe looked at Mr. Brown and asked. What are they interested in me, Mr. Brown? David cracked a small smile and explained. There are two reasons, the first is an interest that Sandstone Bay Television has in their game, Residual Devil, where they saw great potential in the game and want a player actor to play this for them to broadcast on television as a drama. As soon as he finished saying that, David looked at Gabe imagining his reaction, as with Gabe's age, the probability of Gabe being very excited about this news was very high. But to David's disappointment, Gabe not only got excited, he also frowned. What's the matter, boy? David asked worriedly. Gabe didn't respond right away and continued thinking for a few seconds. Seeing this, David didn't interrupt and watched Gabe with great interest. Finally, after a few seconds, Gabe sighed and answered. Okay, that doesn't look so bad. Hearing that, not only was David surprised, even Selena slightly raised her eyebrow at Gabe's response. As a famous developer rank C, she already had some of her games broadcast on television, but usually this was only on channels focused on players and developers, which had a low audience, but was great for attracting new audiences to her game. She couldn't understand why Gabe was so resistant about this. Doesn't that please you? David asked confused. Gabe saw the surprise in their eyes and understood. Not necessarily. While this is a great way for the game to become famous, it will also slightly affect the player's experience with the game. Some secrets and surprises that I've put into the game won't surprise players anymore. Hearing this, Selena and David were a bit taken aback, and Gabe continued. Of course, the livestreams already do that job, but not necessarily all players will watch the livestreams, so a portion of them will still experience the game without knowing anything. With this being broadcast on Sandstone Bay Television, which is not even a channel focused on players and developers, even those players will get spoilers. 
But, on the other hand, this will also be important to make my name spread around the city, so my next games will have a larger potential audience and consequently I will get more players and more money, which will be highly beneficial. Not to mention the experience and the hype that playing a game from a television series might generate different emotions in players, something worth studying. Thinking about all this, the benefits far outweigh the harms of this arrangement. I have no reason to refuse, other than of course, they didn't want to pay me a satisfactory amount, as the potential profit this could bring them it's pretty high. Gabe finally finished explaining his train of thought. Of course, there were still some small details that he thought he'd rather just not say, but in essence he didn't have much to hide about it and just said most of what he thought. Listening to Gabe's train of thought, as he considered not only the potential profit but also the player's experience that could be spoiled by playing a game they already knew the story of, or even considering the emotion players felt while playing the game could be different and that this should be studied. All the little calculations and thoughts that Gabe had in those few seconds that he received the news until the moment he decided if this was more beneficial than harmful for him, caused David and Selena to be slightly shocked by this boy. He was only 22 years old and already had such a mature and stable mind, something that even made the two of them feel that some of their worries were useless, this boy already had his own discernment to think about these details, so in the future he could already control many things without needing so much of their help with thought. Haha ha boy, every time we talk you manage to surprise me with something, that's amazing. David chuckled as he patted Gabe's shoulder proudly. Even Selena nodded in agreement with David's thought. David continued. Don't worry about the remuneration. SBT, Sandstone Bay Television, decided that they wanted to turn the game into 40-minute episodes, editing out parts that were a bit boring and boring for the viewer, thus paying you a total of $40,000 per episode broadcast but they just put a little note. If the show doesn't get as many ratings as they thought, they can stop airing it at any time and they won't have to pay you for the unaired episodes. Hearing that, Gabe's eyes lit up. Considering that SBT would make 40-minute episodes, they could probably make at least four episodes of the two chapters that are already available in the game, and considering until the end of the game, it's possible that they could make at least 10 or 20 more episodes, which will be amazing for Gabe both in terms of monetary income, which will be a huge profit at no cost to him, and also in terms of publicity. But Gabe soon ran into a problem. Did they talk about broadcasting the show in other cities? Gabe asked with a furrowed brow. Hearing this comment, David was a little surprised and replied. No, they didn't say anything about that. Gabe just shook his head and answered. So please tell them that if they wanted to do the contract it should make it clear that they only own the rights to broadcast Residual Devil in Sandstone Bay, if they want to broadcast it to other cities, or sell the broadcast rights from other cities, they can't do this without communicating with me first and making another contract about it. Of course, also let them know that if they get other stations from other cities interested in this, they will get a share of the profit as a commission fee. Hearing Gabe's explanation, David was even more shocked. He hadn't thought about that point at all. As he had never been invited to participate in any television program, he didn't have such deep thoughts about it, but seeing the way that Gabe was already considering possible holes in the contract that SBT could take advantage of, David sighed relaxed. He had prevented SBT from contacting Gabe directly for fear of Gabe being impulsive and making a decision that he might regret in the future, so David intended to help Gabe with the program's decision because of the greater knowledge he already had, but now. David discovered that Gabe was very knowledgeable and was explaining things to him that he had never thought of before. Next time I can give his number to SBT directly, with this kid's mind maybe SBT itself will be taken advantage of instead of them trying to take advantage of him haha. David mentally chuckled as he thought of SBT executives as shocked as he was. Now we have one last matter to deal with. Selena finally said it for the first time. Hearing Selena's sweet voice, Gabe finally focused his attention on her and had to control his gaze quite a bit. Selena was a mature woman, with short hair a little above her shoulders and with a little red streaks in her hair, something that with the red dress she was wearing, it matched a lot. On her right shoulder it was possible to see a tattoo that extended from her chest across her shoulders to the middle of her arm, which made Gabe have to control his gaze a little so as not to go deep into the dress to look at her tattoo and become impolite. But even though she was six years older than he was, Gabe had to admit, this woman's charm was the greatest he had ever seen. Selena visual representation on Discord. GG, new next. Seeing Gabe's gaze focus for a fraction of a second on the tattoo on her chest, Selena just managed a small smile at the corner of her mouth as she ignored that and kept saying. In addition to SBT wanting to get in touch with you, the city government also contacted us trying to reach you. From what Wilson said over the phone, he wants an exclusive contract with you. She said just that as she took a sip from her glass of wine and started watching Gabe. Unlike David who was much more concerned about Gabe, trying to give him as much information as possible so he wouldn't make the wrong decision.
After Gabe demonstrated such a mature thought process, Selena was interested in him enough to want to test the limits of how far this boy could think with the little information she would give him. David was about to compliment what Selena had said when she just raised her hand and he was quiet again, showing the authority of this woman that despite being silent the whole time, when she finally said something you could feel her imposition. Even though she and David were both C-rank developers, David was over 60 while Selena wasn't even 30 yet. The potential difference between the two was absurd. At David's age, Selena would probably be an A-rank developer, or possibly even one of the few S-rank developers in the country, someone most people wouldn't even consider offending. And at that moment, Gabe Howard, a young boy who is still in the process of graduating from Harrington University, is sitting across from this woman and being evaluated by her. Grin 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 like it. And subscribe now grin grin grin. Video part.